Hey yo gang, welcome back to another video, another reaction video. We doing um today we doing Young Boy yo and I'm so hyped for this because I wanted to do a, a drawing of Young Boy. I was I planned to anyways, I was going to anyways, but I knew Trap Roy Law Trap Law But I knew that Trap Law Ross was gonna do this bro. Bro his name is such a like tongue twister bro. Trap Law Ross. I bet you can't say that five times real fast in one consecutive go. For real. But anyways, so we diving straight into this. My new drawing. Hopefully I could wrap it up real fast today. Um I'm looking at this new uh this full portrait, you know, close up face shot, so not too many outside details. So maybe I could wrap it up real quick, but let's just dive straight into the video, you know what I mean? If you're not if you're not subscribed to the man, subscribe drop a like you know all his videos are real good you know so let's just get straight into this it this video contains themes of violence death, right and gang activity the purpose of this video is to provide an educational account and, um, of historical let me get straight into all right events in right. the mainstream music industry no disrespect is intended uh, this video does see. not intend to glorify or glamorize the gang lifestyle. Every effort has been made to remove anything from this video that goes against YouTube's community guidelines, including swearing and violence. But if you'd like to see a fully uncut version of this video with everything I can't show you on YouTube, then head on over to patreon.com slash traplawross you know I mean? where you can watch all of my biggest documentaries uncut mm -hmm. for just two bucks. But if you're not into that, just hit the subscribe button and enjoy the rest of the video. Thank you. Over the last five years, there's been few rappers that have generated as much excitement and controversy as Youngboy. His music is personal, thought-provoking, and violent in equal measure. He's one of the few artists who can top the Billboard charts with music all about killing, death, and destruction. But his ability to communicate the stark realities of life growing up in the dangerous slums of Baton Rouge have inspired people all over America and the world at large. Youngboy's experiences in the gang-infested slums of Louisiana, where it's kill or be killed, inspired a generation of downtrodden youngsters to struggle through the pain too. Because despite losing family members and being the target of numerous assassination attempts, Youngboy has always managed to come out on top. Mm -hmm. Not just surviving, but beating the odds and coming back yeah, to the definitely beat the odds, time. bro. It's rare to find an artist who attracts this much love and hate all at the same time. And Youngboy's thugged out survival anthems for the streets have made him one of the most beloved artists in history. But his influence has a dark side too. Because some might say that his aggressive murder anthems are inspiring a generation of lost teenagers to slide and resort to violence just like he had to. But can Youngboy really be blamed? When basketball player Ja Moran ended up in hot water for flashing a gun in a strip club to Youngboy's music, many people suggested that this was Youngboy's fault. And considering just how many lives seem to have been lost as a direct result of Youngboy's career, whether it's the murder of rival Baton Rouge rapper G-Money to the slaying of Youngboy's beloved manager Big Dump, or even the killing of Chicago rap legend King Von, seemingly a self-defense shooting, the result of Von trying to fight one of Youngboy's friends, to say Youngboy and his NBA crew are dangerous would be an understatement. But is the group of people that Youngboy surrounds himself a gang of loose cannons shooting first and asking <laughs> questions later, or are they just really a family of youngsters with a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that they would put their lives on the line to protect? Over the course of his career, so many people have died that Youngboy even refers to himself as the murder man, and claiming in numerous songs to have been the direct cause of as many as seven murders in his hometown. Over the years, many people have questioned the authenticity of Youngboy's gangster image. You got cap in your raps. Youngboy talking about on this song, bro. In spite of all of the violence surrounding his career, in 2022, Youngboy had a change of heart, perhaps coming the result of reflecting on all of the destruction and pain that had been caused by his music career, or as a result of years of legal battles that have seen Youngboy endlessly confined to a cell or on house arrest. Because recently, he's been calling to stop the violence, pledging in interviews to stop promoting murder and violence in his songs, and even taking steps to de-escalate the conflict with his most hated rivals in Baton Rouge, with Youngboy's crew even sharing the stage with their mortal enemy Fredo Bang for a special charity concert aiming to stop the violence. But that said, even these intentions have been called into question, when after pledging to stop the violence, Youngboy continues to drop violent murder anthems back to back, 
So the fifty million dollar question remains unanswered. Is Young Guns really sells, great bro. Dick, the self-proclaimed murder man of Baton Rouge, really serious about stopping the violence, or is this all just a ploy to try and avoid the responsibility for convincing a generation of teenagers to pick up a gun and get active in the streets? Well, today we're going to take a closer look at the murders, the music, and the man, and decide once and for all is Young Boy really as dangerous as they say he is. I think so. I think so, Slam. It's either you're gonna die, you're either gonna be a bum, or you're gonna be successful, or you're gonna go to jail. And the reason I ain't that way, because the, the scary point, I don't know which the one I'm gonna be. But I ain't dumb though. You hear me? And them people who play that role to y'all, them just know I ain't dumb. The people who really know me, they know I ain't dumb. You hear me? How the f I came this far? You think I came this far by being dumb? Come on, man. Today's story takes place in the state of Louisiana. Louisiana is in the United States' Deep South, a historic region of the US with a dark history. The Deep South has had deep ties to the historic slave trade, with these particular states like Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia historically being heavily dependent on the plantation system, which saw black people kidnapped from their native lands in Africa and put to work hey, against their on, will me... in cotton fields There's for the benefit of white Americans. Even after the Confederate States lost the Civil War and slavery was abolished, racism continued to cast a shadow over Louisiana for many years. Attempts were made to restrict free black people from voting, and racist organizations like the White League were formed in Louisiana to terrorize, intimidate, and target the black community there. Eventually, after World War II, in the face of the Civil Rights Movement, black people in Louisiana finally begun to exercise their right to vote. And in 1960, this saw the establishment of groups like the Louisiana State Sovereignty Commission with an aim to battle racial segregation in the state, particularly in schools. During these years of segregation, it's believed that many African Americans fled Louisiana to states like California, seeking better treatment and opportunities. However, analysis by William Frey suggested that in decades that followed, due to better civil rights in Louisiana, many black migrants were actually attracted back to the state. But despite these improvements, however, Louisiana still remained a difficult place to grow up black through the 90s and the noughties. The state's incarceration rates have been at the very top in the world for decades now. And although black people are a minority in the state of Louisiana, well, the, the majority of the population the correctional facilities have been black. Louisiana has the second highest poverty rate in America, and here too, black people seem to suffer the worst. Moreover, the devastating events of Hurricane Katrina and subsequent flooding left tens of thousands of Louisiana residents stranded, with those affected being disproportionately African American. And the poor efforts to rescue these black people in danger had many people questioning if the state really even cared about their black citizens. George Bush doesn't care about black people. Now look, you might be wondering, what the hell does all of this have to do with Young Boy? Well, in my opinion, it's important to understand the history of where he comes from, to understand the environment that created the man, as well as the inherent challenges of growing up as a young black man in Louisiana. But that said, there's also plenty of positive influences stemming from Young Boy's Louisiana upbringing. Despite the state's difficult history when it comes to slavery and civil rights, over the years, the state's multiculturalism would become an asset, spawning creative and artistic communities. Louisiana has a long and rich history when it comes to music. In the early 1800s, the influx of enslaved Africans brought with them a diverse array of musical traditions and talents. Musical traditions which merged with the existing French, Spanish, and Native American influences in Louisiana. The fusion of these diverse cultural elements led to the birth of unique musical styles such as Creole music and jazz. Then, during the Civil War, music would play a significant role in both the North and the South. In Louisiana, Confederate songs and abolitionist tunes were composed, reflecting the region's divided sentiments on the issue. Some people wanted slavery to end, and their ops wanted it to continue. And you could probably argue that these might represent some of the earliest examples of diss songs, with soldiers on both sides of the Civil War <laughs> actually playing music that would hype up their troops and boost morale to prepare them for battle. After the Civil War, as time would go on, Louisiana creatives would continue to experiment with music. Blues Bro, music really is believed to have originated in the Deep South in the late 1800s and early 1900s. The African-American communities in New Orleans are credited with pioneering jazz music in the early 1910s. And in the 1950s, more new musical genres emerged, like swamp pop, where young Cajuns and Creoles would combine traditional French Louisiana music with New Orleans-style rhythm and blues and country and western music. 
as well as the more low-tempo swamp blues originating in the black communities of southwest Louisiana. Into the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement would further impact Louisiana's music scene, as African-American musicians leveraged their talents to amplify the call for racial equality, often using their platforms to shed light on the struggles that they had faced. R&B and soul music, with their origins in gospel and blues, would become vehicles for expressing the aspirations of the African-American community. And then, of course, as hip-hop emerged in the 80s and boomed through the 90s, a whole wave of aspirational Southern rappers would emerge from Louisiana's biggest cities. In New Orleans, modern rap was pioneered by Master P and his No Limit click, later being taken to brave new heights in hip-hop's bling era by the likes of Cash Money Records, mm -hmm. headed by Birdman and his prodigy Lil Wayne, Did you know Lil who would Wayne arguably go on to become one of the greatest rappers of all time and my personal favorite. And while the flashy antics of bling rappers might come across to some as tasteless, others would be inspired by these emerging black role models who were showing the world through artistry that a persecuted black man in the deep south could become a multi-millionaire mm -hmm. and build generational wealth off the back of sharing their lived experience through music. Now things still aren't perfect, but the success of rap music in the deep south represents a triumph over repression to me. And I'm telling you all of this because all of this history is very important context. Because the social circumstances that persisted in Louisiana over hundreds mm -hmm. of years all led up to a single moment in time, where the perfect circumstances right existed to create one of the modern day's most exciting and controversial music artists. People in Louisiana have been using their music to express their pain and tell their perspective on life for hundreds of years. And in the modern day Louisiana, one voice stands out above all others. The voice of a young boy who experienced one of the harshest upbringings modern day Louisiana had to offer. And that young boy was able to put all of his pain, trauma, and triumphs into his music. Modern day music that is still unmistakably Southern. So, now you know the city, let's take a closer look at that young boy, Young Boy. Young Boy was born Kentrell Deshaun Gordon in 1999. And over the years, he's been known by many names. Like NBA Young Boy, Young Boy Never Broke Again, Top, YB, AI Young Boy, and the list goes on. Now, Youngboy by no means had it easy as a kid. He grew up on the north side of Baton Rouge, more specifically North 38th Street and Chippewa Street. This led to another nickname that appears frequently in Youngboy's songs and albums, 38 Baby. In fact, Youngboy's legendary lyrics about 38th and Chippewa where he grew up has even attracted super fans who would film themselves driving down the very streets that Youngboy would play on as a child. But life on 38th Street was not kind to a young Youngboy. His father, Jeffrey Staden, wasn't in his life growing up, as he had apparently been sentenced to 55 years in jail what? when young boy was just eight years old. This monster sentence was punishment for the armed robbery of a Baton Rouge convenience store on December the 1st, 2009. Young boy's father, along with three other men, one of whom was his brother Dallas, had apparently robbed Albie's convenience store on North Sherwood Forest. The robbery got ugly, and young boy's father shot a store clerk in the leg during this altercation. This would earn him charges years? for armed robbery That's crazy, and attempted first-degree murder. He, he shot him in the guilty, leg. And after a jury trial, the state would find him guilty as charged <sighs> on two counts, getting himself 10 years for the robbery and 50 years for the attempted murder. What? Many years later, young boy would even reference his father's incarceration, rapping on the song Cross Me that it was actually his uncle, his father's brother, that was there for the robbery, who snitched and got him 55 years in jail as well as referencing his father's plight on the song Where the Love At, where he raps that he prays he doesn't become an alcoholic like his father, as well as paying respects and suggesting that his father needs a second chance at life because robbing people for their money was how he was trying to provide for his family. It seemed like both sides of young boy's family had a history of robbery, as his uncle on his mother's side was also an alleged known robber in Baton Rouge. His uncle However, unfortunately, snitched. he would suffer a worse fate than young boy's father. Andy Golden, the uncle who young boy referenced a couple of times in his music, was apparently shot in the head during a robbery attempt. Youngboy mentions on the track Acquittal how he heard stories about how his uncle was shot in the head, implying that their relationship was most likely non-existent if Youngboy had to rely on stories to hear all about mm -hmm. his life. As well as in the track R.I.P. Lil Dave, when Youngboy speaks of his uncle who got shot in the head and died while hitting a lick. Further references to this are heard on the track 38 Baby, when Youngboy outright declares that Andy Golden was his uncle which means that robbery is in his genes. I mean, just take a second to think about the situation that young boy was dealing with here as a child. His father is serving 55 years for robbery with one uncle who snitched on him and his other uncle was also a prolific robber who got shot in the head and killed during a robbery. All this would leave him as a lost child with no father figure who even saw robbery as part of his DNA. That's a heavy situation for an eight year old kid to be dealing with. Uh -huh. And with no father figure in his life, young boy would have to rely on the females in his family look after him and make him a man. 
Despite his mother Sharonda Golden being alive, she apparently wasn't there for young boy at a child at all times. So, he would initially be raised by his loving grandmother Alice Golden, but unfortunately, Youngboy's grandmother would pass away too, leaving him devastated for years to come. Mm -hmm. Youngboy would open up about the loss of his grandmother in a Billboard interview in 2023, calling her his protector. After losing his grandmother, with his father in jail and his mother out of the picture, Youngboy wound up in a group home, and it would be here that he would be subject to physical abuse and bullying. He would later explain in a Billboard interview that it was this experience of being targeted in the group home that led him to cultivate his own dark and violent side for protection. Clearly, Youngboy had to fight for survival as a child. Mm. In fact, he actually broke his neck whilst he was wrestling as a toddler. This was a serious injury which required him to wear a full neck and head brace whilst his spine healed. This was a corrective procedure which left him with the three iconic head scars that he has on his head to this day, an everyday reminder on his face of just one painful incident that he endured as a child, and something his enemies are still quick to use against him with the hurtful moniker Dent Head often being levied against him. Youngboy had gone through so many traumatic experiences as a child, it's unsurprising that he would grow up dealing with a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. But even outside of the tragedies in his own family, Youngboy would also suffer losses outside the home. When he was just age 10, he would end up losing one of his closest childhood friends to gun violence. As a child, Youngboy was friends with another boy who was around six years older than him, a boy by the name of David Cobb, aka Lil Dave. On March the 27th, 2010, a memorial picnic was being held at a park on Woodpecker Street in Scotlandville in Baton Rouge. This event was intended to honour the memory of local teens who had lost their lives to gun violence. But unfortunately, the very thing that this event was intending to shed a light on would end up happening that same day. Because at some point, a fight broke out and bullets started flying. One of those bullets hit 16-year-old David Cobb in the spine, and despite there being hundreds of witnesses, this case would ultimately go on unsolved partly due to a fear in the community of retaliation against those who would be seen as a snitch for speaking to law enforcement. What? As a result, the family of Lil Dave would be left grieving without closure, heartbroken that their child lost his life at an event that was intended to honor teens losing their lives to gun violence. And it wasn't just Dave's family who were devastated by this loss. Youngboy himself would be distraught and traumatized by losing a friend to gun violence so young. He would go on to rap about the loss of Lil Dave and the effect that it had on him years later. Youngboy would rap on the song For Keeps with Rich the Kid that Dave was killed by a chopper or machine gun and that he wishes he could call him. Also, on the aptly named song Homicide, Youngboy expresses his desire to get revenge and kill the person who took Dave's life, as well as saying that he knows Lil Dave is still with him on the song Poor One. On the song Cage Feeling, Youngboy speaks about the death of Lil Dave, saying that this loss turned his heart cold and made him become a killer. The fact that Youngboy was no stranger to loss of friends and family at such a young age just goes to show you the kind of environment he was growing up in, and the factors that coerced him into the kind of lifestyle he would go on to live. But Youngboy was already being influenced by the streets. He would actually later rap in the song Life that Lil Dave was the person who taught him how to smoke, shoot dice, and get money for sneakers. He also said that he felt life began getting crazy for him when Lil Dave was killed. In the song Better Man, Youngboy would claim to be tormented by the image of Lil Dave's murder in his mind, and on the track How I'm Living, he would vow to make the people responsible bleed for what they did to Dave. Later on, on the unreleased track Hold 13, All that, that pain, only bro. in a trailer for his hit album Top, Youngboy would rap a lyric which some believe is him actually confessing that when he made his first $20,000, he spent it on a hitman to get revenge on Lil Dave's killer. With this traumatic and personal loss, Hold on, what did he say? We introduce you to that gangster you turned in this way. They killed Lil Dave when I was 12. Made 20, knocked off. He spent face. it on a hitman to get revenge on Lil Dave's killer. With this traumatic and personal loss, combined with his family's reputation when it came to robberies, it's no surprise then that as a young teenager, young boy dropped out of school in the ninth grade and got heavily involved in the streets, becoming a teenage robber just like his father and uncle. Youngboy would later tell DJ Smalls Eyes in an interview that after his grandmother died, he started robbing himself and ultimately wound up in jail for a robbery at just age 14. I grew up taking, I grew up taking, I grew up stealing and taking from people. It's, it's like, well, at first, my grandma, my grandma used to take care of me. And when my grandma died, started catching my attention at a younger age. See, I got, I book, I got booked for robbery at um, my age. 14, 14, 14. Ultimately, Youngboy found himself in a youth detention center for this robbery, but perhaps this would be a blessing in disguise, as while he was incarcerated, he would claim to have found his purpose in life, beginning to write music and using that as a way to express himself and cope with the pains of life, vowing to become an artist 
rather than a criminal. I ain't gonna say it was the best thing that happened to me. It helped me know my purpose. It helped me know what I wanna do. Within them six months, I, I wrote at least like 25, 25 songs with no beat. It was basically I was going through how I was feeling. It helped me learn how to express myself. Youngboy's family <laughs> were actually always interested in music. Youngboy claimed to have written his own obscene rap lyrics in the fourth grade, and he had apparently been taken to the studio by his mother, who herself was also an aspiring rapper. And his father had even written to him from jail, telling him that he had been writing music during his 55-year sentence and encouraging Youngboy to focus on music too. So, upon his release from jail for robbery, Youngboy would return to 38th Street with little more than just a dream of becoming a rapper along with a lifetime of trauma. And before he could get anywhere with his rap career, he would at least need a stable environment to live in. Luckily, he ended up finding a new place in the neighborhood to call home, with Youngboy rapping on the song Life that he met his friend 3-3 riding his bike down Chippewa and that 3-3's mother accepted him into their home like family. According to 3-3, him and Youngboy are essentially brothers as the two grew up with the same mother, Monique. But Monique is really 3-3's biological mother, as we know that Youngboy is the biological son of Sharonda Golden. But due to the fact that 3-3's mother Monique helped raise Youngboy, he often refers to her as his mother as well, which would make 3-3 his adopted brother, and the two do seem to have a relationship that is stronger than most real brothers. And because of Facts. this, the two basically just say they're real brothers. You said you knew him since you were four? Because you guys are like brothers, and, went, and you've yeah. been, you were born around each other, yeah. so it's like you don't have any memories of it's not like, knowing him. No, it's like, it's like, you know how, how both our, our dad is, a, you know, split up, you know what I'm saying? So we got the same mom. It's okay. like, Man, really, I started making music with my brother. Just really inspired me to go in the booth because it really wasn't about me. It was really about young boy, and I was pushing him. And he, one day he just told me, man, look, come do this with me. And he pushed me to go in the booth, and I just took a liking into it. And, you know, that's where it really started from. So, you know, shout out YB. Meanwhile, Youngboy's relationship with his own biological mother Sharonda was up and down during his childhood. Mm -hmm. Years down the line, he would open up about this on the song Lonely Child from his October 2019 project AI Youngboy 2, when he says that even though he called 3-3's mother Monique his adopted mother, he still needs Sharonda in his life. Perhaps due to the lack of a real father figure growing up meant that he had to rely on both of his mothers for emotional and mental support. But anyway, after getting out of juvenile and finding a new safe space to call home, Youngboy's new spiritual brother 3-3 would be surprised supportive of his aspirations as a rapper, and together, this brotherly duo would get back to finessing on the streets to pay for studio time, eventually with Youngboy getting enough recording time in to produce a full-length musical project. And by April the 10th, 2015, Youngboy had released his first ever mixtape, Life Before Fame. This tape featured tracks like Homicide and Range Rover, which showed a 15-year-old Youngboy truly had the skills to pay the bills early on. The album begins with an intro where Youngboy mentions an affiliate of his named D-Dog catching a body. This sets the mood for the rest of the album, letting fans know straight away that Youngboy had ties with the streets, despite the fact that he was technically still a child at this point. And in the same song, he gives us an insight into his torturous relationships and the reason behind why he finds it so hard to remain faithful to his partners even at age 50. In the song I Know, Youngboy begins to paint a menacing picture of his position in the local gang hierarchy, mentioning on two occasions how he can rely on another known NBA affiliate by the name of Lil Pap to go get him. A brash statement which shows that even at age 15, Youngboy was really in the streets with people around him that he could send to do dirty work. Youngboy would also share his experience with Get Back and Vengeance in this project. On the track Deal With It, he talks about how revenge was exacted on the person who killed his uncle saying that they spotted the person who killed his uncle and that Youngboy witnessed somebody put that person in a casket, and going on to say that the deceased man's brother is now after him. This is an important lyric, as it shows that even back when he was just 15 years old, people were dying around Youngboy, being killed, and he was becoming a target himself, despite not being directly responsible for the violence that had played out. Elsewhere on this song, Youngboy pledges his allegiance to a group called TBG, or Top Boy Gorilla. This is the first crew or record label that Youngboy aligned himself with when he became a rapper. Though unfortunately, as is often the case in the streets, over time, as Youngboy's star rose, tension would brew between the members of TBG, arguing over who the next big rapper from the group would be. And eventually, what begun as a partnership would devolve into a deadly beef, with members of TBG picking their sides and the feud escalating into an all-out gang war, with people being murdered on both sides, and years of heartbreak playing out on the streets and in the music. When Youngboy left juvenile detention, inspired to become a rapper rather than a robber, it wouldn't take long for others to see the potential that this teenage rap prodigy had. From here, a group of people from his neighborhood, with ties to the music industry as well as the streets, would begin to take him under their wig. Youngboy's first mixtape, Life Before Fame, 
was actually released under the banner of TBG, with Youngboy and 3-3 being seen in throwback pictures rocking TBG merch. TBG stands for Top Boy Gorilla, a crew with a storied history in the wild and dangerous streets of Baton Rouge, Louisiana. TBG was supposedly started by deceased Louisiana native and affiliate of rap veteran Boosie, Little Ivy Smith. He would turn out to be the uncle of future TBG rap prospect Lit Yoshi, but more on him later. Now, Lil Ivy was sadly killed in an unsolved triple homicide back in 2005. However, at this early stage in the game, Youngboy was nothing more than a promising young prospect to these Baton Rouge rap OGs. The older members of TBG were looking to find the next up-and-coming rap rookie who could potentially be the next homegrown rap star to come out of Baton Rouge. And at the time, the real crown jewels of the TBG squad were a couple of rappers known as G-Money and Fredo Bang, who around the time were picking up steam with their song iPhone 6 alongside Boulevard Mel and YMA. Captain. You can tell that Youngboy was truly close with the TBG crew at this point because Youngboy even appeared in the background of the iPhone 6 music video, at one point handing a Gucci bag to Fredo Bang, a moment that would honestly be inconceivable in what would later become a deadly and bitter beef. As the story goes, the TBG crew had ties to Baton Rouge's criminal underworld, and rappers and affiliates of the TBG crew were still involved in the local drug trade. Unfortunately, soon some of this street beef would end up souring things on the music side because the TBG crew supposedly had a beef going with another Baton Rouge crew called BBG, or Bottom Boy Gorillas. Gang, crew, clique, record label, call them whatever you want, but BBG and TBG were bitter enemies. With a big rumor at one point going around that Youngboy's cousin Boozilla, who was affiliated with BBG, ended up in a bitter disagreement with G-Money from TBG. Now, there's been intense speculation over the years as to what was the exact cause of this beef. Some have suggested that Boozilla ran off with money or drugs from G-Money, whilst others suggest that the whole drama was actually over a woman. Another explanation even suggests that it was actually Youngboy himself who stole money from G-Money, but actually blamed the finesse on his cousin Boozilla, as Boozilla was seen on Twitter disavowing his own family at one point and G-Money seemingly indicating that this rumor was true on his diss track Industry, where he claimed that Youngboy had him looking for Boozilla with a gun and saying that Boozilla actually wanted to kill Youngboy over this whole situation. There's even an old clip circulating that showed Boozilla and BBG affiliate Baby Joe seemingly posted up with guns looking for Youngboy and saying FNBA. Yeah. This was unusual because previously Boozilla had claimed to be a member of the group NBA and even at one point referred to himself as NBA Boosie. Now, I'll explain to you what NBA means in a minute, but just bear with me. Because meanwhile, as that personal beef was developing, another more professional beef was emerging between Youngboy and the TBG crew. According to some, at a certain point Youngboy got frustrated with the TBG label. This was likely due to the fact that he wasn't necessarily getting the money or shine that he thought he deserved from the crew with their main focus being on building the careers of G-Money and Fredo Bang, rather than investing in Youngboy. So at some point, Youngboy and 3-3 would leave TBG, starting their own crew. Initially, 3-3 and Youngboy wanted a group based on Youngboy's initials, Kentrell Golden or KG. Since KG also means kilograms, the initial idea was to call their crew Weight Gang, another reference to the drug game. At first his name was like KG, but then we got like, that's where the Weight Gang come from. But it What did KG like, stand for? Like, his initials, that's, oh, okay. that's, that's his name, but right. Weight Gang was one of the first things he had came up with. But clearly that name wasn't really hitting the spot. So later on, a few of the members of this crew were just chilling, sitting on their porch, when Youngboy apparently vowed that he was not trying to go broke no more, to which other members of the crew agreed the same thing, with this pledge giving the crew inspiration to name themselves Never Broke Again, or NBA. Like when we was on the porch one day, it was like, we ain't trying to go broke no more, and then, he was like, I ain't, I ain't trying to go broke knees, so we never broke again. Like, you know what I'm saying? From day one, that's where NBA started from, like. So the NBA crew was born, naturally taking some inspiration from the National Basketball Association. They would even make their logo the Jumpman, the iconic logo affiliated with basketball legend Michael Jordan dunking a basketball. But for Never Broke Again, their version would be a man jumping up in the air holding a pistol. Youngboy's NBA crew wanted to go from pistol-toting stick-up kids to music industry heavy hitters bro, that being so paid as creative, much as professional bro. basketball players. Look, I ain't gonna lie, and I'm not trying to interrupt too often, because I'm trying to knock out this drawing as fast as I possibly can. Like, I'm challenging myself here, guys. Um, I want to get it to, like, a good point. Not just, oh, that's good, but, like, what I really think is good in the same space of time this documentary lasts so within five hours six hours whatever that's what i'm trying to do 
But I always tell people, bro, like, ever since I started listening to Young Boy, like, for real, I'm like, yo, this kid mad creative, son. Like, just, he's actually super creative, like, genius level creative. Now, whether or not you like the name, there was no denying that the meaning behind it was powerful. And together, the Never Broke Again crew rallied around Youngboy, vowing to do whatever it took to take him to the top and make sure that they as a group never go broke again. So before we dive any deeper into the goings on of the Never Broke Again crew, let's just take a quick look at some of the main members of that collective so that you can follow everything that's about to go down in this long and complicated story. Me NBA. Youngboy is of course the face of Never Broke Again, the NBA collective, he is the label's leading rapper. And this crew's bet on getting behind Youngboy's career would ultimately end up paying off handsomely. And with his crew's support, he would go on to become one of the biggest artists in the entire world. Then there's OG33, NBA's co-founder who started the group along with Youngboy and Montana. I started NBA, you know, like, it was then like Youngboy just was really like the main one who was rapping, like I don't really, like, I don't really take rapping serious because, like, Youngboy really made me rap. After 3 Three's mother took Youngboy in as one of her own, they would build a bond as strong as blood brothers. We got the same mom, okay. like, like that. OG33 is one of ten children, five kids from his mother's side, five from his father's side. But he's the oldest of all of them, which has led to him having a mature outlook and a real head on his shoulders as he's almost had to act like a father figure for Youngboy and his other siblings. Yeah. There's ten kids all together, right? Yeah. Five from your mom yeah, and five, five from, from your dad. dad. Yeah. On both sides, I'm close with all my brothers and sisters because I'm the oldest, so it's just like... You're yeah, almost right. like a father figure yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Is that a lot of responsibility? It must yeah. be. Yeah, for sure, but you know, that's just my role. So, it's just, yeah, I took on my role. role. When Youngboy didn't really want to rap at first, it was 3-3 that pushed him and made sure that he stuck with it, dedicating his life to elevating Youngboy's career and keeping him on the right path. I always was the one that always pushed him, like, because he didn't really want to rap at first, but then, like, once I really found out, like, he was going to be that, like, I pushed him even more, more, harder, harder. Mm. Like, I was getting a thought, like, I went back to, like, record companies was doing, like, I was getting a thousand CDs printed up, like, man, I, I didn't get them thousand CDs and really passed them out, like, just the man of men is like, this, that. It's three who pulls the strings and make the moves behind the scenes, keeping the ship sailing smoothly and ensuring that the NBA collective runs efficiently and profitably. He apparently would manage the business side of things, sometimes writing contracts or putting shows together. I was more on the, like the business and management, like writing contracts and you know, putting shows together for him. Like when we first started off, I was doing really everything, you know. And Youngboy apparently even inspired OG3 to start making his own music because before, 3 was just mainly focused on pushing Youngboy's career. If it wasn't for YB walking me into the booth, I wouldn't even be in the music because I was just mainly pushing him. It wasn't even about me. Now. 3-3 does enjoy rapping, but he's also proclaimed CEO, and business is apparently where his passion lies. My main focus is it wouldn't be a career. I wouldn't choose rap as a career because I am a CEO and I love my position. But 3 has also gained a cult following of his own from being the head honcho of the NBA crew. And considering the dark reputation that has followed Youngboy over the many deadly years of his career, this has led to many internet fanboys speculating on whether OG3 is the true mastermind behind the violence playing out in Baton Rouge. Mm. With many Reddit posts circulating, constantly speculating on how many deaths that 3-3 might be responsible for, even sometimes referring to him as the Grim Threeper. But it's unclear mm. if that is just straight trolling. Because in reality, OG3 has always tried to look out and take care of Youngboy and keep him on the straight and narrow, acting as the voice of reason in his life. And that's my baby brother. I always look out for him. I always take care of him. But like, I don't... I don't ever expect him to do nothing bad, but he don't he do not do it intentionally. It might be on accident, but I always talk to him and enforce that, like, we shouldn't be doing a lot of things, and you know he listens. So it's like, I always was that type of person. Right. I always was that. Kind of like the voice of reason for when he gets a little hot-headed, you're like, so yeah. that'll help calm him down. Cause he probably yeah. listen to you and he ain't trying to listen to a lot of random people. Yeah, he ain't gonna listen to nobody, if it ain't me. Then you've got Montana. According to a Billboard article profiling Youngboy, Kyle Montana Clybourne found Youngboy's music early on YouTube. And in the absence of a father figure or any real older male role model in his family, it seems like Montana assumed a kind of father figure role for Youngboy in the early stages of his life and career, giving him guidance on how to survive the gritty streets of North Baton Rouge. In fact, in the song Lonely Child from his October 2019 project AI Youngboy 2, 
Youngboy admits that he has been missing his father, and as a result, he actually calls Montana his father. Montana would help co-found the Never Broke Again label, along with Youngboy and 3-3, with interviews explaining that in the early days of NBA, Youngboy would be sleeping on an air mattress at Montana's house, at a time when Montana played the role of manager, booking agent, and financier, driving Youngboy all around the South to perform for between $500 and $1,500 a show to build his fan base in the early days. However, there's always been confusion over exactly who Youngboy's manager specifically is, and to be fair, it has changed over the years. For a period of time, Youngboy's manager was a man by the name of Big Dump. Sometimes referred to as Youngboy's manager or agent, it was Dump who was there for Youngboy during the most turbulent years of his come up. But Dump would ultimately end up losing his life in 2018, seemingly as a direct result of the deadly street beef between these two warring Baton Rouge gang sets. But we'll go much deeper into that situation later on in the story. Another person who played a significant role on the management side is someone called Fee Banks a Louisiana industry legend who had apparently helped Lil Wayne start Young Money and previously managed Kevin Gates. These people are the brains and administrators behind the NBA empire. And then, when it comes to the rapping side, we have a number of NBA members with a much closer proximity to the streets. Now, there's a lot of names that have been affiliated with this crew over the years, and this list is by no means a definitive list of everyone who has had something to do with NBA as a crew, so don't be offended if you got left off. But these are just some of the people who have played a major role in Youngboy's crew and who play a relevant role in today's story. I like story. that break in the fourth wall right like there. like NBA Ben 10. <laughs> this is OG3's younger blood cousin and a day one NBA affiliate. Ben met Youngboy at Three's house, and apparently the two had a fight the first time that they met. Man, man, three first cousins, blood. Like, we just stay together. His my mom used to live together, so that's how I met three. And uh, I met them in the three house. I met them. We had a fight the same day, you heard me? But apparently after this fight, they would share a blunt and become good friends, going on to make money and catch cases together since they It'd were be just like that, years though. old. We spoke the blunt. It'd be like that. Yeah, became... Some of my longest friends from Trinidad, I fought with them for when I first meet them, not like the very first day, but like in the first month I meet them, me and them fight, we knock heads. And then after that, we homies, bro. Like right now, right now, one of my closest homies in the world, man, no matter where, where I end up living, I'm gonna always be able to call my homie back in Trinidad, bro. I remember we had a fight when we first met. <laughs> Came for the NBA the same day. Like that. How old y'all was like around that time? I'd say probably, probably from the turn 12 or 12. And you know what's crazy, gang? You know what's crazy? We used to say he looked like NBA Youngboy. Oh, well, NBA Youngboy looked like him. Yo, that's crazy. Hey, shout out Chance, bro. Ben has been a key part of the collective since day one, with a huge presence on social media, particularly Instagram, where he would give exclusive insights and snippets into the world of Never Broke Again. Ten still posts regularly on Instagram, despite his original account having been taken down, and he's even seen some recent success in his own right as a rapper, with songs such as Pain and Walking Dead amassing over one million views each. But he's also a loose cannon, and not somebody to be messed with. He was seen on IG Live with Youngboy, Baby Joe, and other NBA members playing with guns, with Ben 10 letting off shots on IG Live, causing Baby Joe to duck for cover. BBG Baby Joe is another one of Youngboy's cousins, who despite his young age, has lived for a lot, including a bullet to the face. You know, you guys were on the freeway, I think it was you and two friends, and uh, a car opened fire on you guys. We were leaving Walmart, and my head went and got some, uh, some cake and ice cream for my baby for his birthday. And I walk out Walmart, I see this shit. And, and then I, 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 we didn't get, I, I didn't get shot on the interstate. I don't know where people get their information from. I was trying to light. We was at the light. And then it just, it just went like that. You know what I mean? Despite facing serious danger in the streets, Baby Joe has been aiming to make a name for himself in the music industry and make himself some legitimate money. His 2018 song, Iraq, has over 5 million views, and as a beloved member of the NBA crew, Joe's name often pops up in Youngboy's songs. And if these lyrics are anything to go by, it seems that Joe's relationship with the streets remains strong. Another key member of the crew is Michi Baby. Well known as Youngboy's raspy-voiced big cousin, he's best known for his early 2000s style song, Cutlass, as well as his 2020 track with Youngboy, Talk My a track which has amassed an impressive 47 million views at the time of recording. Youngboy has talked about hitting licks and doing burglaries with his older cousin Michi on numerous occasions in his lyrics, leading some listeners to think that it was perhaps Michi who had influenced Youngboy's involvement with the streets in his early life. 
Then of course you have Big B, who picked up a lot of attention for his fire verse on the NBA posse cut, That Gang, which picked up over 5 million views and also featured 3-3 and KD. Big B exhibits a more conventional rapping style compared to some other members of the NBA crew, with less laid-back melodies and catchy hooks, and more hard-hitting bars and punchy refrains delivered with aggressiveness and energy on the mic. There's NBA KD, he's known musically for his versatility and distinct flow, as well as a standout performance on the song That Gang. He also popped up with a verse on the song Extortion with Big B and 3-3, a track which got over 2 million views. His biggest solo track is the 2018 song When I Wake Up, and KD showed a lot of promise and potential in the early years of rap. Unfortunately, his momentum was derailed by a life-changing injury getting shot in 2019. Reportedly, after this incident, KD was confined to a wheelchair. Oh, However, there's been a lot of speculation as to whether he was walking again after a period of rehabilitation. Whilst that's not been confirmed, since the incident, he's remained firmly behind the scenes, but is a beloved member of NBA. Another major member of the crew is Herm the Black Sheep. Musically, fans appreciate Herm for his real and authentic lyrics and subject matter rather than his style or flow on the mic. And if the content of his lyrics are to be believed, he is certainly not one to be messed with. In the same vein, there's also Hu Gang D, aka Lil D, or Scully. This is another cousin of Youngboy with a serious reputation in the streets and his own budding rap career, with his catchy double meaning titled song, Can't Go To Sleep, running up 1.6 million views at the time of this writing. Interestingly though, D wasn't even aware that he was Youngboy's cousin when they first became friends, apparently only finding out later through his mother and grandfather. I didn't know he was my, my cousin at first. Oh, really? See, I was thugging with three okay. at first. And then my mama had texted me like, when I was with him for a whole month straight, where I be for a month, she had texted me. She was like, uh, she talked to my my papa, and she had, and he told her that I had a cousin named maybe a young boy that rap. You get what I'm saying? And she was like, for real, that's crazy. He already be hanging with him. He's apparently the survivor of a gunshot wound to the neck, with Youngboy having dropped numerous lyrics complimenting D as a reliable shooter, even going as far in the song Bring the Hook to label him a headshot specialist. This is a skill that D himself all but admitted in his Off the Porch interview. Yeah, how'd you get the nickname Scully? <laughs> From this tattoo, I'm just gonna say it like that. The gun, shooting the score. Yeah. Scully. He's got a promising rap career, a likeable personality, and a big potential to be a star on the mic if he can stay out of trouble. You've also got Lil Pap, Ben 10's little brother, and a known shooter for the NBA crew in the streets. Youngboy has mentioned him as being active in the streets in numerous songs, labeling him specifically as somebody who Youngboy can call on for certain favors. And he recently got five years for his apparent involvement in the murder of TBG rival rapper G Money, which we will discuss in detail shortly. There's also NBA Chopper Boy, a big man with a big range in his vocals, bringing a great singing voice to the mic that serves to provide a canvas for his dark and menacing lyrics. Then you've got Barber, one of Youngboy's frequently referenced shooters. Like Pap, Baba, or Baba Osama, is mentioned quite a bit in some of Youngboy's most violent songs, with Youngboy even rapping on the track Carter's Son that he calls up Baba to get the guns and go and rob people for him. Now, Baba has a pretty extensive rap sheet demonstrating just how active he was in the streets, and he's currently locked up on murder charges. But these aren't your average murder charges. It's actually been reported that Baba Osama is facing a whopping nine counts of murder, with some recent posts on social media even suggesting that Baba Osama was actively working as a gang assassin or hitman engaging in murder for hire for numerous gangs. Now that's not necessarily everybody that's been involved with Youngboy's NBA crew over the years, but they are the people that we'll be talking about most extensively in today's story. Clearly Youngboy's NBA crew are a group of young men coming out of some of the most difficult streets that the Deep South has to offer. Clearly some of these guys aren't afraid to break the law and even kill to protect what's theirs. Whether that's their own lives, the lives of those around them, or the life of their top Can you blame them though? The NBA crew are truly willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that they indeed never go broke again. However, there's been a lot of confusion over the years, because as well as NBA, there's another group that Youngboy and other NBA members shout out a lot, and that's 4K Trey, or 4KT. It would appear that while Youngboy started his record label in the name NBA, or Never Broke Again, his affiliations to actual gangs in the streets of Baton Rouge goes by another name. Youngboy has dropped numerous lyrics where he claims to be a member of the gang 4K Trey, who sometimes refer to themselves as Slimes. He's also made numerous references to being in America's infamous blood gang. Now, slime is a decades-old term that has been associated over the years with Blood Gang members. This term was initially brought to the public's attention by Blood rapper Vado, who released numerous projects that would reference slime. 
with the usage of the blood slang slime and slat being popularized in mainstream modern rap music by Atlanta blood rapper Young Thug, who is currently incarcerated awaiting trial for gang-affiliated charges. Now, this slime ideology essentially sees blood members identifying under the color green rather than the traditional red bandana that blood members are known to wear. And as Youngboy got further into the music industry, he would seemingly build close relationships with other rappers who were known to affiliate with the blood gang or identified as slime. People like Birdman, 21 Savage, and Young Thug himself. And as the years went by, Youngboy would increasingly use his lyrics and music videos to shout out his affiliations to 4K Trey, the blood gang, or slimes. Even naming his Never Broke Again label compilation album them, green flag activity, along with him and his crew frequently being seen in public with nothing but slime green bandanas and blue clothing. They would also sometimes refer to each other as Fours for 4K Trey. However, for the specific explanation of the gang's name, 4K Trey, this has been a mystery that has sparked debate amongst NBA fans for years. One popular theory is that it simply means 4 Kentrell, and that his 4K T gang are killing or shooting specifically for Youngboy, or Kentrell. Another popular theory claims that 4KT actually stands for Forever Killing Them, a more general rallying cry against their ops. Other people think that 4KT actually relates to the names of Youngboy's first children, with the first four of their names beginning with K and one beginning with T, with this being a more vanilla interpretation of the gang's name, suggesting that 4KT is a way of Youngboy saying that he's essentially doing what he does for his children, whose initials are K and T. Another explanation circulates, suggesting that 4KT actually means for Crazy Trey. This is a reference to Crazy Trey, a young man from Baton Rouge who was gunned down at a party in 2014. He was apparently close friends with one of Youngboy's biggest enemies from Baton Rouge, Fredo Bang, a detail which has led many to suggest that this actually couldn't possibly be the true meaning of 4K Trey, with some outright denying this explanation, suggesting that Youngboy had not even yet associated with Fredo Bang at the time 4KT was founded. There's yet another theory that 4KT actually refers to Youngboy's cousin Boozilla, who was killed in 2016, as his real name was Keandre, with a suggestion that 4K Trey actually was originally 4K Dre, or Keandre, but the Dre over time ended up being changed to Trey. Now look, at this stage, it's unclear exactly what 4K Trey stands for, but in the end, perhaps we aren't supposed to know the real meaning. And the idea that the true origins of this gang that Youngboy supposedly affiliates with being shrouded in secrecy kind of makes perfect sense. After all, Youngboy's artist Quando Rondo would even say in his song Way Up that he actually threw a girl out just for even asking what 4K Trey meant. Clearly it's a secret, and clearly I'm not supposed to know, which means you are definitely not supposed to know. But now you know the city, the gangs, the label, and the people behind the music, let's take a closer look at the story, the incredible ups, the devastating downs, and the lessons to be learned from Youngboy's one-of-a-kind career and life journey. After falling out with his old label and crew, TBG or Top Boy Gorillaz, Youngboy and his brother from another mother, OG3, <laughs> would start their new crew, NBA, vowing to make it in the rap game and never go broke again. From day one, that's where NBA started from, like, me and him sitting on that porch, like, really saying we were not trying to go broke no more. The formation of his new NBA crew was announced with a bang when Youngboy dropped his earliest surviving music video, the aptly titled NBA, on his own YouTube channel. That video saw Youngboy and 3-3 surrounded by their NBA muscle all around 38th Street with all type of firearms. And the song itself came with lyrics where Youngboy shouted out his shooter, NBA Pap, rapping that he sends Pap to go and hit people up, as well as shouting out another shooter as NBA Connor with the Mac 11, going on to describe his NBA shooters as being as proficient with firearms as Navy SEALs. He would also rap about the cops and his ops in the city trying to hunt him down, and naming NBA outright as the gang that he represents. Youngboy's first ever mixtape, Life Before Fame, was launched under the TBG banner, the label Top Boy Gorillas, with their logo visible on the bottom left of the cover art. But by December 1st, 2015, Youngboy was going at it alone under his new NBA banner, with a fresh mixtape, Mind of a Menace, being released fully independently and presented under the banner of his own NBA crew. And it would appear that Youngboy and NBA were using this project as an opportunity to drop sneak disses and disrespect towards their former crew, TBG. On the project, he would drop several lines that were directed towards TBG, suggesting that they envied him and that he wasn't willing to work under somebody else's administration. Youngboy was beginning to build momentum independently of his former crew, and he'd keep his foot on the gas into 2016, following up his second mixtape with Speed. On April the 1st, 2016, only four months after Mind of a Menace dropped, Youngboy blessed his budding fanbase with a sequel. Mind of a Menace 2, and on this project, he continued to drop shade on his former crew TBG. In the intro for this tape, he suggests that they didn't live up to their promises and says that he's ready to go to war with his former allies. Then in the song A Lot of Miles, 
Youngboy explains that rather than switching on TBG like some say he did, he actually claims to have just gotten smarter and that he hasn't really changed at all. Perhaps indicating that he felt he got smart to what was going on and realized that his career would benefit more as a free agent. Youngboy would seemingly indicate his team's readiness to go to war with their former crew. On the track Fact, rapping that he's riding around with Pap, OG3, and Guns, looking for their ops and aiming to make their guns go boom when they see them. Around this time, it seems clear that Youngboy formed his winning strategy of flooding the internet with music through frequent mixtape releases. Less than three months after Mind of a Menace 2, Youngboy would drop yet another mixtape, Before I Go, which was released on June the 27th, 2016. And on this project, Youngboy would begin to drop hints alluding to the ongoing beef with G-Money, the star rapper of his former crew, TBG, Top Boy Gorillaz. Youngboy would also be shooting more threats to his former crew on the song Change, saying Youngboy Boy, not TBG, and if someone plays, he's gonna get it. And another lyric on the song Change seemed to acknowledge a rumor that G Money had actually hooked up with Youngboy's sister, with Youngboy saying he won't speak on sleeping with my sister, something that perhaps wasn't public knowledge at the time of this song's release. But around a year later, G Money would openly admit and kind of brag about hooking up with Youngboy's sister in a Say Cheese interview. He met about his sister too, though. About his sister? Yeah, I had a long time ago. Oh, okay, okay. The beef between Youngboy and G-Money would be further complicated by Youngboy's cousin Boozilla. Boozilla repped BBG, or Bottom Boy Gorillas. They were the main rivals of TBG until Youngboy started his NBA crew. Story goes that G-Money from TBG was beefing with Boozilla from BBG over some stolen drugs. Drugs which some believe Youngboy himself may have actually stolen, blaming Boozilla. This theory is based on lyrics G-Money rapped on his song Industry, where he claimed Youngboy's own cousin wanted to kill him. So, on July the 16th, 2016, Youngboy's cousin Boozilla drops the song Forgive Me, where he's dissing TBG and repping BBG. He wears a BBG t-shirt in the video, and he shouts out the Bottom Boys as his crew. He'd rap lyrics seeming to suggest that he was a shooter and that he wants to kill a rapper. But more specifically, he dissed another local rapper by the name of FL Dusa. Dusa is from the FL, or Forever Loyalty Crew, who would later be closely affiliated with TBG, with Dusa himself later dropping numerous songs with Fredo Bang, Lit Yoshi, and other TBG artists. In Boozilla's song Forgive Me, he raps that Dusa is scared to walk through the South and that he's laying down the law in his area. Apparently, the beef between Boozilla and Dusa was extremely personal and would eventually turn dead. But before things would escalate to more violence, Youngboy would end up making a huge leap forward in his rap career. On September the 21st, 2016, Youngboy drops the video for his breakout track, 38 Baby. Named after the street he grew up on, Northside 38, this song was a window into his life fresh out of the streets. The track painted a picture of his daily life, drinking lean, smoking with demons, and sending his hitters at people for any reason he can find, explaining how he's not able to go anywhere without being armed and having to look out for old friends who turned on him over envy. Frankly, this song described a lot of pressure for a 16-year-old kid to be dealing with at the time. In the track, he'll- See, that's something I always like told myself, but I never wanted, bro. I remember one time, uh, one time, I, was, I think I was, yeah, I was living in Trinidad at the time. I was like 14, and um, I went to Movie Town. That's the name of the spot, you know, the cinema. It's kind of in the name, right? So I went to Movie Town, and I was hanging with some of my friends, and we was asking for somebody. And uh, I can't remember if it was me or somebody else called him and put him on speaker or something. And he was asking, like, yo, who there? Like down there because he had beef with some people and after the phone call I remember thinking to myself like bro I don't want to be doing this where I gotta call and be like yo who there before I could go somewhere like that ain't the life I want to be able to go wherever and it don't matter who there you feel me he also seemed to drop shade on G-Money and TBG, denying their claims that they blew him up as a rapper and claiming that they just don't like the fact that he's now blowing up faster than them. The music video for 38 Baby saw Youngboy and his friends toting plenty of firearms, and many people were taken aback by seeing somebody so young surrounded by so much danger and communicating the stark reality of their life so clearly over a catchy beat. Hell, footage would later even circulate showing that Youngboy actually recorded many of the songs from around this period with an actual AK-47 on him in the recording booth. 
This 16 year old young boy was living a life truly beyond his years. And this spectacle would attract the attention of many, many more fans and music industry players. The song 38 Baby and its music video has garnered over 100 million views on YouTube to this Crazy, day. And the song bro. itself was followed by a full mixtape also titled 38 Baby, which dropped on October the 28th, 2016. This project would truly be the watershed moment of Youngboy's career professionally, and he would finally get co-signs from respected rappers in the industry. As on the mixtape itself, Youngboy secured collaborations with fellow Louisiana Baton Rouge legends such as Kevin Gates and Boosie Badass, as well as a verse from his day one brother OG3. In fact, Kevin Gates, after appearing on the 38 Baby mixtape track Like Me, even got a portrait of Youngboy tattooed on his right leg just to show his admiration for the rising Louisiana legend. And Boosie would invite Youngboy to feature on his November 26th 16 track, My Lil' Son, where Youngboy rapped menacingly about sliding on his ops with NBA Joe and 3-3. But back to the 38 Baby mixtape. As well as gaining Youngboy the respect of heavy hitters in the Baton Rouge rap scene, it also gained Youngboy an enormous amount of fame and success in the eyes of his fanbase. Mm -hmm. But bizarrely, in very Youngboy fashion, rather than reveling in the success of his latest release, just a week I'm after the 38 Baby project dropped, he came out with yet another mixtape, Mind of a Menace 3, releasing on November the 4th, 2016. This time coming with yet another major industry cosign. Gang, I notice that something young boy be doing. He uh Oh that's dope. He has his sources down at the bottom where he get the image from. Okay, heard you. But yeah, um Yeah, I noticed young boy be doing that. He be like drop a project and a week later he'll drop a whole nother project. I feel like that's literally his plan. Like he just noticed this going bang, then he drop a project. Or if it hit a certain amount of numbers, then he'll drop the next one. A remix of his song Murder featuring Atlanta Blood rapper 21 Savage. A remix which also dropped with a music video the very same day. Youngboy even later claimed that he became a member of 21 Savage's set of the Blood Gang 4L, and they seemingly fostered a close relationship, something which would unfortunately deteriorate years later. But regardless, at this point Youngboy seemingly had fully muscled his way into the music industry, and it would be these major moves that would have Youngboy's name ringing not just in the streets, but also in the corner offices of record labels. At a certain point in 2016, he started working with super manager Fee Banks, a Louisiana industry legend who had apparently helped Lil Wayne start Young Money and previously managed Kevin Gates. He would begin to advocate on behalf of Youngboy in the music industry, ultimately putting him in the position to field multi-million dollar offers from major record labels. So at this point, Youngboy was seemingly set. He had survived the dangerous streets of Northside 38, escaping the trenches with his life and escaping the clutches of his former crew TBG as a free agent able to take his career wherever he wanted without hindrance. The problem is, sometimes you can rise to the top so fast that it hurts. And unfortunately for Youngboy, troubling legal issues seem to arrive just as quickly as the money and fame did. And unfortunately, due to the brewing troubles in the streets between his former crew and his extended family, Youngboy would end up being placed in a difficult position, ultimately catching a serious case that had the potential to put complete stop to his promising career just as it was getting started. While Youngboy's star is beginning to rise, the deadly war on the streets of Baton Rouge is raging on. After departing from the crew TBG, Top Boy Gorilla, Youngboy and his Never Broke Again or NBA collective would become bitter rivals with the former crew. And this situation was only complicated further by the ongoing drama between TBG and their original rivals, BBG, Bottom Boy Gorillas, a crew which Youngboy's cousin Boozilla was a prominent member of. Despite the two apparently having a falling out in 2015, it would seem that by 2016, Boozilla and Youngboy's NBA crew had made things right, as Boozilla would post on Twitter that he'd forgiven, as well as tweeting warning people not to play with BBG or NBA, suggesting that these two crews were in alliance against TBG and any of their affiliates. But things would all come to a head for these warring groups at the end of 2016. On July the 16th, 2016, Youngboy's cousin Boozilla drops the song Forgive Me, where he's dissing TBG and repping BBG, with lyrics in the song dissing another local rapper by the name of FL Dusa, saying Dusa is scared to walk through the South and that they're laying down the law in their area. It would seem that this lyric was taken as a personal challenge by his opposition, as just after midnight on November the 2nd, 2016, Youngboy's cousin, 18-year-old BBG Boozilla, real name Keandre Ricks, would be riding his bike near the 2000 block of Nebraska Street, less than a block from his family home. And it was here where he was targeted by gunmen who shot him multiple times in the upper torso and left him dead 
in the middle of the street. Boozilla's mother would go on to do a distraught interview with WAFB News after reports of the brutal killing became public. You gotta bury your child. This is so wrong when people kill people kids. Kenya Taylor is still grieving. More than a month after her son, 18-year-old Keandre Ricks, was shot and killed just steps away from his Nebraska street home. It's like I'm dreaming and I haven't woke up yet. Like, I had a bad, bad dream. I'm just waiting on the Lord to wake me up. Taylor walked us over to where her son's oh, body was found, a place she's visited often, trying to make sense of the senseless killing. Then this way he must have fell it right here. Could have had blood all right here. Now, after the shooting, things get very complicated. It's widely believed that the murder of Boozilla was in connection with the ongoing feud that he had going with Ethel Dusa, with the majority of the comments on Boozilla's music video Forgive Me seeming to mock him, saying that he said Dusa is scared to walk through the South, and suggesting that this caused somebody to come through and take his life. Now, despite the differences they may have had in the past, naturally the murder of Boozilla would have devastating effects on his cousin Youngboy and other members of NBA and BBG. So, unsurprisingly, it didn't take long for those on Boozilla's side to attempt to get revenge for his murder. Boozilla was killed around midnight on Wednesday the 2nd November 2016, and retaliation would come around nine and a half hours later, when around 9.30 a.m., on the 2000 block of Kentucky Street, just a couple of blocks away from where the fatal shooting of Boozilla occurred, a vehicle containing Youngboy and three of his NBA affiliates pulls up and starts shooting. Unfortunately, this attempt at revenge ends up going wrong, and somebody from Youngboy's group ends up getting shot in the neck, allegedly NBA Joe. Police find a man suffering from a gunshot wound to the neck, saying he was shot in a different neighborhood just a few streets away. With rumors circulating, debating whether or not it was friendly fire from young boy or his side hitting Joe, or the targets of their gunfire returning fire and connecting. And years later, the police report from the incident would even suggest that young boy himself had been firing from the vehicle with an assault rifle. Regardless of exactly who was responsible, at this point the getaway car flees the scene, with the shooters and the injured man driving to the area of May and East Lakeshore Drive. Ultimately, this car would end up getting a flat tire and crashing at the LSU Lakes. Here, the shooters flee, leaving the injured man in his vehicle, where he's fortunately found by police and given medical attention. Naturally, it didn't take long for details of these outrageous back-to-back -back shootings to hit the news. At this hour, there are a lot of questions remaining around two Baton Rouge shootings. One left a teenager dead, the other ended with the victim wounded at LSU Lakes. Possibly three different scenes and all three may be connected. That's what Baton Rouge police are trying to figure out. They've been interviewing witnesses, but so far they do not have any suspects. Just after midnight, Baton Rouge police went out to Nebraska Street. 18-year-old Keandre Ricks was found dead, lying in the street, shot multiple times in the chest. Neighbors in the area tell us they saw a silver-colored Hyundai with three people inside driving around the area late night and into this morning. Then, shortly after 9.30 this morning, police get a call from a man shot once in the neck around the LSU lakes. When they finally found him, he was in a silver-colored Hyundai. He was transported to the hospital and listed in stable condition as of now. Baton Rouge police have said the shooting did not start here at the lakes. Instead, they're looking to see if three different scenes are all connected. The first was at Nebraska, well, just eight streets over or 0.4 miles away. Around 9.30 this morning, police say a man was shot in the neck. He or the suspect then drove 1.4 miles to East Lake Shore in May around the LSU lakes and called police for help. This is not a random shooting. They believe the shooter and victim actually did know each other. Surprisingly, however, the violence was still not over. And the following day, on the 3rd of November 2016, at roughly 9.49 a.m., shooters would return to the street where Booza lived with his family and was killed, with officers nearby claiming to have heard 37 gunshots apparently fired by two shooters who then fled the scene in a getaway vehicle. They would leave two homes on the street riddled with bullets. And at this point, the violence in Baton Rouge, held just in this street alone, was spiraling out of control. Mm -hmm. And at a certain point, the danger was so high that the authorities placed the local school on lockdown out of fear that further shootings would affect the children in the local community. A number of schools in East Baton Rouge Parish are on lockdown. And for separate reasons today, we start with the three schools that were also placed on lockdown yesterday. Police are still on scene here at the intersection of Nebraska and East Harrison Street. They're looking into reports of shots fired earlier today. Now you can see uh, details are still very limited, but much of the investigation is centered around this white home here, uh, right near the intersection of East Harrison and Nebraska Street. 
Street. Uh, this is the latest in a rash of recent shootings in this area over the past few days, including one that left an 18 year old dead. The teen was found shot to death Wednesday in the 2000 block of Nebraska Street. That incident happened around midnight. Then yesterday morning around 930, a man was shot in the neck on Kentucky Street, which is just a couple of blocks from the spot where that fatal shooting occurred. The victim left the area in a car and then parked around the LSU lakes to call for help. These recent violent incidents near Nebraska have left some residents feeling uneasy. At this point, even people living on this street were being interviewed by the news, telling them that it's like living in hell. I live on this street and this by the worst street to live on. You say living in hell? This is hell right here. The young folks don't have no respect for old Elizabeth. At some point, the shooting would stop, the smoke would clear, and local investigators would finally be able to piece together exactly what had happened and putting those involved in handcuffs. A 17-year-old man by the name of Trey Sean Coates would be arrested and charged with second-degree murder for the killing of Boozilla, along with a 27-year-old man by the name of Monty Carey. This was reported in The Advocate that also published an interview with Boozilla's mother. In it, she would claim that since the killing, her other children's grades have fallen in school and that they're suffering behavioral issues. And I thought that this was an important detail to include, because you have to remember that when somebody gets killed in a gang feud, it starts a chain reaction. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, this cycle of violence affects far more than just the victims. Whether it's their innocent relatives suffering depression following the incident, or surviving friends who vow to commit acts of violence in revenge, a vicious cycle is started when that first killing happens that only accelerates with more retaliation dragging more and more innocent people into this deadly cycle of violence. Anyway, despite the rumors that F.L. Dusa was involved in the killing of Boozilla after he dissed him on the song Forgive Me, Dusa, real name Renard Clifton, would not be connected to this incident officially, though theories would circulate online suggesting that he was the one that sent the hit. He would remain free following this incident, going on to release songs like Straight Facts. However, he would end up in jail on a separate attempted murder charge stemming from a double shooting on the 3rd of June 2018, which we'll go into in detail later. But with the shooters of Boozilla in cuffs, the Baton Rouge police would next be tasked with finding those NBA members who slid the following day, with one member who got shot in the neck already in the arms of law enforcement. Their next job was to get their hands on Youngboy himself. A warrant was issued for his arrest, and he would be tracked down by authorities, being arrested on November the 28th, being taken into custody by US Marshals just before he could get on stage at a show in Austin, Texas, in dramatic scenes that were even caught on camera. Hey, get inside, get inside. Hey, get the hell inside. Youngboy was charged on suspicion of attempted first-degree murder from the alleged drive-by shooting, while NBA Big B, real name True Londrick Norman, was also involved in the shooting but wouldn't get arrested for his role in it until 2019. There was also NBA Ben 10, real name Ben Fields, who would also be identified as having participated in this drive-by shooting. As a result, following the arrest of the NBA crew and Youngboy himself, the local news will begin to report on this dramatic takedown of one of Baton Rouge's most promising rappers. 17-year-old rapper Kentrell Golden, better known by his stage name NBA Youngboy, is behind bars tonight after being taken into custody by federal authorities before a concert in Austin, Texas. Tonight, police say they've arrested 17-year-old Kentrell Golden, a rapper known by his stage name, NBA Youngboy, in connection to a drive-by shooting on Kentucky Street. Detectives believe those shootings may have been in retaliation to Rick's death and say more arrests are possible as they continue to investigate. At this point, Youngboy would be taken back to Louisiana and booked into prison with a $200,000 bond being set. But the Baton Rouge police weren't done seeking justice yet as the final piece of the puzzle would fall into place once police announced an arrest in the third shooting, which occurred on Boozilla Street the day after NBA members had attempted to get revenge for his death the previous night, with cops identifying 20-year-old Derek Geis, who was taken into custody, accused of being the getaway driver for two other shooters, being charged with attempted murder, attempted second-degree murder, aggravated criminal damage of property, illegal use of a weapon, and simple criminal damage to property. And he would ultimately end up pleading down to a lesser weapons charge and getting only two years in jail, with cops ultimately identifying one of the shooters in the case as Michael Odenyinma, as well as, shockingly, Treshawn Coates, that very same person who was charged for the Boozilla murder just the day before. Which means that if true, the person that killed Boozilla did it, got spun on by NBA, and still went back the very next day and shot up that same block again. But unfortunately, due to him being just age 17, there was never any public reporting on whether or not he was found guilty for these crimes or sentenced. The murder of Boozilla and days of deadly violence that followed truly rocked this Baton Rouge community as well as those connected to the victims. Many NBA members would get RIP Boo tattoos on their necks, and others would be seen toting guns at Boozilla's grave. Regular celebrations would be held called Boo Day on his birthday in his honor. And at the 2018 celebration of Boozilla's life, his mother would speak to a crowd, delivering some poignant words to a number of friends and family who had gathered in the area. It's just my favorite time to go. Yes, it hurts. 
But the good Lord called them home so he in a better place and if they ask him to come back here, he wouldn't much want to come back here. He just go wait on us to come up there so y'all gotta do good. So y'all can make it to heaven. He was like, we just for the Lord. I know a lot of you guys are doing a lot of stupid things and I ain't gonna tell y'all don't handle y'all business, but if they ain't coming at you, don't worry about it. But if they come at you, you handle your business. That's all I can tell you. But all I'm going to do is I'm going to pray for all of y'all. Pray y'all making home safe and pray for y'all every day. Because I don't want nobody to go through what I'm going through. Because this this really hurts. This like about to send me insane. Like some days I do good and some days I have my bad days. And today just a good day. But I don't want to see no matter, nobody mama going through what I'm going through. Nobody siblings, nobody family, nothing. Because that really hurts. They like when somebody do things like that, they change the person's whole life. You think you can hurt that person, you ain't hurting that person because they ain't meant for them to be here, they gonna leave here. So that person at peace. But that person's family is suffering. So all I want y'all to do is do good things, get y'all education, do be the best y'all can be, the sky's the limit, whatever y'all wanna do, y'all do. It's important to remember that no matter how many songs or social media posts glamorize the sliding that goes on between these gangs, behind this are grieving families, mothers and siblings. Who have to live with the consequences of these split-second decisions. And as she said, when somebody dies in the gang wars, that person who died is at peace. It's everyone else who was innocent to the original beef that has to live on with the grief of someone else's impulsive decisions. Sadly, it would take many years for Youngboy to realize the consequences of the violence playing out in his music and in his life. But for now, he would be stuck in the system waiting for a chance to plead his case in front of a judge. At the time of these charges, Youngboy was only 17 years old, but Louisiana is one of the few states in the US where 17-year-olds can be charged as adults. And so, Youngboy spent December 2016 to August 2017 incarcerated, waiting for updates on his case. But, at least for the fans, it wasn't all bad, because while Youngboy was locked up, his management team got to work and did their best to keep his music career alive. They created an updated version of his previous project, Before I Go, re-releasing it as Before I Go Reloaded, removing the songs Stuck With Me, Change, and All Night, and adding that 21 Savage remix of Murder, along with the track Bands and Fact. Then, on April the 14th, 2017, the label also released a reloaded version of his Mind of a Menace 3 mixtape, which removed the murder remix with 21 Savage, because they just put it on the Before I Go reloaded mixtape, as well as taking off the tracks Life and Booting in This, and adding the tracks Blowing Up and Just Made a Play featuring Moneybag Yo. So, while Youngboy was sitting in jail, all of these songs that were being released were picking up heat in the streets, and fans would eagerly await his release. And eventually, to some people's surprise, Youngboy was actually able to cut a pretty favorable deal with prosecutors, copping to the lesser charge of aggravated assault with a firearm. On August the 22nd, 2017, Youngboy was sentenced to a term of 10 years suspended prison time and three years of active supervised probation, which essentially meant that he was able to get out of jail and return to his music career. But the potential to have to go back and serve a full 10 years in prison would now follow him around for three years, along with a probation officer who would be closely supervising his every move going forward. In addition to that, he was also ordered to pay a fine of $5,000 and do 250 hours of supervised community service, which apparently even included doing an anti-violence PSA, which to the disappointment of fans everywhere, never seemed to actually surface publicly. But Youngboy wouldn't simply waltz out of the courtroom, because apparently during that sentence, he had what was described as a tense but respectful back and forth with District Judge Bonnie Jackson. Apparently during the case, she admonished him for going out with his boys looking for trouble and finding it. But Youngboy, to his credit, kept his cool during this exchange, taking full responsibility for everything that had gone down in the incident. Judge Jackson went on to say that she didn't care about Youngboy's celebrity status and suggested that his rap music wasn't helping the high rates of violence in the community that he was coming out of. The judge would tell him directly that the genre of music that he makes has a lot to do with the mindset that people have, suggesting that it normalized violence. Apparently, Youngboy actually interjected at this point, reminding the judge that nobody had actually died in the incident, with the judge clapping back, saying, Saying that he's lucky that he's such a bad aim and that he wasn't facing first-degree murder charges. It's also worth pointing out that the court did hear about how Youngboy had been trying to make a difference in his community by looking after his mother, buying her a home, and giving out school supplies to local children. The judge would then make a smearing and condescending remark about the fact that Youngboy had three kids at 17 years old. In response to that dig by the judge, Youngboy promised to do right by his family, and once Youngboy accepted his plea, he would be released from jail ahead of the actual sentencing, being welcome homed by hotshot rappers like Boosie and Young Dolph. Youngboy would be seen fresh home on social media, being- You see how, so how, how some woman really just spiteful, bro? Like, she see the youth doing good. She see him trying to get out. She see that uh, he got a chance, but, She's so hating on him that she gotta go and say, oh, you only 17 and got three kids already. 
That's like that one woman. I don't know if uh Chopro Chaplo Ross gonna mention it. But um Yo Gotti's daughter when uh Bro crazy bro y'all I don't know if y'all know about it. I'ma just say it real quick. Um what's his name bro? Floyd Mayweather when he was fighting Yo Gotti's son or whatever. Right? And then his sister, fian the yeah, the sister, whoever, she come out, she was like, Oh, Floyd Way Meadow, blah 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 and then just say like that she bring in young boy, call him an animal. He he have like nine kids, he's disgusting. I'm like, yo, how he even get in this, bro? I love his his response though. You gotta look it up. He said, Hey, I respect your daddy. But if you ever speak on me again, you gonna have to bomb me. I said, hey. Greeted by his NBA crew, rocking the same Burberry button-up shirt that he was booked for the crime in. Being greeted outside jail by Montana in a white Maybach. <laughs> yeah, that's what's up. Montana! Man, the best feeling ever. We got Katie right there, we got David. We got Matt Toy. Young boy was fresh home, and music would be the first thing on his mind. Mm -hmm. He would be seen filming freestyles in the same outfit and surrounded by his crew and manager, Big Dump. Call three and tell them. I don't want to chat in the studio with Shade, in the studio with Strange on the grind every day. I've been chasing that sack real third day, baby. I'm from the track. His first major release since his release would be the biggest song of his career so far, the track Untouchable. This was a big single where Youngboy spoke optimistically about making it out of the struggle of the Baton Rouge streets and vowing to make the most of this opportunity that he had to make it through music and declaring his intention to move out of Baton Rouge to Los Angeles where he would hope that he no longer needs to carry a gun. Untouchable ended up hitting number 95 on the Billboard charts becoming Youngboy's first solo single to chart in the United States. By August 2017, Youngboy was back in the studio, ready to focus on his music career, despite the prying eyes of a probation officer set to be following him for the coming years. So, following the successful release of Untouchable, Youngboy's team would drop his latest mixtape, AI Youngboy, on August the 4th, 2017, a project which would end up landing at the impressive number 24 on Billboard's 200 album chart. This also included another popular single, the track No Smoke, which surpassed Untouchable and ended up landing at number 61 on Billboard's Hot 100 singles chart. Youngboy was storming the charts and seemingly attracting the attention of both labels and other rappers. Funnily enough, on the song GG, Youngboy seemed to suggest that Chicago rapper Lil Durk and his collective had tried to sign him to his crew and record label, OTF, or Only The Family. But Youngboy would have bigger ideas than signing to another rapper. As only days after Youngboy's sentencing went public, it would then be announced that he had officially signed to Atlantic Records, in a huge five-album contract reportedly worth $2 million. And Youngboy would seemingly celebrate this deal by purchasing a tiger and telling fans that he got paid a big bag. I'm like, you, pay me. You, pay me. <laughs> I got that bag, I'm getting paid for everything I do. So, despite losing his cousin Boozilla and very nearly losing his freedom attempting to get revenge, in the end, Youngboy would escape a long prison sentence, returning to the music career that was buzzing before he went to jail and taking it to new heights, landing chart positions on Billboard and a multi-million dollar deal with a major record label. Things were on the up for the NBA crew, but despite the wins they were having in the industry, there would still be tension in the streets, as Youngboy had a whole host of enemies who would be dissing him while he was locked up and desperate to see him fall when he was released, with the NBA crew ultimately taking drastic action to protect their star prospect. Protect the money though. When Youngboy began picking up mm -hmm. steam as a rapper in Baton Rouge, naturally, he attracted a lot of opposition. After parting ways with former street crew turned label TBG, Top Boy Gorilla, he would find himself at war with their main artists, G Money and Fredo Bang. But they wouldn't be the only enemies that Youngboy would make in the city. In November 2015, Youngboy dropped a song called Homicide, a collaboration with another Baton Rouge rapper by the name of Scotty Kane. They would appear together on the song and in the music video, and apparently, Youngboy would become friends with Kane. 
but later they had a falling out, with some suggesting that Kane may have felt slighted by lyrics on his song So Long, where Youngboy rapped that he blew up in his city and that he was getting views even without the song with Scotty. This was followed by an IG live clip where Youngboy would rap lyrics saying that someone changed on him. Apparently at some point Scotty Kane caught Youngboy in a studio and slapped him, later taking to social media to explain his side of the story, saying that Youngboy had begged him for a verse and after asked him for money for shoots, and saying that he was trying to get close to Scotty Kane's crew because he had fallen out with TPG, with Kane even going as far as to tell Youngboy if he really has money then send a hit and kill him. I'm gonna address the situation like a man, your bitch ass roll my cousin. Yeah, I came to the studio, he begged me to do the first verse. I did not want to do it, I thought about it, I'm like, well, f it, I'm gonna go ahead and get a fair chance. I did the verse, your bitch ass asked me to put some on your shoes. You not with my label, bitch ass, f so f you. F I'm doing, what f I'm going to have with you on shoes and videos for? F it was over there riding TBG, TBG, they wanted to raw your Hold on, I'm gonna pause him right there. Cause I know people like that, bro. I know people like that, bro. And I'll do the same thing young boy did. If we go if we doing a music video together, son, and we gotta buy the props, me and you in the video, bro, it's our song. Of course we should go 50-50 on the props, bro. You tripping? Bro, fuck your label, bro. What? Yeah, bro, like I know people like that. I I one time I was, I, I had a clothes store, right? I just paused it a few months ago because, you know what I mean? I, I'm doing too many different things. But I had a clothes store and I had somebody who wanted to, two people who wanted to collab, right? One of them, she 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 did it. But, like, anyway, so the next person, dog, I'm like, all right, bro, it costs $30 a month to keep the store open. You want your clothing line on my store. If it costs me $30 a month to keep the store open, I did the numbers and I think you should contribute $8 a month. $8 a month to keep your clothing line on my store. Man was like, bro, nah, bro, I don't want to do that, bro. Like, bro, you charging me to put my clothes on your store. All type, and I'm just there like, bro, what, where, where is your common sense? If you want to go 50-50 on my store, it's not 50-50. I already got the store, bro. And even if, the least you could do is pay $8. That's less than a third of, of $30, bro. I got another person on board. She doing it. You feel me? I'm blessing y'all, bro. Y'all using my platform. Man's ain't want to go in on it. So this dude, he need to just shut the hell up, bro. Because people like that, they don't actually understand what it is to collaborate. And they really want free handouts. That's really it. They just want handouts. Is out. Now you ass come trying to rap my after music. Now you get on and do all this. You got bread, kill it. Drop your bread, man. What the Don't do all that. Hear me. Come see me. Living like that. Because you know me. I'm living like that all day, every day. You know how I'm coming. In response to this deadly threat from Kane, Youngboy would reply to this by rapping more lyrics from the song Gravity and showing that he had goons behind him ready to shoot. Yeah, yeah, and I don't hold nobody but my mama boy. And my they was the one super behind me, boy. Remember, I ain't had nothing to eat, I go still for it. Show you my bank account, I swear I got six figures, Lord. You know I mean? They hate me, probably don't snake me for it. Then under the skies, living under the board. I ain't even they weren't made for it. Lord, please don't mistake me, play them die, cause I ain't going for it. In this life that I'm living, I pray I make it through the night. Cause I ride through my city, I'm thinking, looking at the lights. Youngboy would appear to address the incident on the song Who You Supposed to Be, admitting that he was sent an address where he pulled up and where he was confronted by three people, and seemingly admitting to crying when they pulled out guns on him, but still mocking them for not using the guns, and ending the track seemingly threatening to kill Scotty Kane. Later on, Pablo El Chapo, who had apparently intervened in this incident where guns had been pulled on Youngboy in a studio, posted a clip to social media seemingly confirming that Youngboy cried and suggesting that he had saved his life. But I do know, little Youngboy, when you pull them rods on your ass, you was crying in that motherfucking studio. I saved your Fucking like, I told my younger man, leave that slide, bro. That crying, man. Crying in front of his manager, man. Slide, he ain't about that gang shit. Y'all asked him to fight, the he didn't want to fight. Then when he brought up the gun, we could do it with the guns. 
two or three guns in your face, you was crying. Dad's boy, Chapo say. Kane would actually respond to Young Boy in a diss track of his own. Only I feel like crying in the face of death is not a problem because I know real, I know real hitters, bro, who who will cry, bro. But they'll still hit you. They will hit you crying, bro. I'm one of them, bro. I'll be shedding tears and I'll hit you, bro. Like, if it gotta get there, it gonna get there. I ain't gonna die today, but I might shed a tear because this moment, this moment is so serious. You know what I mean? The energy in this moment is so emotionally taxing. I might shed a tear. But that don't mean I ain't gonna hit you while crying, bro. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm making it home. I'm making it home. Tears on my face. I'm still making it home. Days after his cousin Boozilla was gunned down, Scotty Kane would drop the young boy diss track NBA Smoke, produced by prolific TBG producer Austin on the track. On this track, Kane would return young boy's death threats with threats of his own, as well as saying that somebody killed Boozilla and he didn't do anything about it. Kind of an ironic lyric, considering that a month after this song dropped, young boy would indeed be charged with double attempted murder, attempting to do something about Boozilla. Right. But while he young boy was in jail do for doing exactly that, Scotty would drop a video on Instagram, seemingly distancing himself from this beef. Hey, Look, man, I'm, I'm on the road to success, man. I ain't with none of that. Y'all can have it. I ain't with that bitch. I ain't trying to kill none of you. I ain't trying to do none of that with none of you, man. Y'all can have it. When I got kids, I got so much going on good for me, dog. Like, it's a lot happening right now. I ain't with no cop and deuces and nothing. I just ain't with it. Like, I ain't having this, dog. Like, too many people that's depending on me, too many people that care about me. I don't need to be doing all this dumb like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do this for my kids and my family and everybody else that love me, dog. Like, all y'all can have it, man. Y'all want it, y'all can have it. And he would go on to say in an interview with Gutter TV that he regretted dropping his death threatening young boy diss, NBA Smoke. Like, I regret, I ain't gonna lie, even though NBA Smoke did so many views, I regret it. You feel me? Like, I'm gonna honestly say that. Like, I didn't wanna do that, you know what I'm saying? But, so, you know, it's certain shit that you gotta. I, I feel like that was my flaw, that song, you feel me? So, y'all is saying that that raw and all that did try to do this and that. I don't even like the song, tell the truth. I, I hate that. I don't care how many views they got on it, you feel me? However, the beef would be reignited when Youngboy returned home from jail. Scotty Kane would post a clip to social media showcasing a long set of both bankrolls and fingernails and saying, Get your cash, you don't get any money. <laughs> and fingernails. <laughs> This would attract a response from OG3, who posted a picture of Youngboy with money and a caption saying what Kane was holding ain't half of what Youngboy's holding. This would apparently prompt a response from Kane where he said that OG3 was holding his big dog's money. Now, I couldn't actually find that post, but Youngboy seemingly responded from the back of his Maybach, even dragging his manager Fee Banks into the situation. I don't know what the wrong thing. Boy, listen to my music, be on my got a free young boy it is. Say feet. Man, you better tell him I ain't got no big dogs, man. Everything in my packet for me. Wrong deal, man. Tripping boy, get off my you know what it is. Apparently, a few months later, Scotty got his chain taken, and young boy would clown him online immediately after the thieves exposed that they had taken his chain. Jeez. Boy, I damn gonna take anything off my neck. However, something else would also happen during this beef that would appear to be much more sinister. A prominent producer for TBG, Austin on the track, who had made numerous beats for songs made by Youngboy's biggest rival, G Money, and Scotty Kane himself, as well as landing credits for Chicago rappers like G Herbo. Austin on the track was quite literally the person who made the beat for Scotty Kane's NBA Youngboy diss track, NBA Smoke. Well, at around 7 p.m. on the 10th of August 2017, TBG affiliated producer, Austin on the track, real name, Austin Rashad Norwood, was sitting in a car with another person outside the Ardenwood Village apartment complex on North Ardenwood Drive. At this point, somebody turned up and sprayed the car with bullets, after which the suspected shooter fled the scene in a car before crashing and escaping on foot. This would leave the passenger injured and Austin himself dead at the scene. This was a brutal assassination, with investigators being seen examining the bullet-riddled scene. But in a chilling turn of events, the body of Austin would even be left in place in the driver's seat of the car, which was towed away from the murder scene, with detectives claiming that the entire car with the body inside it had become a crime scene and would need to be moved with the body to a controlled environment so that they could process all of the DNA evidence. Police would ultimately describe the murder as a suspected robbery, with cops claiming that Austin and his cousin had gone to an address to sell a cell phone 
that they had advertised online, a situation described on the news as a setup. A man is shot and killed while trying to sell a phone on North Ardenwood Drive last night. Two men shot after police say they were lured to the Ardenwood Village apartments in hopes That's of selling crazy, a cell bro. phone to someone they met online. At some point, that transaction taking a dark turn. While there, the individuals attempted to rob them, shot into the vehicle, striking both victims. With the victims left for dead inside the car, the suspected shooter allegedly took off. Sergeant LJ McNeely says for now, it's unclear if whoever pulled the trigger acted alone. We're just uh, keeping it open ended and not going to dictate it if it's one, uh, two or three, four different suspects. But as the investigation continues, uh, we'll determine all the individuals that was involved. Now, as far as I was able to find out, this murder was never solved. And once again, let me make it very clear, there's nothing connecting Youngboy or the NBA crew to this crime, but it's certainly yet another case of somebody involved closely in the rap scene in Baton Rouge, in this case, the producer of prominent Youngboy diss tracks who seemingly wound up losing his life in a brutal gangland style slaying with the police none the wiser as to who was responsible. A month after this brutal murder, in September, it was believed that Scotty Kane and Youngboy would finally squash their beef, after Scotty Kane posted a picture of them together on a FaceTime call, along with a caption suggesting that they were on positive terms and both focused on earning money and success rather than beef. Though it would seem that the NBA crew would eventually have the last laugh, as many years later, Scotty Kane would get a taste of his own medicine. He himself ultimately wound up getting jumped on camera in a studio, just like Youngboy did. And OG3 would later even be seen on social media with the person who had allegedly jumped Kane. Fortunately for Youngboy, the Scotty Kane beef would be resolved without anyone losing their life. Sadly, however, not everyone would be so lucky. The most prominent beef that Youngboy was involved in during his rise to fame was with G-Money. Real name Garrett Burton, he was a former friend and a star over at Youngboy's former label, TBG. Youngboy's other biggest opposition, Scotty Kane, would release the scathing Youngboy diss track, NBA Smoke, just days after Youngboy's cousin Boozilla got killed. And while Youngboy ended up in jail on attempted murder charges for attempting to avenge Boozilla, G-Money was linking up with Youngboy's ops and building alliances to diss him. In January 2017, G-Money linked up with Pablo El Chapo, one of the people who'd been in the studio when Scotty Kane allegedly stuck up Youngboy with a gun and made him cry. They would collaborate on a new Youngboy diss titled WNBA Smoke, where they referred to him as WNBA Youngboy and dissed him extensively. G-Money would rap saying that he will send a blitz to take out Youngboy and his team for dissing him, as well as warning Youngboy that he will kill him for beefing with them. G-Money also appeared on Scotty Kane's song Ain't Gone Ride, where G-Money rapped how he heard someone dissing him, but he can't kill them because they keep posting on Instagram. When Youngboy got out of jail, he dropped his AI Youngboy mixtape, and that included numerous lyrics seemingly responding to G-Money, like the track Ride On Em, where Youngboy seemed to say outright that he's not squashing the beef and that he just talked to the devil as well as saying that the only way the beef is going to end is if G-Money gets shot. And he would go on to rap that he's dropping a bag on him and his crew, and that they're going to ride on him and smash him. Youngboy was seemingly letting the whole world know that he was planning to pay to have G-Money killed. And throughout the verses, he would make bold claims saying that he's going to get it by any means and that the beef is never getting squashed. He would claim that his rising fame had his rivals mad and saying that somebody is gonna get their head bust for making a diss song about him. Youngboy would also claim to be the reason that their friend got killed, going on to rap that somebody shot up his grandmother's house with a 22, but his shooters got back and sent the ops a special delivery from Youngboy. Now it's unclear exactly who Youngboy is talking about having had killed here, but it could have something to do with a rumor that members from a TBG affiliated crew called TMH, or Too Many Hitters, shot up Youngboy's grandmother's house, with TMH32 later denying having shot up Youngboy's grandmother's house in his song FAN. Anyway, clearly G-Money wasn't scared of Youngboy's counter threats, so he would decide to turn the disrespect up to a whole new level. On August the 15th, 2017, a sensational interview emerged where G-Money seemed to be talking extremely recklessly about Youngboy, suggesting that they used to be homies, but pointing the finger at Youngboy, saying that he started sneak dissing him once he became successful. So, I mean, do y'all have history? Were y'all ever cool, you know, prior, years prior? Yeah, that little like my little partner, he used to be like my little brother. He stayed with me and everything. Everything was still all good until he started, you know what I'm saying, like doing his own thing, getting him a little buzz, getting a little money, and he just, got the big head and just started feeling like in it like the feelings he been feeling probably deep down the side that he was scared to put out he let that out once he got a got a name and got you know got from down here and then g money dropped maximum shade by being very disrespectful about young boy's sister and saying that he'd slept with her he meant about his sister too though about his sister yeah i had a long time ago 
Right, so, oh, okay, okay. Hmm. Initially, G Money and Youngboy hmm. would go back and forth on Instagram, with G Money making a post suggesting that he's not jealous of Youngboy because he's already rich and living where the white folks live. I'm like I'm already rich and I ain't even rich yet. And I'm living with the white folks. Wrong with these niggas. You don't impress me, man. You hear me? I'm no real money, man. Don't impress me, man. You hear me? You know what I'm saying? Copycat. You the next you see me do, you wanna do, but you supposed to be up though. Youngboy would reply with his own story, asking G Money why he doesn't like him, and saying that he doesn't like G Money and he's down to beef. You saying, nigga, what you don't, what you don't like me or something like that around me? What you don't, I'm saying, like, what you, what you got something against me? Say that damn man, I'm, don't, don't, don't be on Instagram that put in two different states. You know the real. Stop playing. <laughs> what you say? Huh? I'm about beef, man. What the real? You hear me? You know what the you is? G Money would reply, saying <laughs> F young boy, and he doesn't care if he doesn't like him, going on to accuse him of copying his style by posting pictures with a Mercedes G Wagon. <laughs> Then, a few days later, G Money would officially go at Youngboy on wax with the scathing diss track, Industry. G Money's diss song, Industry, called out Youngboy and the whole NBA crew on a number of bases. It had those lyrics that seemed to hint that Youngboy had been the one who tipped off G Money about his cousin Boozilla running off with drugs, and it had more lines seemingly confirming that he had hooked up with Youngboy's sister, putting maximum disrespect on him. He also dissed Youngboy for sneak dissing him, and as the title of the song suggested, it dropped shade on Youngboy for signing a record deal and no longer being in the street with G Money suggesting that after signing this deal, Youngboy had turned industry. The song also had another important lyric that seemed to confirm rumours that G Money had actually had a price put on his head. G Money even mentions Youngboy's mother, saying he can't kill him because he's Sharonda's son, indicating that G Money knows Youngboy's mother well. He also called out 3-3 and Montana from NBA, saying that they don't want beef with him. G Money also brushed off Youngboy's earlier suggestion that he could pay to have him killed, saying that he will kill anyone who tries them, ultimately declaring Baton Rouge his city. The music video for Industry also included a Chucky doll, which was actually a reference to an early Youngboy video called What I Was Taught that dropped way back in September 2016. But G Money wasn't done there. The following month, he would continue to diss Youngboy, dropping yet another diss song, this time in a remix to Bodak Yellow, calling Youngboy a fake and warning him not to mess with TBG, as well as saying that Youngboy is hating on G over a woman and that he used to be TBG but switched up on the crew. G would also shade Youngboy for signing to a label, saying that by contrast, he got to where he was without a deal, as well as warning that he would be sending shooters to Youngboy's home. He would reference the NBA crew, saying that he thinks he's Steph Curry, referring to a player in the actual NBA known for his accurate shooting, and G would end the song saying that somebody tried to kill him but failed and got killed in return. It would seem for a while that Youngboy just wasn't responding, but G Money would continue to go at Youngboy and the NBA crew any chance he got. In a September Instagram live session, he would continue throwing shade at Youngboy, mentioning that a Baton Rouge rapper got hot and left everyone behind, and saying that Youngboy is scared of him and his gang. These rappers in Baton Rouge be hating in the way, you hear me? These don't be sticking together down here. So what the fuck I look like getting the you. When you hide or do this and do that and do that, you ain't sticking with a with a fuck you. All these down here bitches, man. You hear me? Most of these head of a man. You see a put your head down, nigga. And I can be by myself and you can be with a thousand man. Yeah, for real. Yeah. If you ain't with us, you can't hang with my gang. And that's on guard. Ain't ain't no banging with the gang. I ain't tripping on no this and on no on none of that, you hear me? It's all good. But just remember, it was there for now. I ain't, ain't never do no fake hating that like that. G Money would go on to diss Youngboy's whole family and say that he's TBG until he dies. Like on everything I love, man. You, your mama, your brother, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, whoever. Yeah, TBG can really gang. TBG till I die. G would also claim to be respected on Youngboy's native Chippewa Street, saying that he pulled up with his gun and that people had tried to protect Youngboy. I, I, I ran on Chippewa, man. Yeah, I respect it out there. You know what I'm saying? I pulled up, I pulled up out there with a third eight when it 
the whole chopper trying to save a but I ain't gonna speak on it. You hear me? Way throwback, you hear me? 13, you know. 14, 15, 16. You know, throwback. Damn, man, who got a problem with young around here? Now, young on the other side. Ain't crazy. He would also diss young boy's team, saying that everybody in TBG is a boss. How you be all how he a boss and he got a CEO and all that shit? Yeah, you hear me? You know, that bullshit. They got to run them. Don't nobody run nobody over here. Everybody bosses. Yeah, nothing but bosses over here. Be looking at niggas because they got money, man. Y'all think real? Make no real, man. G Money would even claim that Young Boy got robbed and stripped and didn't retaliate, with his goons saying Young Boy won't survive a beef with him. Thank you, and you ain't do nothing about it. Hey, boy, strip. You strip and you ain't do I'm nothing about it. So how you think you could? And so how you think you could tell me something? How you think you can go against me? How you think you can do that? You won't survive. Come on. Clearly, this was a very personal beef aimed at Young Boy and his crew. And at this point, both sides have made outright threats, declaring their intentions to kill their opposition. Now, it's been speculated that Young Boy's manager, Big Dump, might have had something to do with potentially putting a price on G Money's head. And in September, G Money would seemingly be posting disses to Young Boy on social media, all while giving clues as to his own exact location. In one video, G Money, standing outside, would claim that Young Boy started rapping and became a killer after he got a record deal. Say, Leon, you know you ain't living like that, man. You get a deal and you done turn to a killer. When you start doing all that, man, you know you ain't cut like that, man. You know TBG been your muscle, boy. And the same you talking about usually, usually don't live in, in jail, wherever they at, man. That's the same thing you ought to move on the city, man. Yeah, you remember Will? Yeah, Will's out there. And yeah, you remember you ran out that store, man. You know what's happening with us, man. You hear me, real? And I'm living out shit, you hear me? Everything you got with a deal, I got without a deal, man. You hear me? You know, 30 plus on my with no deal. Yeah, for real. Driving a hundred thousand dollar coupe, man. Yeah, with no deal, boy. You better stop playing and stay in your place, son. If you watch that clip carefully, you can see a window with white bars and black shutters beside it, with the building itself having red brickwork and a black security door. In this clip, G Money is standing in front of a recording studio at the 1900 block of Dallas Drive that TBG were known to record at. This studio was also featured prominently in the music video for G Money and Boulevard Quick's song Set Trippin'. That's so why you get caught, gang. The, and this studio the is the exact landmarks. location where G Money would unfortunately lose his life. On the 10th of September 2017, G Money would be seen on Instagram at his usual recording studio working on music, seemingly recording a young boy diss song with lyrics where he says that your favorite rapper is a liar. At around 1.30 a.m., G Money would be found shot in front of that very recording studio that he recently went live at. Fat Chapo, who was with him at the time of the shooting, said that G Money was caught off guard by a shooter as he walked out of the studio. I was the first out the door. I'm the one called for help. G walked out that door by itself. I, mean, I told him before he walked out the door, like, he walked out the door on his own. And they start shooting. When they start shooting, I really didn't know what was going on because I really, I heard a, a boom, but the music was playing, so you really, it was kind of muffled. When I first, as soon as the shooting stopped, I ran out the door. Nobody was still, I still never saw nobody. And I saw G. Laying right there on the ground. And I really ain't, once I seen him, all I could do is call 911. You know, try to get help. Once police arrived, officers would be seen in the dark, taping off the scene and doing forensic work. And G Money would end up leaving the scene in a coroner's van, just like the one that he had showed in his music video industry, where he said that he would put his ops on the news. That's and the following crazy, morning, the news bro. would indeed report on this tragic killing. Baton Rouge police are looking into a deadly shooting that claimed the life of a local rapper. Police say someone shot and killed 22-year-old Garrett Burton on Dallas Street around 1.20 last night. Burton performed under the name G Money. Right now, police have not named any suspects or motive. 
If you can help police or have any tips, you can report them anonymously to Crime Stoppers. One of G-Money's closest friends and fellow TBG-affiliated rapper Fredo Bang, in a DJ Small Eyes interview, would recount breaking down in jail when he heard the news of G's death. I just, I just broke down in tears. Uh, like I, that's the wrong like, yeah. You know how baby cried, and, um, you know how baby cried just yeah. I, I really just, I, I just sat there locked up. Scotty Kane would also react to G-Money's death even telling followers that he was getting DMs, telling him that he would be killed next. Man, I wake up just every day, my mother probably got killed in the What the oh, like that, son? Then it's sad to say, man, I'm out not even 25 yet. Like, come on, man, like, it ain't this serious, son. Before I let you take me, dog, I'm slinging this whoever, whatever, and I don't care who love who, I'm going my move. I'm a DM talking about I'm next and all that. Man, I ain't worried about none of that. I ain't, I ain't worried about none of that. Oh, man. When it's my time, it's my time regardless, but I ain't worried about none of that. Better stop playing with Kill y'all. Said I do not play about my life at all. I'm going to step. Yeah. I don't give You know, yeah, I'm going to die about it for real, you know. The day after G Money was killed, it seemed that fans would attend the scene of the murder, filming the location and peculiarly finding a pillow on the ground. The presence of a bloody pillow at the murder scene would end up going viral, sparking a conspiracy theory that G Money's killers threw a pillow on him after the assassination and told him to go to sleep. With these rumors being further fueled by Youngboy lyrics that came out later, like the song Step On where he says, Lay your bed, I throw the pillow, police are after all of my people. And even in his recent single Bitch Let's Do It, where he rapped that his crew will creep up on their ops and lay their heads on a pillow. With Youngboy even doing an impression of a dying G Money laying on a pillow in the music video. However, for the record, this is just a conspiracy theory. <laughs> and some of the more sensible Youngboy fans would work out that this pillow was actually used by emergency medical staff that had attended the scene. But setting aside those rumors, once this went down, all eyes were on the NBA crew, but it would take years before the authorities were able to identify any of the people involved. DeAndre Fields, aka Lil Pap, or NBA Pap, actually the brother of NBA Ben 10, aka Ben Fields, who also got arrested for being in the car with Youngboy in that same incident after Boozilla's death where Youngboy ended up getting the 10-year suspended sentence for. Now, Pap was eventually arrested on second-degree murder charges in connection with the murder of G-Money, ultimately being bailed around June 2019. A lot of you are reacting tonight to the arrest of this man, DeAndre Fields, Vatner's police, say they arrested him years after the shooting death of a local rapper, Garrett Burton. Back in 2017, Burton went by the name of G Money. He was found shot to death in the parking lot on Dallas Drive there. Police arrested DeAndre Fields for second degree murder. And initially, Pap would plead not guilty, but some interesting information would eventually be revealed to the police when they interviewed him after the shooting. He actually told police that he had left Baton Rouge with his mother and son, fleeing to nearby New Roads about 40 minutes away from Baton Rouge after G Money was murdered. As well as this, when asked about his whereabouts on the night of September the 10th, 2017, Lil Pap claimed that he drove to Hammond to get gas. When detectives later obtained his phone records, this claim was proven to be false, as his records revealed that he was actually in Baton Rouge on the night of G Money's death. But perhaps the most shocking piece of information that Lil Pap shared with the police, which I can imagine was a huge driving force behind his indictment, is the following. After police asked Pap who among his friends would shoot people for the NBA group, he replied, to be honest, me. Now, it's worth adding that in Youngboy's very first album, Life Before Fame, all the way back in 2015, he basically admits that he can call on Pap to carry out what needs to be carried out in the streets on two occasions. Firstly, in the song NBA, and second... See, I was gonna say, well, at least he's taking the fall for himself, but no, he's not, because he's inadvertently admitting that it is a gang that does hits. ...in the song I Know. Ultimately, Pap would end up pleading out on greatly reduced charges of accessory after the fact of murder and ultimately receiving a sentence of five years. Now, interestingly, Pap would go back and forth with the judge during his sentencing, saying that he is taking the deal, but he is 100% innocent. And interestingly, close friend of G Money, TBG rapper Fredo Bang, would later claim in numerous interviews that he did not believe Pap to be G's killer either. Let be wrong. A man that do that. Brown. Do you know the guy that's being charged? You said that you didn't think the guy that they're charging with the murder actually did it. G Money's own mother would also post on social media saying they still haven't found the shooter of her son and they're still looking. Whether or not you believe NBA Pap when he says that he had nothing to do with the incident, what is clear 
is that the NBA crew, and Youngboy specifically, would have the most to gain from G Money being no longer. And going forward, Youngboy and other NBA members would reference what happened to G Money in numerous songs and videos. The month after G Money's murder, Youngboy dropped his 10th project, Ain't Too Long, on October the 7th, 2017. This included a number of references to the G Money situation. Firstly, in the murder anthem Red Rum, where Youngboy claims that he just raised the murder rate in his city. And then, in the song Poor One, Youngboy seems to be talking directly to G Money throughout the song, alluding to the time when they had a friendship that was like a brotherhood before G Money betrayed Youngboy's trust by sleeping with his sister and boasting about it online. In the same song, and in the same monologue directed at G Money, Youngboy reveals that G Money introduced him to them boys who he didn't like for nothing. Them boys most likely being a reference to TPG. Before paying homage to his own fallen friends Boozilla and Lil Dave, Youngboy would seemingly suggest that G Money had blamed him for drugs that went missing, which caused the tension between Youngboy and his cousin Boozilla. In another song on the project titled War With Us, Youngboy talks about the sorry state of affairs in Baton Rouge, saying that one particular week he saw seven murders and that there is no helping his city. This was a bold lyric that painted a picture of a city completely out of control. The war in the Baton Rouge rap scene had gotten deadly, and now one of the most promising artists in that city was in the grave, with Youngboy, free of his main competition, going on to dominate the scene, releasing song after song and mixtape after mixtape, telling heartfelt tales of his first-hand experiences surviving in the trenches of Baton Rouge. But the biggest question remained. Was Youngboy just a rapper making music about the violent war taking place in his city, or was he really the murder man, running his rap career like a gang kingpin, and using his NBA crew as muscle to stop anyone who dared to get in their way? Youngboy's run from 2015 to the end of 2017 was one of a kind. He dropped eight solo mixtapes and one joint one with Moneybag Yo, giving fans more music in his formative years than some artists deliver in their entire careers. And this generosity with his art was rewarded by a cult following of loyal fans who fell in love with the music and would always show up for him from here on out. Three songs on the Billboard Hot 100 and three projects on Billboard's 200 albums charts. Youngboy was flourishing in the music industry since signing his Monster 5 album $2 million deal with Atlantic. But Youngboy was making murder music all about violence and killing. And before we go any further, I just want to address something. In Youngboy's songs from 2017 and in numerous tracks that came later in his career, he seemingly claims to have seven bodies. And despite being considered a mainstream artist making music for respected record labels, the content of his music and his own statements in these songs has led to intense speculation over whether or not Youngboy has in fact personally killed anyone, or more specifically, more than seven people, as he claims in many of his songs, with many wondering exactly who these people he claimed to have killed might have been. This is not dissimilar to all of the speculation that has surrounded Chicago drill rapper King Von, who was rumored to have killed at least seven people, with his name being connected to as many as 11 murders, with an endless collection of tweets and lyrics which saw King Von himself seemingly confessing to playing a role in these specific murders. I personally believe that King Von did indeed kill at least seven people, and I covered this extensively in my recent video, King Von, Rap's First Serial Killer. But when it comes to Youngboy, it's much harder to say. After the alleged killer of G-Money was revealed to have been an affiliate of the NBA crew, many people thought Youngboy had directly paid for this hit. Youngboy has released lyrics before and after G Money's death, suggesting that he was willing to engage in murder for hire, like the track Ride On Him, and years later on his richest op album, rapping on the song Dirty Thug, that he just has to pay the fee for his shooters to leave people dead in the street. Also on the track Bitch Let's Do It, where Youngboy claimed that his gang would creep up and put his op's heads on pillows. He would also rap that he used his dollars to send hits through the city, and that when this worked, he went on to go crazy with bodies. Also on the track Slimes Go Where I Go, Youngboy opens his verse confessing that he believes he could get 100 years in jail for the murders he's been involved in. As his career has gone on, more and more fans have theorized as to whether or not Youngboy has killed or whether he has at least had people killed. There's even a fan theory that Youngboy has a child for every person he kills, a theory partly supported by lyrics on a leaked song that didn't end up on the album top but was circulating in the days leading up to its release, a song apparently titled Soul Stealer, where Youngboy raps that he has guns with bodies on them and that he's part of a group that he had to kill to join even ending the song saying that he's seven up, but he needs three more, and saying that he needs 10 bodies, 10 hats, and 10 mama baby souls. Which if you consider the fact that he apparently has 10 or 11 kids at this point, could very well hold water. However, some of the conspiracy theories on exactly who Youngboy may be referring to when he says he has over seven bodies do seem like a bit of a stretch. The first person Youngboy is rumored to have killed or had killed 
was one of the killers of Youngboy's childhood friend Lil Dave, with this speculation being based off a single Youngboy lyric where he appeared to suggest that he paid for vengeance for Dave after he begun making large sums of money. Years later, on the track F The Industry Part 2 on his album Richest Op, Youngboy would drop a lyric seemingly confessing to having had to kill somebody at age 16, but it's unclear who this may have been. But on the same song, Youngboy would also drop a menacing lyric saying that he witnessed somebody beating his mother as a child and that he killed them when he grew up. Whether or not you believe that Youngboy would be capable of killing somebody, you can't deny the fact that after his cousin Boozilla got killed, he caught a double attempted murder charge whilst personally trying to avenge his cousin. However, as the judge acknowledged, nobody actually did die in this case. G Money, however, was less lucky, being gunned down after trading public death threats with Youngboy. And while the actual shooters of G Money were never found, the conviction of a prominent NBA member on accessory charges firmly pointed the finger at the NBA camp. The next alleged killing is a rumour that's heavily debated amongst Youngboy fans. An unreleased Youngboy song called Money Man has been circulating on YouTube, Reddit, and SoundCloud for a number of years. The song isn't listed on lyric breakdown sites like Genius.com, but the track itself does include some outrageous lyrics that have gone viral numerous times on Reddit, particularly lyrics that seem to suggest that Youngboy killed a rival gang member's girlfriend in retaliation for his grandmother's house being shot up. This all relates to a feud with another set of Baton Rouge street hitters called TMH, or Too Many Hitters. The story goes that somebody from TMH shot up Youngboy's grandmother's house. However, TMH32 would later deny this shooting in lyrics on his song FAN. But according to lyrics from Youngboy's song Money Man, another person from TMH by the name of Hammer was actually targeted in a shooting, which unfortunately ended up claiming the life of his girlfriend. Now, while this is just a lyric and an unreleased freestyle, Youngboy fans on Reddit have desperately tried to solve this crime, with one theory suggesting that the victim was a 19-year-old woman by the name of Ernesia Barnes. The news would go on to report on the shooting, suggesting that she was a passenger in a car hit by accident whilst the shooting targeted the driver. We also have now learned the identity and the name of that 19-year-old woman. Police tell us that it was about 10.15 last night when an unknown suspect in a red Chevy Trailblazer fired several shots into a car with 19-year-old Arnisha Barnes sitting in the passenger seat. It happened near Gus Young and 48th Street. We're told that Barnes was actually taken to a local hospital where she later died. Barnes died of a gunshot wound to the stomach after police say a suspect traveling in a red Chevy Trailblazer fired into the car she was a passenger in. Several sources said two other people were in the car at the time. It is believed that one of them, Arnisha's best friend, was the intended target. No one would ever think uh suspect or imagine something like that happening to them, you know, they child, you know. However, despite fan theories that Youngboy was in fact responsible for this tragic murder, later on, two completely unrelated people would be taken into custody for this shooting, with it being claimed that the shootout stemmed from an argument and that the shooter was targeting the driver of the vehicle Barnes was in. Donnie Spencer was charged with first-degree murder for the shooting, despite publicly claiming to be innocent, and Ashley Taylor was charged with attempted second-degree murder and illegal use of a weapon, for apparently shooting at a woman in the same spot just minutes before this fatal drive-by, with cops claiming that the two shootings were connected and that both shootings stemmed from an ongoing argument. Scotty Hunter tonight with the key thing, the key thing that helped police make a very quick arrest. The man accused of carrying out this year's record-breaking murder in Baton Rouge, 27-year-old Donnie Spencer, is behind bars tonight. As he was loaded off to prison, he had nothing to say except one thing. Innocent. Spencer is charged with first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder after allegedly gunning down 19-year-old mother Ernisha Barnes last Thursday in a drive-by shooting on Gus Young at 48. His information put out on Friday, roughly 72 hours later, he was picked up today by the U.S. Marshals Task Force. Now, the rumor that Youngboy was involved in this murder has been widely considered to have been debunked, as Donnie Spencer would eventually be sentenced to 22 years for this murder. However, that hasn't stopped rabid Youngboy fans from continuing to spread the rumor that the person who took the charge was actually just doing it on behalf of Youngboy to take the fall, since he'd maintained his innocence during proceedings. And this rumor has been kept alive by yet more ambiguous Youngboy lyrics that seem to mention a woman being killed in the crossfire. Youngboy seemed to mention a similar situation in an unreleased song called Stay In Your Lane, rapping about how she got killed outside a corner store, seemingly a reference to the location of the killing of Barnes. And later, Youngboy rapped in the song Murder Man, thought it was him, it was his bitch. Let me tell you how that go, I'm the murder man. And even more recently on his 2023 album Richest Op, where he rapped on the song I Heard that someone got swerved on with his girl, she got hit, 
and all he heard was her last breath. Now, despite the fact that this particular murder has been solved with a suspect who was sentenced for the murder, fans would continue to be desperate to try and link Youngboy to specific murders going forward, and Youngboy himself would appear to be happy to contribute to these conspiracies. Throughout his career, he's continued to make supposed murder anthems. Murder songs are essentially a subgenre of Youngboy songs, primarily where he raps all about these supposed murders and assassinations that he may or may not be responsible for, and repeatedly referring to himself in these songs as a grave digger or the murder man, and claiming to be doing his murder man dance to these songs, with Youngboy fans even rabidly creating playlists of what they feel are his best murder songs, and ranking which murder anthem is the best for spinning on ops, with it generally being considered that Youngboy's top murder anthem is Dead Trolls, the track which appeared to foreshadow King Von's death, a song where Youngboy actually raps, seven murders in my hometown tell them I did that. Naturally, with all of this violent content in the music, and even more real-life violence playing out on the streets of Baton Rouge, it's perhaps not surprising that big corporate entities would be scared to be associated with Youngboy, the self-proclaimed murder man. But despite Atlantic Records being willing to put their public support behind Youngboy in the form of a multi-million dollar record deal, others would be desperate to distance themselves from the violent content of his music. And it's worth noting that a little while after signing his record deal in 2017, Youngboy quietly changed his official name from NVA Youngboy to Youngboy Never Broke Again. Apparently this was a tactical maneuver carried out to avoid a potentially costly and damaging copyright dispute with the real NBA, the National Basketball Association. The initials NBA are trademarked and intellectual property of the National Basketball Association. And ironically, had Youngboy kept using NBA in his name, he very well could have ended up getting sued and ended up very much broke again, with the National Basketball Association generally being a bit more of a family-friendly business that likely don't want to be associated with the sort of street activity that young boys NBA are into. Unless your name's Ja Morant, of course, but we'll get into that later. Anyway, after resolving his name change and avoiding a potentially costly legal dispute with the other NBA, and after the murder of his biggest rival in the Baton Rouge rap scene, G-Money, Youngboy, with the support of his label, would launch into a huge promotional campaign for his next project, setting the stage for Youngboy to have a meteoric 2018, which saw him break into the mainstream music conversation. In January 2018, he released his big commercial single, Outside Today. The song itself was interesting thematically, and perhaps foreshadows Youngboy's constant subjugation to house arrest. Only in this song, he says that he's staying inside to avoid the paparazzi and all the attention that has come from his newfound fame. The song wasn't short of gangster content either. Elsewhere, in the hook, he rapped that he would still do a drive-by in his Rolls Royce Wraith. Youngboy goes on to make a pretty bold and shocking claim, stating that if you want to join NBA, you need to have caught a body, along with other lyrics where he claims to jump out and shoot at people's houses, describing the exact scenario where he caught two attempted murder charges after the murder of Boozilla. He follows that up with a lyric claiming to always be telling the truth and never capping in his lyrics, a bold claim which is followed up by another ominous lyric where he claims to shoot his ops and their women. Another lyric which is eerily similar to the rumoured shooting of an innocent woman that we discussed earlier on. Now, the music video for the song makes a big statement about where Youngboy's life was at at this point in his career. In the music video, Youngboy's girlfriend at the time, Jania, can be seen trying to avoid a group of paparazzi asking questions as she enters his home. Youngboy would rap his verses for this song in an opulent mansion, along with a cameo from Louisiana's number one stunner himself, Birdman, the legendary New Orleans record exec and rapper of Cash Money fame. The red-themed video, along with the presence of Birdman, one of hip-hop's most famous Blood Gang members, appeared to be a subtle hint at Youngboy's ongoing connections to the Blood Gang, as can also be heard in their 2018 collaboration, We Poppin'. And Youngboy and Birdman would maintain a close relationship going forward, and they would even eventually create a joint mixtape together with a strong Louisiana theme titled From the Bayou. Birdman would also be one of the very first people in the industry to see Youngboy's full potential, predicting in a 2018 interview just days before Outside Today released, that Youngboy would be the biggest young superstar that the rap game had ever heard of. I think he's the next biggest young superstar the game they never had. Talent-wise, he's the most, he's an animal, he's a monster. I had the pleasure of being around him and see how he work, watch how he work. I think he's gonna be the next biggest superstar in the world. As the young, as the youngsters. Birdman was spot on, and that single outside today 
ended up becoming Youngboy's breakout hit, landing on the Billboard Hot 100 singles chart at number 31. The song Outside Today would actually be the lead single for Youngboy's debut studio album, titled Until Death Call My Name, which was released on April the 27th, 2018. Today. This project was a resounding success for Youngboy, peaking at number 7 on the Billboard 200 albums chart, his highest performing project at the time, and his first top 10 Billboard hit. And the project also included the song Genie, his most viewed solo hit, which today sits at over 380 million views on YouTube. The project itself was laced with interesting and introspective lyrics, where Youngboy painted a picture of the dark life he was living. The song Preach has lyrics where Youngboy talks about how he often thinks about his dead homies, and we hear Youngboy reflecting on the state of his mental health, as he speaks on how he masks his pain every morning with a smile. The album also references members of his NBA team as shooters, like Baby Joe, in the first song Solar Eclipse. And secondly, in the song Right or Wrong, where he says Baby Joe will put that Draco to people's back or heads. And in the song Solar Eclipse, Youngboy also reveals that he keeps a firearm even when performing on stage. Elsewhere in the song, he pays homage to legend of Chicago drill music Chief Keef, saying that he's killing like the Grim Reaper and drilling like Chief Keef. An ironic line, given the eventual beef between NBA and Chicago rappers a few years down the line. But at this point, Youngboy had truly arrived in the rap game, a top 10 charting artist with the whole power of the music industry behind him, despite the violent content behind his lyrics. But unfortunately for Youngboy, despite his success as a rapper, his past in the streets would indeed catch up with him and his team, and soon he would end up losing one of the people closest to him, his close friend and manager, Big Dump. Youngboy had a wildly successful start to 2018 after releasing his debut album Until Death Call My Name. And one man who no doubt played a major role in securing these major career wins was his close friend and manager, Desmond Dump Hardner. Nicknamed Dump, because he apparently loved to play with dump trucks as a child. He grew up and became a key man in Youngboy's operation, and they would foster a close personal friendship during Youngboy's come up, with that close friendship ultimately making the loss of Dump a devastating tragedy for Youngboy. On May the 4th, 2018, just before 6pm, Big Dump was apparently standing on Nen Street outside his uncle's house next to his childhood home, when a car pulled up and somebody opened fire on Dump and a woman he was standing with. Baton Rouge police officers responded to a report of a drive-by shooting. When they arrived, they found Dump and a woman suffering from gunshot wounds. They would both be taken to the hospital, but sadly Dump would pass away. Baton Rouge police say 29-year-old Desmond Hardinat died last night from his injuries. Police say Hardinat and a 32-year-old woman were both shot during a drive-by shooting yesterday afternoon. That happened near the corner of Naren and Baywell. We're told the woman's injuries are not expected to be life-threatening. Within a few days of Dump's murder, local news outlets would begin reporting on his connection to Youngboy and the NBA crew. Many years later, Lil Dump, Big Dump's nephew, would even return to the location of the murder, explaining in a vlog exactly how that day went down. What the business is, Lil Dump, I'm running it about my life and how I grew up, let's get it. My uncle Dump died on this street, the street I grew up on. My uncle died by himself, with nobody around, you feel what I'm saying? Like, no, no homeboys, no none of that shit. My uncle died at this house. Basically, he ran from here, to the under my uncle driveway. That's how it really happened. Naturally, Youngboy would be heartbroken after the loss of Dump. And in the years following Dump's death, Youngboy memorialized his fallen brother in numerous songs, like in his September 2018 track, R.I.P. Dump, a heartfelt tribute to his fallen manager, a song that was part of Youngboy's four-track EP, For Loyalty. On the song R.I.P. Dump, Youngboy expresses his sorrow and sadness at losing his right-hand man, and seemingly vowing revenge, saying that he has killers backing him up, as well as hinting towards a certain deceased op, rapping that somebody else can't diss because they're dead now. Youngboy would continue to pay homage to Dump in his music for years to come. He would also drop the 2022 track, Letter to Big Dump, a track that was written in the perspective of Youngboy writing a letter to Dump in the afterlife, updating him on all the progress that he had made since Dump passed away. It would also include a lyric where Youngboy claimed to have had a conversation with the person who put a hit on Dump, with Fredo Bang confirming in a Vlad TV interview in 2023 that he did indeed have a phone call with Youngboy. Did the two of you get on the phone together? We talk. Clearly, Youngboy knew who was responsible, and it didn't take long for people to begin making theories of their own. Following this tragic incident, many people began to point the finger at TBG, with the main names involved in TBG at this point being Fredo Bang, Lit Yoshi, and Boulevard Quick. And as time went on, there would be numerous lyrics coming out of the TBG Records camp that hinted towards the group having had something to do with the murder of Dump. Fredo Bang was particularly hurt by the loss of his friend G Money, explaining to DJ Small's Eyes in an interview that he broke down in tears in jail when he heard the news of G's death. Fredo Bang was incarcerated on a 2016 attempted murder charge at the time of G Money's death. They had a shooting by the studio, man. G got killed. 
So I'm like, man, I ain't trying to hear out. You know what I'm saying? I hang up in his face. I dropped the phone. And I, I just I just broke down in tears. Like I like you know how a baby crying on in front of 120 grown men, you know what I'm saying, in a, in a real war zone. And he would go on to publicly blame himself for G-Money's murder, suggesting that had he been free, G might still be alive today. As well as saying in an interview that G-Money was supposed to leave Baton Rouge, but he had waited around because he knew Fredo Bang was due to get out of jail soon. The only reason G was in Baton Rouge it was because he was waiting on me. I was supposed to get released that week. Ironically, Fredo Bang caught his charges back in 2016 before the beef between Youngboy and G-Money had escalated. And Fredo would even later claim in interviews that he was cool with NBA when he went to jail and that he didn't even realize that they were in a serious beef until G-Money had died. A month after Dump's death, Fredo Bang would be a free man and he would release a tribute song to his fallen friend G-Money titled Father, where Fredo would be seen in the video visiting G-Money's grave. As well as being a tribute to mourn the loss of G-Money, Fredo Bang would also drop hints in the song alluding to revenge, at one point hinting towards having placed a hit on someone from jail, and ending his second verse saying that now G-Money is dead, he will have to sin again. But Fredo's lyrics merely hinted at revenge for what had happened to G. However, other, more disrespectful songs would be released not long after, sending suspicions through the roof. Fredo Bang and Boulevard Quick had a song called Body Bag, which released just two months after Dump's death. And in the music video, Fredo Bang was seen swinging around another Chucky doll. This is a reference to G Money's music video industry, which itself was a reference to Youngboy's video, What I Was Taught. Something that signals to me a very personal message from Fredo Bang that all of these videos are connected. But beyond the visuals, the lyrics to Body Bag painted a shocking picture. Fredo would rap that they pull up on ops and dump the whole clip and that TBG stretch people. The track had lyrics that said they put someone's homie in a box for dropping knots, i.e. spending money to place hits, and saying that they caught him outside the house, which describes the circumstances of Dump's murder. Boulevard Quick would again reference Dump, apparently running from the shooters, saying, I heard he tripped over his shoelaces. And Fredo would seemingly call out Yoshi and Quick as shooters. Boulevard Quick even claimed to be shooting people from the window of cars, and that would be followed by Boulevard Quick's song, And One, which also prominently featured a Chucky doll again. And in that song, Quick would rap that he would have died for G-Money and telling Youngboy to go dig his friend up as well as dissing Youngboy, saying that he went to jail for attempted murder without even shooting anyone. After that, another Fredo Bang song called Lot of Smoke dropped. And in this song, he would rap that he puts someone on their back and that he's smoking on a fat man and that he's not dumping the ashes. As well as going on to rap, I killed your partner, I ain't sorry. In January 2019, Fredo Bang would release a tribute song to his friend YNW Melly called Free Melvin. And in this song, he would seemingly name Boulevard Quick as his shooter and saying that he committed murder after murder, as well as lyrics where he claimed that his friend caught a body and Fredo thanked him, going on to say that they were dumping clips and free Boulevard, seemingly painting a picture of Boulevard Quick as indeed being Dump's killer. In September 2019, TBG rapper Lit Yoshi would also release a track called Blasting, which came with lyrics about walking people down in their own hood and making ops run, but still leaving them slumped and shooting them with 762 bullets. Yoshi would also later release and delete a track called Chase Down, where he appeared to describe the circumstances of Dump being shot whilst with a woman who was screaming as he ran, and continuing to describe the scene where he claims to have personally chased someone down and left him face down, as well as claiming the whole city are against him and that he's always going to dump or shoot, and claiming to even have a $150,000 bounty on his head, but he's not scared and he's still making his ops run. One particular standout lyric was from his song Drake's, where he says he put it on that truck, an obvious reference to dump. Lit Yoshi would also release his new song Runts, named after the popular brand of Mary Jane on 420 2020. And in that song, he would rap that he's smoking on that truck while standing on what looked like a large dump truck, as well as dropping lyrics where he claimed that he'd catch ops in their own hood and shoot them, and repeating the ad lib, dump, 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 which he censored on the music video version of the song. However, uncensored versions of this track do still circulate on YouTube. And in the verses, seemingly addressing Youngboy directly, he would rap that he hit someone's partner up, and claiming that when bullets get to flying, people start running while he's coming, gunning, and dumping. Even in a 2021 interview with DJ Vlad, when asked about dump, Fredo Bang seems to beam an enormous smile across his face before catching himself and then pretending to not know who Dump is at all. This guy named Dump ended up getting killed in May 2018? Yeah. Do you know who that is? Um, I ain't never heard of him. 
Okay. <laughs> Dumps Murder was never officially sold, but the music painted a clear picture Obviously of the most to gain from Dumps' death. And as time went on, more of those people would continue to make songs and social media posts mocking Dumps' death and antagonizing the NBA crew. And so, perhaps unsurprisingly, it was only a matter of months before a deadly retaliation would take place, leaving one of those individuals who had mocked Dump's untimely demise facing the exact same fate. Mm. That's how it go, bro. You out here laughing. By summer 2018, the Baton Rouge rap scene was in the grips of a violent gang war between numerous factions. The 2016 murder of NBA Young Boy's cousin Boozilla was just the first in a chain of deadly shootings that would claim the lives of members on both sides. After narrowly beating two attempted murder charges trying to avenge his cousin, Young Boy would ultimately remain free to pursue his music career, but the NBA members backing him would seemingly continue to wage war against his rivals in the streets. The September 2017 murder of former friend turned rap rival G Money would see his friends from his crew TBG looking to avenge him. And ultimately, that revenge would come in the form of the murder of Youngboy's close friend and manager, Big Dump, in May 2018. But the violence would be far from over. Before Boozilla was killed, he had released a song called Forgive Me, where he dissed another local rapper by the name of FL Dusa. Boozilla would be killed soon after, and that music video would be flooded with comments suggesting that Dusa had something to do with his death. On June the 3rd, 2018, violence would reignite once again on Kentucky Street, which is interestingly the very street that Youngboy and his NBA affiliates shot up in retaliation for Boozilla's murder. And it would be here that FL Dusa, along with two other gunmen, would be involved in a shootout on 2000 Kentucky Street. According to the police, one person was shot three times in the back and another was hit in the arm and leg, with cops finding 27 shell casings in the street. Reportedly, one of the victims was BBGD, who was shot in the back. And according to a news article, one of the victims even identified the shooter as FL Dusa, as well as another person who was not initially named, but later confirmed to have been taken into custody. Rumors would later circulate that BBGD had cooperated with authorities to identify Dusa as the shooter, partly due to TBG rapper Lit Yoshi seemingly telling fans that Dusa was doing five years due to NBA members ratting on him. And he denied wanting to beef with NBA members, saying that they will rat on people, ultimately telling them to slide for Boozilla. I don't wanna go to jail. The boys are gonna free Dussa. Dussa already doing five years. I don't wanna go to jail. I don't want no smoke with no BBG. All of my boys. So y'all stop saying that like I'm beefing with them boys. I'm not. I don't want no smoke with none of them. I'm scared of them. They are in your, they are in your life. They have your place and time. Scared of them boys. They're my boys. I love them. I don't want no beef for them. Better start sliding for their own people that's dead. Or people who still look. Never mind. Yoshi would go on to insult Youngboy and the NBA crew, suggesting that when someone dies, the whole NBA gang claim responsibility for that one body, likely a reference to G-Money. Somebody died, the whole city will rip on one body. That's crazy. Uh, if someone, somebody died, the whole city will get on Instagram and rip on it, and they ain't got nothing to do with it. These Crazy. But it wasn't just Lit Yoshi showing public disrespect to the NBA crew. Boulevard Quick also called out NBA members for allegedly snitching on Dusa and claimed that Youngboy was too scared to live in Baton Rouge. You know, you know the real. You told on Dusa, got the man in penitentiary, and you told the people you couldn't live down here, so y'all relocated to California. Off social media, Boulevard Quick was continuing to diss the NBA crew in his music. He would release a remix to Youngboy's own song, War With Us, in June 2018, calling it a G-mix in tribute to G-Money, and once again, including a Chucky doll in the music video, as both Youngboy, G-Money, and Fredo Bang had all done in previous diss songs. Nah, isn't G-mix, like, back in the day, because people don't do re really do remixes like that no more, and, like, when you do a remix behind the scenes, this type of third, all type of thing, like, with Distro Kid, they don't want you doing remixes because if you're claiming the YouTube ID for the song and you put out a remix, it's like the streaming services, there's like problems in communication. Is it a new song? Is it the same song? That kind of stuff. But I think like back in like 08, when people was doing heavy remixes, there would be the remix of the original and then there would be the G mix. I believe this is what it was, which was the remix of the remix. I think that's how I remember it. 
songs and their music videos. It featured an intro. Gang, we only two hours in, son. That's crazy. I might, I might speed this up for real. I might have to take a break soon too, cause damn, son. Let's speed that up. That showed people pulling up to Youngboy Street on 38th and Chippewa and shooting someone, as well as numerous lyrics providing an insight into the ongoing tension between these two groups. Rapping that word around town is that he's going to get killed, but he's not hiding, and that he's still sliding trying to kill Ops. A couple of months later, on the 2nd of August 2018, Boulevard Quick released a bold music video for his new song Never Lack It. The track was a boastful diss to his Ops, but he invited them to pull up on him, and he claimed that they will never catch him lacking because he's always armed. He would also rap that people are claiming to be putting money on his head, but he's not scared, and the song would end with a rant where Quick would taunt his Ops, claiming that despite them putting up money to have him killed, He's still alive and breathing. You dropped the bag while I'm still breathing. I got breath in my back. Fake ass boy. A little while after this, a preview of a young boy song would circulate where young boy dissed G Money and threatened to shoot someone like the last gorilla. A reference to their crew, Top Boy Gorillas, TBG. With Quick reacting to this snippet after a wave of people tagged him, saying everybody young boy knows, including his mother and father, are hoax. I'll tag man all. See this hill? I got that. So, your mama's. Your dad is. Everybody you roll with. But Quick wasn't done there. He would also be seen on social media telling a story about OG33, saying that he beat him up in jail and that three requested protection from him and Fredo Bang. 3 3 in the dorm with me. He had just no three he had just came to the dorm that night. That morning I walked up to his bed, woke him up, punched him in his shit, stomped him out, he shit on himself, and told and, and checked out. Told the people he cannot be around me or Fredo Bang. Yeah, that was 3 3 said. He cannot live around me, Alfredo Bain. Clearly, Youngboy wasn't discouraged by the beef or the threats. And in September 2018, he would have the successful release of his latest project, Decided, landing at 41 on the Billboard 200. However, the tension really escalated when Youngboy's mother, Sharonda, came into the picture. She would appear on IG Live in October 2018 and begun responding to death threats in the comments, telling viewers that she keeps a big gun under her bed. As the live went on, somebody would comment that Fredo Bank and Boulevard Quick want to get Youngboy, prompting Sharonda to say F both of them. Uh, 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 let me see. Fredo Bang and Quick wants to get young boy. <laughs> Fredo Bang and F Boulevard Slow. <laughs> to which Boulevard Quick responded with a vulgar and unfiltered rant on his Instagram saying F young boy's mum and saying she looks like a man. See that way niggas cross the line, bro. Eat a big long. Last man talk about my mama ain't so do that again, I promise you. Ain't a dog that you dream about making. That's when you cross the line. My mama. Yeah, boy, you trying bitch, to die. Girl, my bitch can say what she wants to say about me. <laughs> She me, bitch. You look like a man, though. Bitch, you look like a punk. Talking about me, bitch. I ain't afraid of. And it how crazy it is. They got a woman in the background laughing, bro. They got a woman in the background laughing at a man disrespecting another woman. That's crazy, bro. You're not disrespecting my mama, bro. Nor my girl, nor my daughter, none of my women, bro. You out of your mind, bro. Bitch, I speak on everything. Boy, f that nigga, mom. Bitch, bitch, play with me first. Sharonda then jumped on live once more to respond, mocking Boulevard Quick, joking that she was sorry that she'd made him cry, and saying that he's fat. I had woke up this morning, everybody in my ear about to talk about Boulevard, Boulevard Quick was talking about me. But uh, I, I I really got on him to tell him that I'm sorry. I, I came to tell little Boulevard Quick that I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I made you cry, boo. I'm for real. Because I was I was only, I wouldn't be mean. Like, somebody was on my thing, like I'm reading out and somebody said, right. oh, somebody hit me, he's the friend. So I said, Miss Rick, I'm like, I feel like anybody don't like my tree. And that's how I am. If you don't like my tree, no, y'all. I wouldn't be a mean or miss or nothing. And then I saw him on and, Instagram, YouTube, whatever, crying yesterday about, oh, his mama put, put my name in her mouth and, and, and that's up and, and, and I swear to God, man, she better keep my name out of her mouth. I'm sorry, boo. I'm sorry I put your, man, your name in your mouth because I saw you crying. She look like a man. She, she she ugly. She got man features. I'm sorry, boo. I'm sorry for talking about you because you look like a bow. You got round features, boo. I'm sorry. <laughs> she want to be a comedian. So, so bad. Bitch, you want to be a rapper? So, so bad. I'm sorry I made you cry. For real. I, I'm, I don't know you, boo. I don't. I'm sorry. I was just saying whoever don't like my tree. I wasn't just saying, you know, trying to be mean or messing, they be on my end, on my thing, talk about you, saying you said this and that, and so that's why I said, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure you just said, fuck us plenty of days. We, we, I ain't trying to be mean. She I'm right, though. Mean, like, for real, though. Like, she right, though. She underground, somebody said, hey, this man say F your son. And she pull up and she, why my stop sign all the way over here? What's going on, you two? Oh, oh, yo, I was tripping. But yeah, she right, though. She, you say F my child or you gonna get my child, you gonna beat him up. I'm gonna say F you too. Like, she, what? <laughs>
I just, it's for real, I'm a mama. Anybody that don't like my church, if anybody who don't like me, you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying you personally, because I don't know you. I, I do not know you. So go ahead and, you know, I said I'm so around live in front of everybody. So now you can go back to a grocery store and make you some more little videos. But I'm not going to once again, saying that it was young boy's mother who started it by dissing him and his friends. You so got some manly, manly features on your mother, man. She said go back to your grocery Stoop. store. Like, oh, we can't play on the chip. Yeah, I'm on your no, people gotta say, I'm, yeah, I spoke on, I did that, I can't take that back. Tell my name out of mouth. And, and keep my pattern name out of mouth. Uh, uh, we talking about, I gotta diss people for fame. I ain't dissing no fame. Mama came for me. Talking about Fredo Pain, Boulevard Slow. And after this, Young Boy himself spoke on the matter in line, warning Boulevard Quick that this internet beef will end with him having the last laugh, and saying that his ops are going to either die, go broke, or go to jail. This internet alone. I hope y'all stupid know that. This internet alone. Bitch, y'all finna be assed out. All y'all fake ass travelers, rappers, gunslingers, strippers, insta mobs. Bitch, y'all finna be assed out. Bitch, this internet ain't lasting for long, bro. That money gonna last for long. Bitch, we gonna see who gonna have a last laugh. It's either you're gonna die, or you're gonna be a bum, or you're gonna be successful, or you're gonna go to jail. And the reason I ain't that way, man, because the f point, I don't know which point I'm gonna be. You hear me? But I ain't dumb, though. You hear me? And the people who play that role, to y'all, them bitches know I ain't dumb. The people who really know me, they know I ain't dumb. You hear me? How the f I came this far? You think I came this far by being dumb, you stupid bitch? You think I came this far by being dumb? Come on, man. I ain't see that nigga, man. It's a joke, huh? So, I'm a hoe. You hear me? Don't mix my rap life with my, with my music life. I am pure. Clearly the beef between Youngboy and Boulevard Quick had gotten incredibly personal, and now mothers were involved. And unfortunately for Boulevard Quick, he would soon be facing the grave consequences of dishing out such public and personal insults. In one of his last public appearances on IG Live, Boulevard Quick would ask fans why people want to kill people from TVG so bad, telling fans that it's because they're dangerous and a threat to their ops. I really want to know the reason why people kill TVG so bad, because we are a f***ing problem. That's why. We are a f***ing problem. We will see TVG with nothing, because we are going to be a real f***ing threat to society. On November the 26th, 2018, around 12.30 a.m., police would respond to reports of a shooting after neighbors heard five shots. They would attend Lakeside Villas apartment complex in the 2400 block of Weldwood, where Boulevard Quick lived. And here, they would discover the body of Quick, real name Ashton Wells, who had been shot dead and left at the scene, murdered in cold blood just outside of his home, circumstances chillingly similar to the fate of Big Dump. It would seem obvious that these two tragic slayings may have some connection. TBG rapper Fredo Bang would post a tribute to Boulevard Quick, saying they accept everything that comes with the street life and calling Quick's death part of God's plan. And he would go on to continue to show love to Quick on Instagram in the years that followed. Meanwhile, NBA members would mock the murdered TBG rival, particularly Youngboy, who would appear to glow on social media and in songs following Quick's death. The day after Quick died, Youngboy would appear on an IG Live with an enormous smile, reciting lyrics to his upcoming song, My Mama Say, where he said that people keep saying they're going to touch him, but they keep dying. The full song would drop on Youngboy's latest mixtape, Reeler, the following month. And that song would be wall to wall with lyrics about how Youngboy uses money to leave his rivals dead, and claiming to catch the boy who's been dissing and shoot them in the face, and ending the track with an outro saying they leave stains in front of people's homes. Elsewhere on that mixtape, Youngboy would continue to perpetuate his image as a shot caller, dropping bags on his enemies' heads. On the track Play With Us, Youngboy claims to be plotting the next murder with his hitters, explaining his expectation for somebody to be killed in exchange for a check. That was followed by more lyrics, claiming to be giving direct instructions to his shooters to deliver a body before claiming to deny any knowledge if the authorities try and link him to the hit. Then there's the song valuable pain, where Youngboy admits his killers look up to him and that he hopes all of the bodies he was responsible for don't catch up to him. But Youngboy would go on to drop much more pointed hints about his connection to Boulevard Quick's death later in his career. A leaked Youngboy track called Impact surfaced in the summer of 2020 and had lyrics where Youngboy seemed to suggest that he had had Boulevard Quick killed in direct retaliation for disrespecting his mother. He would also flip lyrics from Quick's War With Us remix. In that song, Boulevard Quick rapped, All I say is watch the news because then body's lame. Well, two years after his death, Youngboy would refer to those lyrics on his murder anthem, Dead Trolls, rapping, that dude dead, tell me did he move, all he said was watch the news, talking channel 9, I need to turn it to 2, it was 2 victims ain't make it through. 
Now, this is a deep lyric, as it was local news network Channel 9 WAFB that would report on Quick's death both on their website and TV broadcast. And the death of G Money in 2017 was announced on WBRZ News 2, another Louisiana news program shown on Channel 2. Youngboy would also reference putting his ops on Channel 9 again years later in the song Channel 9 on his 2023 mixtape Richest Op, where he claimed, once again, to be the murder man, and sneak dissing Boulevard Quick, saying his ops weren't quick on their feet. And in one more crazy lyric that seems to connect to this situation was on the track 1.5 from his album Don't Try This At Home, where Youngboy seems to refer to the situation where Boulevard Quick dissed his mother, rapping that his mother heard what he said about her and told Youngboy to leave him dead, with him rapping that he caught him and a few weeks later busted his head. But it wasn't just Youngboy disrespecting Quick. As time went on, his whole crew would continue to diss their fallen rival. NBA KD would mock both G Money and Boulevard Quick in an IG Live. G wasn't quick enough. <laughs> that was a cold. Some people believe NBA Big B to have had something to do with this due to numerous lyrics where he claimed to have rolled up a fat op. On the track Smoke, he rapped, Smoke in the air, there's a fat dude there. I done messed around and rolled him up, put him in my back, and drop a bag on his head, I promise I'ma do it. And on the song Op Season, he raps, he was talking, he got ran down by his front door. And even being seen in an unreleased song snippet saying, the fat man didn't make it to December. NBA Herm would also tease snippets on Instagram Ooh, that's where he cool. appeared to rap that he got the drop on an op's apartment and a fat op dead. And NBA Ben 10 would respond to friends of Quick posting his music, laughing and saying he finds it funny when he sees dead people dissing him on the timeline. So tell me, don't be funny. We going on your timeline, you see a dead like Polar Boy, you did. Clearly Boulevard Quick was deeply invested in the gang war and he wasn't going to stop until he killed someone or got killed himself. And in the end, he would wind up being the latest victim of another senseless murder. Another young man whose life would be cut short before he could see any true success in his music. And while Youngboy would be happily moving on with his life after losing his close friend and manager Dump to the streets, with one of his biggest enemies and the person rumored to have had something to do with Dump's murder now out of the way too, it wouldn't be as easy as simply walking away from violence back to his rap career. Youngboy too would ultimately be too deep in this beef to simply move on and focus on music, because now friends of Boulevard Quick were grieving and looking for their revenge. And even while seeking refuge in other states, far away from the violence of Baton Rouge, that danger would seem to follow Youngboy everywhere he went, raining death and destruction all around him. By 2019, Youngboy was a long way from the dangerous streets of Baton Rouge. He was now a Billboard charting recording artist with a multi-million dollar record deal and a whole lot of people depending on him. He was also on probation, getting a 10 year suspended sentence for his role in a double attempted murder the day after his cousin was killed. So he would have to move smart if he wanted to take advantage of this opportunity being offered to him. After accepting his plea deal and narrowly avoiding 10 years in prison, Youngboy vowed to leave the dangers of Baton Rouge for Los Angeles, rapping on his comeback single, Untouchable, that he needed to move to a city where he didn't need to stay armed to be safe. With Youngboy even explaining in a genius interview about that lyric that he simply didn't need to worry about people shooting at him in Los Angeles. Youngboy would be seen mobbing in LA surrounded by his NBA brothers in the music video for his 2017 song 41, where he was clearly living the high life, pulling up to the cookout in a fresh Lamborghini drop top. A Lamborghini which he would duly total within a month, leading to him and his manager Big Dump being sued in LA. Youngboy's life was truly chaotic wherever he went, but he'd be better off crashing a Lambo in Beverly Hills than he would be crashing out and gangbanging in Baton Rouge. So his team kept him out of the streets and in the studio where he could focus on making more hits, and those hits would continue to come thick and fast. By this point, Youngboy had dropped an insane 14 full projects with eight songs charting on the Billboard Hot 100 and an insane 11 projects charting on Billboard's 200 album chart. At the start of 2019, Youngboy was riding high off the news that he had been named as YouTube's top streaming artist in the United States for nearly 101 weeks straight, with it being claimed that he had racked up a whopping 8 million global views just on YouTube per day, giving him yet another reason to go by the nickname day. Top, which he apparently got from his grandfather originally. Youngboy wasn't just having success, he was becoming one of the all-time greats of the rap genre. With his unmatchable work rate, creativity, and realness, by just age 19, he had cemented per himself day, as one of the bro. top rappers to ever do it. And no doubt, all of this success was having a devastating effect on the enemies that he had left behind in Baton Rouge. And Youngboy would continue to use his music and position at the top of the rap game to taunt his rivals and drop clues about the goings on in Baton Rouge's gang underworld. His first release in 2019 was the song Kick Your Door, an aggressive home invasion anthem where Youngboy rapped about kicking indoors and doing robberies with his gang. In April 2019, he dropped his new song Free D-Doc, a tribute to incarcerated homie. The track was an aggressive murder anthem where Youngboy would boast confidently about having people killed for disrespecting him or his people or speaking on him. He would seem to diss his former crew turned ops TBG, saying that certain people used to run his city, but now they can't even claim it, and ending the song, saying that his ops will become victims and end up on the news. These lyrics seem to be a cloaked reference to G Money and Boulevard Quick, two rappers from rival crew TBG who had been gunned down during their beef with NBA, and no doubt that their surviving friends, Fredo Bang and Lit Yoshi from TBG, were furious about the ongoing disrespect after losing their close friends. And unfortunately for Youngboy, soon his beef in the streets would collide with his music career with disastrous consequences. In April 2019, Fredo Bang releases his latest project, Big Ape, an album that saw him repping his TBG flag with pride, and dropping numerous songs that included cloaked threats towards Youngboy. On the opening track, Shoot, he dropped numerous lyrics claiming to be putting money up for people to be killed, even saying outright, when it's beef, nobody's safe, 
even if you're rich. Throughout the project, he would drop hints towards putting prices on his ops heads, and it was clear from Fredo Bang's lyrics that TBG wanted young boy gone. And it would only be a month after that project released that the real-life violence would continue to play out on the streets. But this time, trouble wouldn't play out in the slums of Baton Rouge. In fact, the gang warfare would follow young boy to the sandy beaches of Miami. In May 2019, everyone's favorite rap music festival, Rolling Loud, would be set to take place in Miami, and young boy would be in town to perform at the festival in what would be a hugely lucrative and high-profile performance. Young boy was booked to play on the Sunday, May 12th slot where Kid Cudi was headlining. But this was a star-studded weekend, and many of the biggest names in the rap game would be in town to perform at this event. Lil Durk was due to perform on Friday. Saturday saw Lil Wayne, 21 Savage, Kodak Black, and Chief Keith touch the stage. And on Sunday, fans would see Lil Uzi, Gucci Mane, G Herbo sharing the stage with Young Boy. However, all of these crews in town at the same time, no doubt there would be interconnected beefing going on between numerous camps. Apparently, early Friday morning, Young Boy was attending a strip club party with Young Thug, who was due to perform Saturday. Where apparently somebody popped off a few rounds at the party bus that was driving between venues, an attack which TMZ reported was targeting Young Thug. A young Thug and his entourage became the apparent victims of a drive-by shooting that went down this morning on I-95. The shooting happened on Interstate 95, and Youngboy's TBG nemesis Lit Yoshi would later rap on the song Cutter, which dropped a couple of months later in June 2019, that he caught him on the interstate, seven swerved, I was bussing. Seemingly a reference to the shooting on the interstate, and naming fellow TBG affiliate Seven Hardaway as the driver. Hmm. But unfortunately for Youngboy, that was only the beginning of the trouble, because at this point, it seemed that his ops were in town and on the hunt to try and catch Youngboy lacking. Lit Yoshi would actually be seen on social media that weekend, riding around Miami, listening to Fredo Bang's album, and holding a rifle, seemingly looking for Youngboy. On Sunday the 12th of May, when Youngboy was due to perform, he would make a tweet that was geolocation tagged to Sunny Isles Beach, Florida, warning his ops that he doesn't care who they are or what they did, he will up his gun on them. Fans would warn Youngboy that the location tag on his tweet meant his ops might be able to locate him, but it was unfortunately too late. Youngboy's enemies would work out that he was staying at the Trump International Hotel and Beach Resort in Sunny Isles, Miami. Apparently Youngboy was traveling with a large crew that included his girlfriend, as well as OG3, and several other unnamed affiliates and family members. As Youngboy left the hotel with his entourage to make his way to the Rolling Loud Festival performance, the group would be ambushed by a black Cadillac outside the hotel. According to reports, somebody opened fire from the Escalade towards Youngboy's entourage, prompting return fire from members of his crew who had their own gun, with court papers later explaining that Youngboy, his family, and entourage were traveling in a two-car convoy that was shot up drive-by style, with the front car that carried his mother and friends being shot first, with Youngboy and his girlfriend in the second car that was then also shot at. This would be a chaotic scene, and Youngboy's girlfriend, Kayla Marie Long, was hit in the shoulder and later taken to hospital. But the biggest tragedy of all would be a case of incredible bad luck, as according to court documents, in Youngboy's car was a bag full of guns, and when shots started flying, members of Youngboy's entourage returned fire with apparently legally registered firearms, and apparently, at some point in the chaos, Youngboy himself was given a gun, and begun shooting back too. Authorities later described them as standing at the valet section, firing rifles wildly from the hip. Inevitably, this ended up with some tragic consequences, as three bystanders were hit in the crossfire, with it being reported that a five-year-old child was grazed by a bullet, but even more tragic, one of these gunshots fired between these two warring crews claimed the life of an innocent bystander. Oh, 43-year-old Mohamed Jaradi, an honest, hard-working guy, minding his own business, who had just finished his shift working at the Hertz rent car across the street, would catch a stray bullet and end up losing life. This was a chaotic scene, with bullets flying and bodies dropping in the middle of the street in a major American city in broad daylight. Eventually, the police would shut down the street and gain control of the crime scene. Footage would circulate showing people being detained at the scene. Once the location had been locked down, the local news began to report on this Wild West shootout. There was some sort of altercation that took place between two rappers who were actually set to perform at the Rolling Loud Festival this evening. Witnesses say they heard someone fire shots at least four or five rounds. A woman was struck and raced to Aventura Hospital. Immediately following that shooting, the fight then spilled over again to the strip mall parking lot where we are at. This is directly across the street from the hotel. A man here again was shot and killed. A friend of the victims tells me off camera that he was simply an innocent bystander. He was working at the Hertz rental car company here at the strip mall and just parking a car when he was caught in the crossfire. Now a new and a tragic day for one South Florida family. Their loved one becomes an innocent victim after shots are fired in the middle of the afternoon. This type of behavior in this community is not acceptable. A furious mayor of Sunny Isles Beach speaks out against the violence that erupted in his usually quiet town on Sunday afternoon. It was just before two o'clock when police received a 911 call about gunshots fired outside Trump International Beach Resort. When they arrived, they found 19-year-old Kaylin Long of Maryland had been shot inside a black suburban and across the street, an innocent man lies dead in the driver's well, seat of a dark gray van. Too. Long was initially why taken to Avatar Hospital. Why was the bullets did not end there. Well, because across she was with young boy? There was a five-year-old little boy 
that was grazed by a bullet. Police seized several weapons from the Trump Hotel and combed multiple scenes where gun shells and bullet holes were spotted. And for real, for real, who knows if that man actually is Who knows what he does that night? Despite reports of young boy being detained at the scene, in the midst of the chaos, he would actually manage to break free from authorities, being seen in footage later circulated by TMZ, showing him giving his wounded girlfriend medical attention before jumping in a black SUV and fleeing the scene. From here, young boy made his way to the Rolling Loud Festival site, performing his set as planned, immediately after surviving this assassination attempt. Breaking free from an active crime scene where you were a participant in a shootout so that you can go and perform at a festival might seem cool on paper, but when Youngboy got off that stage, he would have to face the consequences of what had just happened. However, there would still be some lucky breaks for the NBA crew. Apparently, investigators couldn't even charge anybody in Youngboy's entourage for shooting back, despite the fact that an innocent bystander was killed because all of Youngboy's crew that were still at the scene claimed self-defense. Yeah. And the state of Florida has a stand your ground law in place, whereby if an individual truly believes that deadly force is necessary to protect themselves or to prevent a crime, they can potentially be immune from prosecution. The cops said that they were apparently looking to determine who had shot first, as whoever shot first could apparently be charged with first-degree murder of the innocent bystander, even if it wasn't their bullet hitting them. In order to try and ensure that young boy wasn't held liable, his legal team described the scene as an assassination attempt of which he was the target. He's an absolute victim. There's no question. Police investigated it. They talked to him. They, they, you know, his car was shot up. He was leaving the hotel. He had his mother in the car. He had his girlfriend in the car. And somebody came up, and I don't know what the weapons were, I don't know if it was an AK or what it was, but they opened fire and lit him on fire. Youngboy and his label apparently even offered to cover the funeral costs of the innocent man who died, but it's unclear as to whether or not they were taken up on this offer. And Youngboy's lawyer had said that apparently he felt terrible about this, and that he had wished it had been him that was killed rather than the innocent man. It was also initially reported that apparently Youngboy had refused to cooperate with law enforcement who wanted to know who had initiated the shootout. But Youngboy later said that that was just miscommunication, and that they hadn't really been given enough time to try and convince Youngboy to speak to them about the incident, suggesting that he was scared to cooperate. With none of the actual antagonists who shot first in custody, however, unfortunately, the consequences of this incident would still fall on Youngboy's shoulders. And due to the fact that he was already on thin ice because of the 10-year suspended sentence he got for the attempted murder charges in 2016, a week later, he would have to return to Baton Rouge for a court hearing where he was swiftly put back behind bars, with TMZ reporting that he had been jailed once again for violating his probation. This would be numerous violations, including being seen holding a gun in public and being caught in the presence of NBA Boomer and Ben when the terms of his plea forbid him from associating with them. And apparently the judge had also claimed to have seen a video on social media of Youngboy antagonizing his ops. Now, this was supposedly a social media which the judge claimed she saw, but then Youngboy's lawyer and myself included couldn't even find. The judge said that she looked at a news feed regarding the article, right. and in the comments there was some sort of embedded video that she since tried to look up, and I don't think she was able to find. So she wants to see if the district attorney's office can find or whatever whatever videos they, they find. And I, but I don't know what the video is. She, I haven't seen it. But based on some of the things I've read, I'm pretty sure the video they're referring to was a clip where Youngboy actually dissed blog site The Shade Room for covering him negatively. I'm so sick of The Shade Room trying to paint me as a bad person. What the f is wrong with you? I know whoever ran in this page is wrong. What the f did you worry about a teenager for? So it seems the judge kind of misinterpreted what he had done, but I don't think he was supposed to be on social media like that. Anyway, meanwhile in Miami, the police would reveal to the public that they had absolutely no idea who the shooters were, but that they were looking for three suspects armed with an AK-47 and other handguns. Coincidentally, with this seeming to describe that very social media clip of TBG rapper Lit Yoshi posted just before the shooting when he was riding around Miami with an AK-47 listening to Fredo back. So with Lit Yoshi still at large, Youngboy would be left in a Baton Rouge jail, reflecting on everything that had just happened. Clearly Youngboy himself was devastated by this sequence of events. He was trying to move on with his life and career away from Baton Rouge, but the violence and death would just continue to follow him wherever he went. Perhaps it was karma for the violence that he had claimed responsibility for. In the song No Understand from Youngboy's February 2021 project, Still Flexin' Still Steppin', Youngboy even speaks on this shooting, saying that as the bullets flew, he didn't have enough time to grab his own gun, and saying that Baba Osama shot back, a claim that is seemingly confirmed by Gerardi's family, who is suing both Youngboy and Baba in relation to the shooting. And then in the next line, Youngboy seems to pay respects to that innocent bystander who lost his life, as well as the child who was grazed in the shootout, saying that he feels the pain of the innocent, and that when he did his time in jail following the incident, he felt nothing, as he felt that the pain that he went through was suffering that he deserved on behalf of the man who lost his life and the child who was grazed, who shouldn't have been dragged in his conflicts. Following the shooting at the Trump Hotel in Miami, Youngboy would remain in jail for 90 days before being released, but he would be seen in August 2019 looking like he'd put on some muscle, bailing out of jail, and being picked up once again in a fresh Maybach. Youngboy would be seen in selfies with his mother, and he would later go on live with family in his garage upon getting home. Say something to the people. Hello. 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 Huh? I ain't if I had 112 damn people. <laughs> I'll never go live. I'm so serious. I didn't want to see you. They're going to be looking for me. Let me look at you. What they saying, y'all? You still fine. You. He is still fine. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. He looked like a Mexican cartel. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs>
The judge would order young boy to remain on house arrest for 12 months following his release. With the court funny. apparently deciding not to completely revoke his probation, giving him the opportunity to finish out his remaining year of probation without further punishment, in a deal that would not allow him to perform for the entire year either. So no more trips to Miami or California, and no more concerts. So young boy, for the first time in his career, would be confined to his home, unable to play shows, shoot music videos, or slide on ops. He would remain in his home and focus on the one thing that made him successful: recording and releasing music. Already a prolific releaser of music, now with no distractions, as ordered by the court, young boy would kick his creative spirit into overdrive. Not only recording an insane amount of music, but arguably delivering the best bodies of work of his entire career, and going on a once-in-a-lifetime run of success, the likes of which the music industry had never seen. After getting out of jail, Youngboy picked up his career right where he left off, on September the 1st, 2018, dropping a new track called Slime Mentality. This was yet another aggressive murder anthem, where Youngboy pledges allegiance to his gang 4K Trey and letting everybody know that him and his whole family, including his mother, father, sister, and brother, all see themselves as slime members too. Following that up with audacious lyrics about dropping more bags to have rivals killed, and even promising to die in the hunt for revenge for Dump's death. And all of this apparently while ducking the watchful eye of his parole officer, and the chorus of the song lays bare the realities of life in young boy's circle, made cold and ruthless from growing up in such a harsh environment, forcing him to be constantly armed and ready to kill anyone who might want to come and kill him from his city or even out of town, all while confidently boasting that the whole city knows that he and his shooters will kill before they let anyone take them down. Upon his release, young boy was being filmed from the moment he walked out of the prison gates, with that footage serving as the introductory sequence for his next song and music video, the track Self Control. The song came with lyrics where young boy reflected on the pain he felt after Boozilla was killed and wanting to avenge Dump's death. On the hook, young boy sings a unique melody all about how his chronic smoking habit is a tactic to stop himself from being so dangerous, and describing his entourage as equally dangerous, ready to shoot at the slightest provocation. 20 days after that, he would drop a follow-up song, the iconic House Arrest Tings. That track completely blew up on release, racking up millions of views within days, and to this day, still sitting around 100 million views on YouTube. He would also appear as a feature on the track Richer Than Aerobody, with industry heavy hitters Gucci Mane and DaBaby. Youngboy was dropping songs all in anticipation of his next full-length project, which did not disappoint. On October the 11th, 2019, Youngboy dropped his latest mixtape, AI Youngboy 2. This, in my opinion, is Youngboy's best project, and perhaps one of the greatest albums in modern rap history. AR Youngboy 2 is wall to wall with some of Youngboy's best songs, and throughout the project he showcases an incredible range as a melodic rapper and singer. The project just oozes creativity, and the songs are really like nothing else out there. It's unmistakably unique, with the Youngboy using his trademark style to sing, rap, and whine perfect melodies, all painting a picture of his wild ride from the gutter to the very top of the rap industry. So I actually did an entire breakdown of all of the most important lyrics in AI Youngboy 2, but it made the video way too long. So if you want to see that, it's in the uncut version that's on Patreon, or it's going to be in the extended version of this chapter going up on my third channel, Trap Law Clips, soon. Ultimately, Youngboy stuck on house arrest, poured his heart into his music, and it resulted in one of the most incredible bodies of work in rap history. AI Youngboy 2 scored a roaring debut, selling an impressive 110,000 units in its first week, and earning Youngboy his first number one billboard 200 chart hit. But that wouldn't be Youngboy's only chart milestone that week. As the week before AR Youngboy released, Youngboy would end up collaborating with Chicago pop rap star Juice World on the song Bandit. The pairing of Juice World and Youngboy made for an incredible duo, with Juice's vocals and love song ideas elevating the track conceptually, contrasting with Youngboy's verse, a classic aggressive murder rap, where he raps openly about having problems and getting rid of people for $20,000, once again painting a picture of his lifestyle surrounded by killers and sliding on their ops with guns. This track no doubt introduced Youngboy and Juice World to big audiences that they might not have previously accessed. That track was released on October the 4th, 2019, and this would sadly be the last single released by Juice World before his unfortunate death from an overdose on December the 8th, 2019. Bandit would peak at number 10 on the Billboard Hot 100, becoming Youngboy's highest charting song for his career to date, and it also became an international hit, charting in 20 countries. And by the end of 2019, Youngboy had cemented himself as one of the greats in the rap game. He wasn't just taking over the rap game, but he was influencing its direction going forward, and in the coming years, Youngboy's influence would be undeniable. However, time and time again, the thing holding him back would be legal issues. But luckily, soon Youngboy would catch a major win, shaking free of a case that had been dogged him for years, and paving the way for him to follow up AI Youngboy 2, eventually going on one of the most impressive runs that the rap game had ever seen. Fresh off the success of AI Youngboy 2, Hey, off probation. Alright gang, so this looks like halfway. <laughs> this is about halfway, you know what I mean? Almost, almost halfway. And I feel like for real, for real, I'm gonna um, take a quick break. Cause I totally forgot to charge Youngboy wasn't taking his foot off gas. He would continue releasing new music and songs like Bring Em Out, yet another murder anthem, wall to wall with lyrics about contract killings and dropping bags on ops and even their mothers. And Youngboy himself would still be fighting for his own freedom in the courts. After being sentenced to a year of probation following his involvement in the broad daylight shootout outside the Trump Hotel back when he was in Miami for the Rolling Loud Festival, but it wasn't that shooting that got him in trouble. It was the fact that he was involved in it whilst on a 10 year suspended sentence for the 2016 double attempted murder charge he caught trying to avenge his murdered cousin Boozilla. On December the 13th, 2019, Youngboy would be back in court 
where he would score a rare legal victory regarding that case, when the judge ultimately granted a request to terminate his probation early since apparently he had completed all of his conditions to date. NBA young boy was in court today. He's no longer on probation and says he plans to leave Louisiana. A judge today ended his probation during a hearing. Lawyers to the rapper, whose real name is Kintrell Golden, had argued that he followed all of the court's conditions. Golden was arrested back in May after a deadly shootout in Florida. His defense had argued that he was actually the target of the shooting, but he was already on probation in connection to a 2016 shooting. Hmm. That's good. What you say, Grandma, baby. What's that, Jay Harlow? I got double law. I got to meet them. I got to meet How you going to do it? Congratulations, bro. Yeah. Oh, How do you feel right now? Feel good, bro. This was a huge win for Youngboy, <laughs> yeah, arguably yeah, the judge yeah. was doing him a huge personal favour. After all, it was plainly clear to anybody who knew the situation that Youngboy's enemies in Baton Rouge wanted him dead, and it would turn out that the conditions of his probation were actually creating potential danger for him. Apparently, a court-approved music video had actually put Youngboy's property lease in question, and with limited rental properties available in Baton Rouge where he could genuinely remain safe and anonymous, moving out of the city would be his best option. However, prior restrictions relating to his probations would force him to keep coming back to Baton Rouge where he would indeed be a huge target for his ops. Atlantic Records would even write a letter to the judge claiming that his personal and financial safety were at risk in Baton Rouge, and the judge actually agreed. So, after being granted his freedom, Youngboy called Judge Jackson a blessing, saying that she saved him, and saying that she had given him opportunity after opportunity up until this point. And honestly, it seemed like this judge truly had Youngboy's back, apparently previously denying numerous attempts by the district attorney to revoke his probation and sent him straight back to jail. She ultimately told Youngboy that she felt that it was the people around him that didn't have his best interests at heart and that they were bringing him down. And while the judge is clearly trying to- Now, did she have a change of heart? Or was that just tough love from all along? Because she did, she did come kind of crazy in that initial thing she said. To give Youngboy helpful advice from her perspective, realistically, it was the same people bringing trouble into Youngboy's life that were also putting their lives on the line to protect it. I would personally argue it wasn't Youngboy's friends bringing him down, but his enemies in the rival crew TBG that kept trying to kill him that were truly bringing him down. And right or wrong, it was the NBA members that were willing to kill, die, or serve life in prison, all in the pursuit of protecting their provider Youngboy. And oh boy was he providing. Because by 2020, Youngboy had now released 15 full-length projects. And off the back of the success of AI Youngboy 2, he was now clocking in a total record of 17 songs charting on the Billboard Hot 100 and 13 projects charting on Billboard's 200 album chart. In February 2020, the Wall Street Journal drops an article saying that Youngboy is the biggest music star you've probably never heard of, pointing to the fact that despite not being a household name globally, he had continued to dominate on YouTube as the top artist. And soon, Youngboy would be ready to follow up his prior success with another full-length project. On February the 21st, 2020, Youngboy released his first project of the year, Still Flexin', Still Steppin'. This project had the hit single and another of my personal favorite Youngboy tracks, Lil Pop, which would end up peaking at number 28 on Billboard's Hot 100 songs chart, with this being the highest charting solo hit of his career to date. But the overall content of this project was very much still gangbanging, which certainly fit in with the title, Still Flexin', Still Steppin'. The project sees Youngboy describing his life very much still adjacent to the streets, with lyrics all about taking 50k cash out of the bank to fund more hits in the streets. But he would also open up about still feeling depression on the project, along with numerous tributes to his fallen manager Dump, as well as promises to avenge him, and revealing omissions that he is still at war over the murder of his cousin Boozilla. However, on this project, in one of the first instances of caution, on the track Long Road, Youngboy actually does rap that he didn't kill anyone, with it being unclear if this is him saying that there's no evidence that he's killed anyone, or if for the first time he's actually admitting that while he's living in close proximity to murder and gang violence, he's not actually responsible for any of the murders that he's been associated with over the course of his career. Considering how laced this project is with threats to his ops, it does really make you wonder whether Youngboy truly is still this gangster that he's portraying in his music, or whether he really is just an artist from the streets selling the gangster image to his audience because he knows that's what sells. In the track Call Me Late, Youngboy claims to still be ready to kill and go to trial, even claiming that his desire to kill every single op is still his main focus in life. Claims which at this point in his career are kind of hard to take seriously. Clearly Youngboy is still affected by the lifestyle, rapping else where he is often seen shaking in his sleep and waking up from nightmares, reaching for the nearest gun. With him going on to say that he doesn't actually want to hurt anybody, that he just wants to be left alone by his ops, by the police, and by the devil. On the final track of the project, titled No Understand, Youngboy reflects on his life of crime, saying that he doesn't feel shame for all of the people that died in his beefs, but admitting that he still cries at night over it, as well as reflecting on feeling guilt for the innocent people who were hurt or died during that shootout at the Trump Hotel, and reflecting on whether or not he's going to have to be the person in his community who breaks the cycle of gang violence, going on to acknowledge that his young shooters who have lost their parents don't know what's important in life yet and are simply programmed to kill. Still Flexin', Still Steppin' was the latest chapter in Youngboy's story, and he continued to have his fans captivated. This project earned him an impressive number two debut on the Billboard album, 
performance charts, narrowly losing out on the top spot to K-pop sensations BTS. But clearly not content with the number two slot, Youngboy would do what he does best and continue dropping music throughout 2020. Only two months later, on April the 24th, Youngboy released yet another full-length project titled 38 AB2. This project would land at the top slot on Billboard, making it his second number one charting album. Unsurprisingly, 38 Baby 2 is riddled with violent lyrics, threats, and street-related boasts from start to finish. 2020 was shaping up to be the golden age of the gangster rapper, with the rising popularity of Chicago drill rappers like King Von and Lil Durk, as well as the rising popularity of the New York drill scene, which reached a crescendo in 2020 when breakout star Pop Smoke unfortunately lost his life in a California home invasion right at the height of his popularity. It seemed at this point that every city in America had a rapper that was going viral for their music, breaking down the local gang politics. And at this point, it was undeniable that Youngboy was the undisputed king of violent murder raps, and he wouldn't take his foot off the gas all of 2020, continuing to make music that appeared to hint at his violent past. And his next project would deliver exactly what these rap fans were asking for, and he would continue to reap the benefits. On September the 11th, 2020, Youngboy's latest release, Top, would come out, with this technically being his second studio album, despite the fact that he had dropped full-length album-quality mixtapes non-stop ever since signing his label deal with Atlantic. With his album Top, Youngboy had once again landed the Billboard number one position, with this being his third number one album in the span of just a year. And at a stretch, if you want to include Still Flexin', that's four top two albums in less than 12 months. That's one of the most impressive runs of success in rap history very nearly challenging future, who famously dropped five number one charting albums in the span of two years. Youngboy would end 2020 on top once again, holding down his spot as the most streamed artist in the US on YouTube, ahead of Lil Baby, Drake, and Bad Bunny, with a colossal 2.66 billion streams for the year. At the young age of 20, Youngboy had already cemented himself as one of the most beloved rappers in the industry. With a catalogue the size of many veteran rappers and Billboard records brewing, it would be hard to imagine where things would go next. Unfortunately, however, despite all of his mainstream success, these Billboard charting songs were still laced with violent content that continued to prod and threaten his his rap rivals back in Baton Rouge, and even from the safety of his home, Youngboy's words would travel, and back in Baton Rouge, the violence would continue to play out, where fortunately for Youngboy, eventually the authorities would manage to lock up one of his most dangerous rivals. While Youngboy was breaking records in the music industry and living the high life, albeit often on house arrest, his enemies in Baton Rouge were continuing the long-running gang conflict, with rappers and shooters affiliated with TBG, Top Boy Gorilla, relentless on their search to harm NBA or 4K Trey members, all in a quest to avenge the deaths of G Money and Boulevard Quick. One of the most prominent rappers and shooters was a TBG affiliate known as Lit Yoshi, who had already been rumoured to have played a role in the murder of Youngboy's manager Big Dump, and subsequently even released numerous songs claiming to have smoked him. Lit Yoshi was truly a loose cannon and wanted all of Baton Rouge to know just how savage he was in the streets. He appeared on the song with fellow TBG affiliate Seven Hardaway, the track Yo Hardaway, a song where he shocked fans with an outlandish lyric where he claimed, bitch you know I'm evil, I'll step on Jesus. In the very same song, Hardaway disses Youngboy by rapping, for a tray 8 baby, I got 38 cradles, and reminding him of that ill-fated shootout in Miami by rapping, you will never make your show because we might kill you for rehearsal. Members from TBG were still attacking the NBA crew and their affiliates, whether on songs or in the actual streets. According to documents later revealed in court, Lit Yoshi was connected to a February 2019 shooting at a house associated with BBG members, BBG being the crew that Youngboy's cousin Boozilla famously repped heavily before NBA became famous. Two months later, Yoshi would allegedly strike again. On the 10th of April 2019, police would be seen securing a crime scene on a stretch of Highland Road in Baton Rouge. The police would initially attempt to keep details of the incident secret. However, court documents would later reveal that Lit Yoshi was accused of performing a drive-by on that street, with four people being hit by a shooter firing an assault rifle at them outside of a convenience store. But the really crazy thing is that after these two shootings, Yoshi would still evade arrest, and only a month after this alleged quadruple attempted murder, Lit Yoshi would then be connected to the shootout targeting Youngboy outside the Trump Hotel in Miami, with an innocent bystander unfortunately losing their life. However, thankfully, authorities would eventually put together their case and take Yoshi off the streets. Four months after the Trump Hotel shooting in September 2019, Yoshi would be rapping on the song Blasting, all about hitting people with bullets so hard they'll think they're 762s. Three months after that, in December 2019, he would be arrested by authorities in connection to the April 2019 quadruple shooting as detectives revealed that both the 762 cartridge was apparently found at the scene and that the victim of the drive-by identified Yoshi as the shooter. With all of this evidence landing Lit Yoshi, real name Mayoshi Edwards, to eventually be charged with four counts of attempted murder over the incident, with police also claiming that ballistics proved that the same gun was used in the February 2019 shooting at the 3000 block of Crestwood Street, the known BBG house. The cops would describe Yoshi as a TBG enforcer, and even claim publicly that Yoshi was a suspect in numerous murders prior to these charges. But in an insane turn of fate, despite the apparent danger that Lit Yoshi clearly posed to the community, 
Baton Rouge authorities did not keep him locked up, and within a week of the public learning of his arrest, Lit Yoshi was miraculously bailed out, to which he would celebrate by dropping a music video for a new song titled First Day Out. The music video starts with a menacing intro taken from a YouTube documentary, where a computer-generated voice lists the charges that Yoshi was arrested for, with this being followed by a real-life shot of him walking out of the same jail that Youngboy has walked out of so many times before. The song itself is mostly Yoshi taunting his ops, with some incredibly incriminating lyrics given the charges, such as Yoshi telling the listeners how he still has the same Glock that made him drop, and how he still gets a drop on all the ops and continues spinning their blocks. The brazenness of the song wasn't lost on the fans, who would clown him in the comments for self-snitching, imagining his lawyer listening to the song and immediately having a heart attack. And despite the incredibly serious charges that Yoshi was facing, he would seemingly make no efforts to slow down or stop his street habits. However, while that Yoshi was causing chaos in Baton Rouge and finessing his way out of trouble, the deadly gang war would continue to play out in the streets. On the 22nd of March 2020, a shooting would occur at the family home of an NBA affiliate. 37-year-old Travis Parker, known in the streets as T-Baby or T-Main, who some have claimed was the brother-in-law of the late Big Dump, would be shot and killed in his home, while a 62-year-old woman believed to be his mother would be wounded, but fortunately survived. T-Baby was apparently a close friend of NBA 4K Trey affiliate YMM Captain, and they had been seen pictured together in slime green bandanas. People on social media would identify their close friendship, and work out that TBG rival Fredo Bang had seemingly been trolling Captain by liking his tribute post to T-Baby on Instagram. Unfortunately for Fredo Bang, exactly a week later, the tables would turn, and he would end up grieving the loss of his own friend. On Sunday the 29th of March 2020, a man was found shot to dead in front of a food mart in Baton Rouge. Police would reveal the name of the deceased man as 36-year-old Jason Nixon, with a gun violence memorial website confirming that he was a TBG affiliate who went by the name Dutch. Dutch was apparently an older and well-respected member of TBG, and he could often be seen hanging around other TBG artists like Fredo Bang, Lit Yoshi, and Boulevard Sleepy, including appearing in a music video for Lit Yoshi's song First Day Out, and TBG members would seemingly turn out to show love at his funeral. TBG rapper Seven Hardaway was a close friend of TBG Dutch, and he mourned the death of his friend by posting a photo of him on his IG story, along with the ominous song War Baby by Roddy Rich, a track which discusses the trauma of growing up in a war zone where you have to slide on the sliders. Then, a few months later, Hardaway would release a heartfelt song titled Pain, where he reminisces all about his fallen friends, including TBG Dutch. But while TBG affiliates were posting tributes to Dutch, NBA and 4K Trey affiliates were seemingly dissing him, with Baby Joe making an Instagram story making fun of TBG members whose feelings would have been hurt over Dutch's death. Also in March 2020, Lit Yoshi and NBA Michi Baby would go back and forth on social media, after it was rumored that Michi had been a target of one of Yoshi's shootings and was potentially planning to to testify. Fredo Bang and Yoshi would post an image to Instagram, apparently showing a letter that Michi had received from the authorities, informing him that he was formally listed as a victim in a shooting case and that he would need to go to court and appear as a witness. However, this letter didn't have any kind of indication that he was a cooperating witness, and it seems to me, simply put, that the feds identified him as being shot or being shot at and are simply hoping that he will turn up to court and give evidence, with Michi taking to IG himself to claim that he did receive a letter from the cops, but that he had no intention of taking the stand and that the letter wasn't even addressed to him personally. Stupid. I better go read that f***ing paper. I told on somebody. Stupid is lit. The f I, you, the paper is on Instagram. Read the f***ing paper. Stupid. The f I told on man. You don't see no statement with Lawrence Wilson back. Ain't my f***ing name. And ain't my f***ing address. So stupid. That was sound me too. Bitch, read the sh Them churn. Y'all look at this boy. Churn. Look at churn. Read. What are you saying? I told on. Oh, bitch. They was me up. It's a piece of paper. Didn't say. Then then flow. Big dog, man. Hey, that's. Then in flow. He would go on to admit that Yoshi did shoot at him and that the cops took him to jail and then sent him the letter. Shot at me and the people wanted, they sent a piece of paper to my house. They sent a piece of paper to my house. They shot at me, I ain't leave it. The police pulled up, I went to jail at night and everything, man. Stop playing with me, mate. However, that didn't stop Yoshi, who would continue to mock Michi on Instagram, even tagging him directly in a post, asking him not to come to court on him. And he would also post another story calling Michi an informant just because he received that letter and saying that they have no evidence on Yoshi, and that he's being taken to court purely because of Michi's statement and suggesting that Michi did this to get off probation himself. Get on here, talk about some fake. Yeah, stop playing. That's, that's the paper that came to your friend. Don't land. NBA Michi is a rat. You heard what I said? That ain't the paperwork saying exactly what he said, but that's the paperwork saying that you's a victim. You said something and they need you to back up on my court date because they don't have nothing on me. You know what I'm saying? They only got probation for five years, 10 years in jail, you get caught with a gun. You, you just got out, you swapped me out, huh? Yeah, you made a deal with the people and swapped me out for your probation, huh? Now, Michi would continue to deny that he was a snitch, calling out Yoshi for attention seeking, and clapping back at Fredo Bang with his own paperwork that appeared to show Fredo giving information to the police. Unfortunately for Yoshi, these statements would come back to haunt him, but even with all of this attention around the situation, he would allegedly continue to slide in the streets and shoot at his ops only a couple of weeks later. A week after the murder of TBG Dutch, on the 6th of April 2020, two masked men were caught on security camera footage shooting at somebody in a parking lot of an apartment complex in East Baton Rouge. While the intended target of the shooters is off screen, 
the camera would capture the frightful moments of an innocent bystander sitting in their car getting caught in the crossfire. One of the shooters would later turn out to be Lit Yoshi. In fact, he would appear in a social media post along with Seven Hardaway wearing the exact same outfit from the shooting surveillance footage, a black night tech hoodie and grey sweats. Idiot. While Seven Hardaway would be wearing a different hoodie, but it is clear that he also matches the build of the other shooter in the footage. This was seemingly a post laughing about the shooting incident and tagging Fredo Bang, letting him know that they were in a good mood after carrying out the shooting. One of the targets of this incident was later revealed to have been the NBA affiliate who was later convicted in connection to the murder of G-Money, NBA Lil Pap, aka Ew. DeAndre Fields. And the other target of the shooting would seemingly be Michi Baby, with later court documents pointing out that Yoshi had quite literally tried to kill the same man that he was just calling a snitch a month before on social media, which would leave one to believe that Yoshi was actively attempting to kill the witness slash victim of the previous shooting, all in an attempt to beat that charge. But ironically, he would now be on the hook for yet another crime. And it was only 10 days after that alleged shooting that Yoshi would make yet another IG Live where he accused NBA members of snitching on him and FL Dusa. I don't want to go to jail. Dusa was still sitting in jail during this time, but even behind bars, he was still stoking the conflict and dropping jail freestyles threatening his ops, and seemingly alluding to that incident back in 2016 where an NBA member got shot in the neck when Youngboy and others had tried to slide on them following the death of Boozilla. Meanwhile, on the streets, despite being firmly in the crosshairs of law enforcement, Lit Yoshi would continue to allegedly be involved in shootouts. This time, on the 4th of July, in one of the most reckless incidents seen in this story, police would respond to a drive-by shooting on the 11300 block of Greenwell Springs Road, which had apparently targeted a car in which two adults and two children were inside. All four passengers in the vehicle the vehicle would end up in hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. But the police would soon have a breakthrough, linking the rental car used in both the April and July 2020 shootings to Lit Yoshi's girlfriend, who had rented it in her real name. Oh, Yoshi would geez. be the subject of a search warrant, with cops finding an assault rifle in his car that matched the crime scene's ballistics. Detectives also found a pair of shoes at Yoshi's apartment that were used by one of the shooters in the April shooting that was all caught on camera. Yoshi's arrest would make the local news as soon as cops took him into custody. A man is behind bars tonight after police connected him to a shooting on Greenwell Springs Road that happened over the weekend. Video surveillance linked my Yoshi Edwards to that shooting. Two children and two adults were shot when a car pulled next to theirs and began shooting. When police took Edwards into custody, they actually realized he had an active arrest warrant for a shooting that happened back in April that sent one person to the hospital. Edwards is now charged with seven counts of attempted first degree murder, among other charges. So Lit Yoshi would be facing a whopping seven attempted murder charges on the 9th of July 2020. But in an absolutely insane move by the Baton Rouge judiciary, he would be given bail once again just a day later. What? With a $1.16 million bond being set, ironically, by the very same judge who kept on giving young boy chances in his attempted murder case. But hey, maybe she was a TBG fan too. But anyway, eventually it would appear as if sense prevailed in the courtrooms of Baton Rouge, because after this, another judge stepped in to place a bond holder on Yoshi, with all of his shooting cases being combined and handed to yet another judge who set Yoshi a combined bond price of 1.82 million. But this still gave him the option to bond out, apparently with the option to go on house arrest in another state, Florida where he would still be allowed to make music. However, Yoshi would be banned from making social media postings, and this is perhaps why we heard very little from Yoshi publicly during this time. But it did seem like he was indeed able to bond out and go to Florida as planned, filing a not guilty plea on August the 3rd, 2020, with his family apparently putting up the $1.82 million bond that he would need to be released, as he told the court he was indeed moving to Florida. While Yoshi was in the midst of his legal battles, Youngboy and Fredo Bang would continue to go back and forth on social media. On July the 20th, they would both post videos showing that they're outside, with Fredo driving around, possibly in Baton Rouge, along with his fellow TV TBG rapper Seven Hardaway and the rest of the TBG posse, telling the camera how his ops aren't in their own hood. We on location. With young boy replying with a story of his own, speeding in a car and telling the ops they need to catch him if they want to assassinate him. I love being rich. 
you gotta come catch me to assassinate me with your scare ass. The following month, in August 2020, Fredo Bang and Youngboy would go back and forth on social media yet again, as Fredo was teasing his upcoming album, titled In the Name of G, a tribute to his fallen TBG friend, G Money. It would soon emerge that Fredo was eyeing a September the 11th release date for the project. This, unfortunately, would also be the intended release date of Youngboy's upcoming project, Top. Fredo would post on his Instagram story, saying how it seems that they'll be both dropping their albums on the same day and calling Youngboy his son, to which Youngboy would reply with a furious video rant, along with a caption telling Fredo that he's going to catch him and shoot him, and even going as far as to tell Fredo he's not a killer and that he should go and dig all three of his dead friends up, a reference to the deaths of G-Money, Boulevard Quick, and TBG Dutch. Youngboy would also say that he's not in competition with Fredo and that Fredo wants to do everything he does, even bizarrely accusing Fredo Bang of wanting to be just like Youngboy and trying to smash every girl that Youngboy smashes, and strangely saying that if he smashed Fredo's mum, Fredo would probably try and do it too. Hey, hey, you a bum, you ass. Go dig all three of your brothers up with your scary You a Stop running from me. I ain't in no competition with you. Stop writing. You a You ain't no killer. You won't be like me. You writing all day. You a I can double back. I can any you gonna try to double back and the back of your mama. You gonna try to your mama. You a You a pimp. Fredo would soon reply with his own video, where he would act much more calm and collected than Youngboy, telling viewers to go and help Youngboy with his anger issues. Fredo would then diss Youngboy's fallen friend Dump, making fun of his weight and his death, saying that he needed an extra large coffin, as well as mocking NBA member KD, who had reportedly become paralyzed after being shot in yet another shooting in April 2019, a fact which is apparently a closely guarded secret in the NBA camp. Man, somebody go help the brother out, bro. He angry, dog. He angry. Talking about dead partners and shit. Like, I'm on this talking about fat boy in that extra, extra large coffin he got. You hear me? Or, or, or Professor X, I gotta push his half dead around. I don't, I'm not only talking about that. I said, I was say I'm gonna have you, you drop it, it's time I drop. Fredo would also address Youngboy's claim that he tries to smash all of his girls by saying it's not his fault that the girls sent him DMs. Damn, man. But it ain't my fault all your bitch in my DM. We share two. Now, now all of a sudden, I'm just everything. You I'm playing, man. Meanwhile, even with TBG's main shooter Lit Yoshi exiled to house arrest in Florida, NBA members would still live in constant danger in Baton Rouge, and there would be back-to-back -back shootings in November. At around 7pm on the 20th of November 2020, Baton Rouge police arrived to the racetrack gas station at the 8000 block of Airline Highway, amid reports of a shooting nearby. Cops would find two people shot at that gas station, with one person surviving, but the other person passing away on route to hospital. It's unclear if this incident was related to the rat feud in Baton Rouge, but what happened next absolutely was. The following day, at around 11.30pm on November the 21st, 2020, at the Z Quick Mart gas station store on Hooper, Baton Rouge police would report shooting where the victim had returned to gunfire and survived, with fans capturing a heavy police presence at the location immediately after reports. Over the following days, hip-hop news media would report the shooting of a prominent NBA member, Big B, and it would later be reported that Big B was in the hospital after taking a shot to the leg. And after some time, he would begin to be seen on social media showing off his injuries and mobility aids, even posting a picture to Instagram supposedly at the Z Quick Mart gas station, pump number 8, where he was apparently found after being shot. Interestingly, after the shooting, reports would also circulate suggesting that the person who shot him was now dead. However, it was unclear exactly who this supposed deceased shooter was. It seemed logical that perhaps the man at the scene who was shot when Big B was returning fire was the original shooter who may have been hit. Conversely, according to one wild fan theory, an apparent revenge attack had happened all the way in Houston, citing a double shooting at a North Houston motel, the Green Chase Inn, on November the 21st where a man was found dead. That would turn out to be false, however, as that man was found dead at 9pm the same night, three and a half hours before Big B was actually shot. I actually believe that people are confusing the November the 20th gas station shooting the day before Big B got shot, which as far as I'm aware is completely unrelated to the Big B situation, and actually was related to a home invasion where somebody got killed in self-defense, also not related to this incident. And Big B himself would even come out to deny having killed the person who shot him in a Fuchsia's TV interview. You got shot in the leg, right? Yeah. The gas station. I, I was doing my research, it said that the, the, I guess the person that, uh, that shot at you, was like, he died. Is that true? Nah, but people, they just making stories and all kinds of things. Regardless of whether or not revenge was carried out, this was clearly a major incident that affected the NBA camp, and this incident would soon make its way to music. Later on, in the song Soul Snatchers that was released in June 2022, Big B raps how he didn't have time to aim, but still shot back when he was shot at, which many people believe is a reference to this incident. Youngboy would also rap in his song Lost Soul Survivor, released in August 2020, how someone shot his brother five times, but he didn't die, and in fact shot back. Only a few weeks after Big B getting shot, in December 2020, TBG rapper Seven Hardaway would come out with a diss track titled Treason, seemingly aimed at NBA, and specifically Youngboy himself. Hardaway begins the song by rapping about Youngboy Youngboy's early days, and how he used to coach him when Youngboy was still friendly with TPG. Then, he expresses his disappointment at Youngboy's beefs with Floyd Mayweather and Jay Prince, calling him stupid and illiterate, while also telling how NBA are always dissing TPG, but are hiding when Hardaway and Lit Yoshi come out into the streets, and going on later in the song to diss Youngboy's use of autotune, lack of street cred, and his hunger for clout. Meanwhile, back in Miami, videos of Lit Yoshi enjoying life on house arrest would eventually make their way to vlogs on his YouTube channel, 
documenting the months that he spent on house arrest, where he would openly shout out his gang as he prepared to spend big money on his case and telling the world that house arrest ain't stopping anything. TVG Gorilla Gang, bang biz. Court the day, it's up at the court. I should be hearing good news. We got the cracks, they think I'm broke, man. The house arrest shit ain't stopping. Boy. And clearly, Lit Yoshi had become a big fan of Chicago rappers King Von and Lil Durk, rapping some of Von's most violent lyrics whilst walking around his house. Of course, no beef. We ain't to it till you die. Real street. At your funeral, I might just slide. Rest in peace. You know I know. My life right the photo. And also singing along to Lil Durk lyrics about shootings on the way to court. Yoshi's vlog would show him preparing for court, with him apparently highly confident of the judge giving him even more freedoms, telling viewers how he had been on his best behavior for about three months now, and complaining that staying in the house doesn't fit him as he likes to move around. TBG really got gonna go to court. Everything should be looking good, boy. I've been that form. I ain't worried about nothing in my city. You know what's I've been good for three months, baby. They gotta let me do something. Been killing me, boy. I've been I've been stuck in the house two and a half months, man. I couldn't even leave out there. That ain't yo yo, boy. Y'all know yo yo like to move around, bro. Yoshi would be boastful about getting out on bail during this time, claiming that he felt like a free man already, and that the judge just needed to put the icing on the cake. Yeah, man, it feel good to ride back around, man. I feel I feel like a free man again. All I need is the judge to put the icing on the cake, baby. You hear him saying my cake like anime. Now. This bravado turned out to be misplaced. Mm. It would turn out that at this hearing in November 2020, the judge actually admonished Yoshi for having too much fun on bail, even going as far as to claim that he was treating his house arrest as a paid vacation since Yoshi was amongst friends, having fun, and making music. Wow. With the district attorney complaining that Yoshi was violating curfew by moving around Miami late at night on jet skis and relaxing on the beach. As a punishment, his curfew was extended from starting from 8 p.m. to starting at 6 p.m. and running to 6 a.m. the next day, and telling him specifically no more jet skis or visits to glitzy Miami beauty spots like Biscayne Bay and South Beach. Yeah. And even in his vlog, we would soon see a stressed out Yoshi after court, where he claimed that they tried to keep him locked up in court and that his situation might not be improving. They almost sent my s back to jail. What? Like that. Talk, just talking about stupid s misunderstood in last court nation. Man, boy, I thought I wasn't about to leave out there. And I, I still can't do nothing, though. I still can't do nothing. They had me in that field about four hours. Steve, I thought I wasn't coming out there. I thought they was talking. I thought everything was going to go better than what it would, did, but it didn't. <laughs> Sit back again. Yoshi would even open up, saying that prosecutors had actively tried to completely revoke his bond, with fellow TBG rapper Seven Hardaway trying to put a positive spin on things, saying that that's not a problem because they got money and they could put up another $2 million bail. They're trying to revoke my bond. I ain't even got a chance to talk about me back working. You heard me? Look, they're trying to revoke my bond, but so they we got money. On so, you know, look. <laughs> I don't know, want two million out of bun. Which I want another two million? Yeah, yeah. No money. No, 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 no. money. After being briefly humbled by almost losing his house arrest privileges, in time, Yoshi would revert back to his cocky attitude, perhaps as a result of that big stack of money truly going to his head. Yoshi would continue to record and release music during this stint on house arrest, with lyrics giving us a peek into his mental state during this period. In the song Get Back, released late in December 2020, Yoshi showed no signs of giving up his violent lifestyle, a track coming laced with pointed lyrics about dead op boys and taunting his ops, asking what they're going to do about it. An insane lyric when you can the fact that this guy seems to repeatedly target his ops with no care to the innocent people or children who get in the way, and the police just can't seem to keep him behind bars. In the song Bust Down, released 5th of February 2021, Yoshi tells how some of his friends did him wrong during his house arrest, rapping that some of them thought it was over for him, but they got it wrong because he's still making lots of money on house arrest. He also threatens to put a $10,000 bounty on someone's head, just like he did to their brother. Ironically, it would seem that around the times Yoshi would be at his most brazen, the courts would deliver bad news in his case. 20 days after that song about putting money on people's heads, the judge in his upcoming case would deliver yet another devastating station blow to his defense by ruling that the jury would be allowed to hear evidence about his alleged involvement in the Miami hotel incident that targeted young boy in 2019. And this announcement would come with numerous revelations that spelled disaster for Yoshi's case. Allegedly, phone records from the time of the shooting in Miami gave investigators lit Yoshi's approximate cell phone location, which turned out to be on the same street as the Trump hotel where young boy was shot mm. and an innocent man died. In fact, Yoshi was allegedly on the phone to an unspecified incarcerated TBG member who was in jail while at the location of the shooting. Not only that, but prosecutors would also use his Instagram lives against him, where he had publicly claimed that NBA members had ratted on him in the June 2019 drive-by shooting case. But even more crazy than that is the fact that in spite of all of the mounting evidence against him, Yoshi would continue dropping music that continued to incriminate him. In his song Together, released on July the 16th, 2021, Yoshi would take the self-incrimination to a whole new level, mm. rapping that his ops are going to die together and alluding to doing a drive-by shooting, saying that he will pull up next to his ops' car and try and make them fly. Even going as far as to say he doesn't care if his ops are with their families, he will shoot them wherever. Yoshi also raps what about catching idiot. someone slipping and shooting him and then killing a couple more people. Outrageous lyrics when you consider the fact that at the time this release, he was on house arrest for numerous shootings, including a car-to-car -car drive by that targeted a family with two children in the car. Ultimately, it would seem that finally, the judge, prosecutors, and police had eventually seen enough, and Yoshi's stint on house arrest in his plush South Florida home would come to an end on the 22nd of July, 2021. While
while Lit Yoshi was staying at TBG label mate Fredo Banks' house, federal agents would suddenly burst in using smoke bombs, assault rifles, and tactical gear, with cops presenting outstanding warrants in Baton Rouge for both Fredo Bang and Lit Yoshi, arresting them both. This would apparently be the result of probation violations, as the terms of Yoshi's release stated that he wasn't allowed to appear in music videos, post on social media, or possess firearms. And Fredo Bang was also on probation for pleading guilty to a weapons charge relating to a 2015 shooting in Baton Rouge. Unfortunately for Fredo Bang, during the raid, guns were also found inside his home, along with a stolen car parked outside. And the presence of these firearms would mean big trouble for Yoshi too. Just days after the raid, authorities would announce that they were adding another attempted murder charge to his case, the April 2020 shooting, where he had allegedly tried to kill NBA Pat, an NBA Michi baby, the month after accusing him of snitching on him. Things had turned for Yoshi, and it would only get worse from here. His bond was officially revoked by a Baton Rouge judge on September the 9th, 2021, with federal agents who conducted the raid testifying that five guns, ammunition, and a bulletproof vest had all been found in Fredo's house while Yoshi was there. And Yoshi's March 2020 social media posts calling the victims of one of these shootings NBA Michi a snitch was also used against him. This was a dumb move, because calling the victim a snitch publicly is basically an admission that you in fact did the crime. Right. In light of all of this damning evidence, Yoshi's team were apparently working on a strategy of trying to finesse him out of jail on bail once again, but that plan would ultimately fall flat when it was revealed in court that Yoshi's DNA was found on a gun that was recovered in the July raid. Apparently this DNA evidence would link Yoshi directly to the shootings that he was being investigated for, which meant that he would have absolutely no chance of making bail again, and meaning that he'd be sat behind bars awaiting trial rather than living it up in Miami. Eventually, in July 2022, Lit Yoshi pleaded guilty to charges connected to two shootings in 2019 and 2020. And as a result, Yoshi was sentenced to face 15 years in prison at a hard labor facility, followed by three years of active parole. Funnily enough though, a month later, Yoshi would claim to have been tricked by prosecutors and launching a bid to change his plea from guilty back to not guilty, arguing that his lawyer never told him that he would get 15 years for accepting the guilty plea, suggesting that he was only expecting to get six and a half. Would you think would During happen? negotiations, his lawyer had actually been suspended from practicing law. It was a long shot, but it was the best that Yoshi could hope for. And while things were getting very serious for Yoshi behind bars, Hardaway was still upping the ante on the war back in Baton Rouge. In August 2022, he released an EP titled Transition, where he would take numerous shots against Youngboy, NBA, and 4K Trey. In the song Sinister, Hardaway disses Youngboy, saying that while his albums are going number one, his friends back in Baton Rouge are getting killed. After hearing about these lyrics, Big B would actually comment, who died? Insinuating that nobody from their side had been killed recently. The following month, unfortunately, someone would indeed lose their life, but it wouldn't be an NBA member. Because on the night of Tuesday, the 20th of September 2022. At around 8pm, Seven Hardaway, real name Stanley Wright, was in the parking lot of the building where he lived, the Sherwood Place apartment complex in Baton Rouge. Here, he was approached by unknown assailants who shot him from close range, leaving him on the pavement where he would ultimately lose his life, being laid to rest just days later where he would be seen surrounded by TBG members. Police were quick to determine that this homicide was gang-related and specifically targeted Seven for his affiliations to TBG and connection to Lit Yoshi. With that in mind, it was no surprise what happened next. TBG's enemies would soon begin commenting on Hardaway's death on social media. 4K Trey affiliates would be seen on IG Live laughing and saying that they were smoking on number seven. We got them lagging. Do I pick? What do I pick? And on a dead, not a top of team. You got a chance to say it to their face. Say it with your chest. Huh? They was dissing on it. And of course, his friends would make posts hinting at future get back. However, despite being quick to determine the death of Hardaway as gang related, the Baton Rouge police once again have struggled to find the killer, making his death yet another devastating statistic of Baton Rouge's out of control gang war. And speaking of numbers, back in prison, the last minute attempt to backtrack on his guilty plea proved to be an enormous failure for Lit Yoshi. Mm. And in May 2023, Yoshi's bid to change his plea was officially rejected, leaving him set to serve the full 15 years of hard labor, essentially leaving the streets of Baton Rouge and Miami for the next 15 years just a little bit safer for adults and children alike. I think it's important here just to reiterate the fact that there is nothing glamorous about this gangbanging lifestyle. Lit Yoshi got what he deserved. He was a man who, despite having a musical talent, was primarily focused on continuing this gang war and shooting at his rivals. Uh -huh. He had no remorse for the innocent men, women, or children who got in the way. And he's frankly a deplorable human being who absolutely deserves to be taken off the streets for 15 years because of the things he did. But that doesn't mean that his ops aren't without blame either. But there's no way of looking at it. Lit Yoshi was clearly a danger to society and absolutely should have been put away sooner. However, his absence from the gang war wouldn't mean bliss or safety for Baton Rouge's most famous rap crew. In fact, it would be the very opposite, as while TBG's most feared shooter was finally facing the legal repercussions of his reckless actions, a whole other group of reckless gangsters from Chicago would soon enter the picture, huh. starting a beef with Youngboy that he never even wanted to be part of. But in this case, this beef was very personal, because it involved the mother of one of Youngboy's many children, and ultimately would wind up becoming another deadly feud that would claim the lives of people on both sides. Another one, gang? Despite his turbulent life in the streets, family has always been important to Youngboy. Hold on, yo. Before we continue... I gotta remind y'all, like this video, my video, I'm, uh, I originally mean his video, like, like his video, he put mad work into it, like, this is such a good documentary, go over there and like the video, yo, and then you can like my video too, you can subscribe to me too, that would be great, 
um i hope you love the drawing as it's coming out like i said the, the phone died it's charging right now but this is how it looking Yeah, that's how it's looking so far. Let me see something. Tell me if that look good. Yeah. All right, let's keep it going, gang. Despite growing up with an unstable home life, he always found friends to call his brothers and older figures to nurture him, whether his biological mother Sharonda, his grandmother who raised him like a mother, or his best friend OG3's mother who took him in as one of her own. With that in mind, it's no surprise that since becoming a father at the young age of 16, Youngboy has taken his family obligations very seriously. And let me tell you, it's ended up being one big family. Despite his young age, Youngboy has had quite the love life, and at the age of 23, he has been reported as having as many as 11 children. However, that might not be entirely accurate. So I actually did a full breakdown on Youngboy's family tree, his dating history, and the timeline of when he had all of his children. But once again, I didn't have enough time in this YouTube version to fit it all in. So if you want to see that, check out the uncut version of the video on Patreon, or the extended version of this chapter that's going to go up on my third channel, Trap Law Clips, soon. All in all, Youngboy's relationship history has been a roller coaster ride that has left him with a large family of at least 10 biological children to eight different baby mothers. Youngboy's enormous family would provide him with many blessings and a lot of love at home, but it would also leave him with a lot of vulnerabilities to his enemies. With so many people to look after and look out for, it wouldn't be surprising that his opposition might try and use some of those closest to him to attack him. Ultimately, it was one particular relationship that would end up forever altering not just the lives of Youngboy and his partner, but also the lives of the people around him, with one of the mothers of his children ultimately ending up being used as a pawn in a rap beef between Youngboy and Chicago drill rapper King Von, with Janir's involvement in the beef being the first escalation in a series of unfortunate events which would ultimately end in numerous people losing their lives in front of millions of people. If you watched my recent video, King Von, Rap's First Serial Killer, then you'll already know about the dark past of Chicago rapper King Von. But in case you didn't, let me get you up to speed. King Von is a rapper hailing from Chicago, more specifically, the Parkway Gardens Housing Project, better known as Oba. This housing development is famous for its association with the pioneer of Chicago drill music, Chief Keef, the teenage rap phenomenon who brought Chicago drill music to the mainstream of rap. With his raps all about the violent gang wars playing out in Chicago, giving many all over the world their first look at gang life in America's most dangerous city. But back in 2012, when Chief Keef was making music all about the gang wars in his city, King Von was really living those lyrics. Von was a prominent member of the Black Disciples Street Gang, specifically the set hailing from Oblock, who were engaged in a bitter war with their rivals, a group of gangster disciples from 63rd. In my previous video about King Von, I reviewed King Von's rumored involvement in as many as seven gang-related murders between 2012 and 2014, and I made the argument that he is in fact a serial killer by FBI's own definition of the term, due to the fact that he appeared to claim responsibility for more than three murders with more than a month's time span between them. But it wasn't just that that I believe made Von a serial killer, it's the fact that even after beating a murder charge in 2017, he would be released released from jail, at which point he would partner with his childhood friend and prominent Chicago drill rapper Lil Durk, launching his very own rap career. Not only using his music to boast about and drop clues concerning the at least seven murders he was associated with, but he would allegedly use the money he made rapping about these murders to continue to have people killed, with Von taking a great deal of personal gratification from being known all over the world for getting away with this series of gruesome murders. And with his jaw-dropping raps all about specific murders that he had been associated with over the years, rap and true crime fans all over the world flocked to Von's music, with intense debate taking place over whether or not he truly was the multiple murderer he claimed to be in his songs. Over the course of 2019 and 2020, King Von would release a string of well-received songs that made him an infamous figure in the rap world, most notably his crazy story series of songs where he used lyrics to tell a vivid story of life in the streets, all about his attempts to rob people, getting in shootouts, and using women to set up his ops to get killed. One of Von's biggest- Hey gang, how many of y'all think NBA Youngboy watching this video right now? career moments came in 2020, when he released his song Took Her to the O. This storytelling song painted a picture of Von using a woman to set up and kill real-life rival rapper of his, FBG Duck. The music video would even depict Von shooting FBG Duck and leaving him dead on the ground. Then, in an eerie turn of events, the real-life FBG Duck would be shot dead in the middle of a busy Chicago street by a gang of masked men only months after this video was released. Took Her to the O would become one of King Von's biggest hits, sitting in a catalogue of other big songs and features with millions of views and streams. By mid-2020, King Von was a multi-millionaire rapper with a bright future and one of the biggest buzzes in the rap game. But behind the scenes, there was seemingly tension brewing between him and Youngboy. 
who at the time, in mid-2020, was the undisputed king of street rap, having dropped a string of chart-topping projects. Now, it's unclear exactly where the beef between Von and Youngboy's crew started, but it likely all had something to do with Von's friend and mentor, Chicago rapper Lil Durk. Lil Durk and Youngboy actually collaborated on a November 2017 track called My Side, and it's believed that Lil Durk had even tried to sign Youngboy back in 2017, with this being revealed on the intro to Youngboy's song GG on AI Youngboy, where he raps, tell OTF I do not sign, NBA, that be my gang. As we now know, Youngboy went on to sign a lucrative multi-million dollar deal with Atlantic. Ultimately, signing to Lil Durk, let's face it, in 2017 would not have been a great career move. At that point, while he was a respected artist in the streets of Chicago, Lil Durk's biggest career achievement was his 2015 Remember My Name album, which peaked at 14 on the Billboard albums chart. Lil Durk had never had a song on the charts at this point, and by the end of 2017, Youngboy had surpassed Durk's chart record with three songs on the Billboard Hot 100 and three projects on Billboard's 200 albums charts. In many ways, Youngboy dodged a bullet by not signing with Durk and quickly surpassed him in every way. Lil Durk's career was essentially floundering until King Von came out of jail and re-energized it. Durk's only song on Billboard before 2020 was an appearance on a 2018 Lil Baby and Ghana track off White Velo. But by the end of 2019, Lil Durk had had seven projects land on the Billboard 200 albums charts. But in the time since turning Durk's offer down, Youngboy had amassed 17 songs charting on the Billboard Hot 100 and 13 projects charting on Billboard's 200 albums chart. While Youngboy had seemingly turned down the chance to align himself with Durk and his OTF collective, he had built up a legacy in his own right. And at this point, there was seemingly no beef with them. In 2018, Lil Durk would be seen popping up in an IG Live with Youngboy, where things seemed cool between them. Also in 2018, Lil Durk would continue his hunt for other up-and-coming street rappers to align himself with and potentially sign to his label. Another up-and-comer that Lil Durk discovered early was Savannah Street superstar Quando Rondo, who after blowing up with his track I Remember, featuring Atlanta legend and close friend of Lil Durk's Lil Baby, would go on to collaborate with Durk on the song Other Side, which appeared on Quando's first commercial mixtape, Life Before Fame. In fact, Quando and his team were clearly big fans of Durk, with Quando's cousin and close friend Lil Pab tweeting his love of Lil Durk's song This Ain't What You Want way back in 2013, saying that this song is better than everything. After the success of his first major single and mixtape, the rap industry was buzzing around Quando Rondo, and there would be intense competition between labels trying to sign him. But he would eventually catch the attention of fellow singing gangster rapper Youngboy, who commented on his video asking Quando for his number. And he commented on the video and wanted my number and stuff. Youngboy and Quando would connect and hit it off behind the scenes. And in June 2018, Quando would officially sign to Youngboy's label, Never Broke Again, announcing it to Instagram with a post attracting congratulatory replies from NBA heavy hitters. And days later, Quando would be seen on stage with Youngboy and the NBA crew, where he received his NBA chain from OG3 and throws up rolling 60 crit gang signs for the crown. <laughs> You mind if I wild all right quick though? Bang on one more time for Hold on, hold on, I gotta get this on camera. Everybody gotta scream neighborhood one time, one time. Yo, what? On the count of three, everybody scream neighborhood. One, two, three. Eventually, Quando ends up appearing on three of four tracks on Youngboy's four-track Four Loyalty EP. However, once again, despite how things played out, it didn't seem from the outset that there was any kind of tension between Dirk, Youngboy, and Quando. Dirk would even name Quando as one of the artists he was spending a lot of time in the studio with in a 2018 XXL interview. Funnily enough, Quando also shouted out Lil Dirk in two tracks on his 2019 mixtape From the Neighborhood to the Stage. Rapping in Dope Boy Dreams that he signed to the streets three times, He Feels Like Dirk, referencing Lil Dirk's Signed to the Streets mixtape series, and rapping on the song My Section that Dirk had told him to treat the rap game like the drug game. Perhaps an indication that Dirk had been giving Quando advice on how to navigate the industry before he signed to NBA. At the end of March 2019, Quando would actually be seen backstage with Lil Dirk's newest artist, King Von, wearing a matching outfit and hyping King Von up by dissing his ops from 63rd in Chicago. I'm saying no 63rd, dirty. I'm talking man. I'm in August 2019, Lil Durk puts out a list of his 50 greatest rappers, and both Youngboy and Quando Rondo are on that list. Durk would capture that image, saying that these rappers are people that changed the culture. And I would argue in many ways that Lil Durk was clearly inspired by Quando and Youngboy's style of gangster pain music. And arguably, Durk's career revival in 2019 and 2020 was helped massively by the popularity of the type of auto-tuned gangster rap singing that Youngboy was most known for. Durk and Quando would seemingly remain friends into the start of 2020, with Durk even appearing on Quando's song, Safest, even shouting him out as one of his favorite rappers. However, it would seem that somewhere in 2020, things would change, and that would all have something to do with King Von. Despite playing nice backstage with Quando in March 2019, a month before, Bro, Von he was this young boy in front of a fan on IG Live. Von was just, uh, treacherous, bro. Damn, 
Petty, yeah. Trish, 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 Ron would continue to disrespect Youngboy publicly following this, a month later, in March taking to social media to say that Youngboy's music is full of lies, and that he's not a real gangster like he says he is in his music. Youngboy talking about on this song, bro. What? You talking crazy on this song. Oh yeah? He ain't even like that. Oh! On this song. Cap. You got cap in your raps. Go straight boss, don't hit the white lady. You got cap in your hey. raps. Now, this is interesting because it says to me that perhaps Vaughn's problem with Youngboy is that he felt he wasn't worthy of his reputation. We've already discussed Youngboy's numerous lyrics over the years where he appears to infer that he's killed over seven people. However, this supposed body count has been heavily doubted and debated, with it really being believed that when Youngboy says he has bodies, he's really referring to the many people around him who have lost their lives over the years. Or at a push, that Youngboy is perhaps responsible for these killings through either paying assassins to kill for him, or simply the fact that these people end up getting killed when they try and beat with him. The idea that Youngboy has seven or more bodies is ambiguous, and shrouded in mystery and misdirection. However, when it comes to King Von, the situation is the complete opposite. King Von has rapped repeatedly that he has seven bodies, and in my video, King Von Raps First Serial Killer, you can quite easily line up King Von's lyrics and tweets with real reported murders in Chicago, along with his own arrest records, to make a very compelling case that Von did indeed personally murder at least seven people. Von was a killer, and he wanted everyone in the rap industry to know it. And perhaps he was upset at the idea that a man much younger and richer and more successful than him could reach the very top of the gangster rap game without demonstrating that he is truly capable of committing murder firsthand, with Von seemingly deciding that the fastest way to the top of the rap game would be to punk young boy and expose him as a fake killer, proving to the rap game and the world at large that Von had personally committed the murders like he rapped about, unlike Youngboy, and therefore Von felt he was more worthy of the top spot than Youngboy. But initially this beef was just petty sneak disses being sent from Von. When Youngboy was released from jail in August 2019, after he got caught up in the Trump Hotel shooting that violated his probation, Von would welcome him home with a snarky tweet that ended calling him ugly. And over the course of the next year, Von would even be seen copying Youngboy's mannerisms and beginning to quote him during his Instagram lives. Boy, is my grandma raising me, you me? You know I What up? My grandma raised me. No, I know. But Whether there was any real beef between OTF and NBA at the time is unclear, but the two crews were clearly Isn't that contested. Psychotic? In October 2019, when DJ Academics would claim that Youngboy was the realest street rapper to appear since the original Chicago drill scene, Dirk would comment on the post proposing that King Von was even realer than Youngboy. Some months later, in February 2020, Von seemed to indicate on Twitter that he and Youngboy had a song together, telling Youngboy that he should drop it and stop holding the song so close to his chest. At some point following this, Von would even be seen on an IG Live suggesting that he likes Youngboy and that Youngboy probably has too much going on with his case to reply to him. They do got a lot of going on. You just can't be nobody when they got all this going on. You trying to get rich? They trying to. I don't know what they got going on. It's unclear exactly where this beef between Von and Youngboy and Kondo really started, but two people would seemingly play a major role in the feud escalating. Youngboy's ex-girlfriend and the mother to his fourth child, Jania, and King Von's ex-girlfriend, female rapper, Asian Doll. The relationship between Von and Asian would be revealed to the world in an interview with Lil Durk in early 2019. King Von, I was saying he in a relationship too. Yeah. Shout, shout out Asian Doll. Okay. Yeah, he going, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you ever hear man? <laughs> Who's you? He looking at you like, come on, man. Von appeared to fall deeply in love with Asian Doll. Combine this with his reputation as a prolific killer in the Chicago gang war, and you have a recipe for disaster. Von would tweet saying that he would be willing to beat anyone up who messed with Asian Doll. And he apparently beat a man senseless for calling her a bitch in the studio. Asian <laughs> reads my hair like this. <laughs> Somebody called my girlfriend a bitch yesterday. You ain't gonna smack one of them out of his. Tell him what happened to my hand, bro. Rose over beat his. Call my girlfriend. Rose, up. Woke him back up. Oh, thank you. I'm looking for a time. Why, bro? See, he already left. Where you go? Hey, everybody. I'm doing like y'all for the overdo it. I'm not gonna do Asian would appreciate Von's protection, calling him her bodyguard on Twitter, with Von himself saying that he wishes she wasn't a rapper so that he could keep her at home and protect her, saying that he doesn't trust her around other rappers. But isn't it nice to have somebody in the same industry as you? No, that ain't, I'd rather have. You know, I wish you, you know, I can't say I wish you wasn't a rapper or nothing like that, but it'd be better if I knew that she's at the house instead of going around <laughs> all these people that ain't around and, damn, I what's going on? Now I'm just thinking, are like, you, damn, you doing? Why she answering the phone? And that's how she be saying. She done the same thing. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, I wish my was at the damn house. Yeah. Oh, so you it's been times when mm -hmm. you didn't like it. She had to work with him. I'm not gonna say nothing because you know you gotta be. Like, like I gotta, you gotta be, be for sure with yourself, yeah. man. I know I'm that. So. Von was clearly very possessive about Asian Doll, even tweeting that he would kill somebody for messing with her. However, things would eventually get complicated between Von and Asian, and during the summer of 2020, their relationship appeared to go through an on and off stage, where Von would sometimes indicate on social media that the couple had broken up, 
while at other times they seemed to be back together. Von was apparently a single man again, and after his high-profile relationship with fellow industry rapper and social media star Asian Doll, he would be looking to get into a new entanglement that might grab some headlines. But his next move would be incredibly bold, and seemingly out of nowhere, Von would make a declaration of war against Youngboy. In mid-August, Von would post a cryptic tweet saying that he had just made a hit song with a female that people won't believe and that it was going to be crazy. That very same day, images would surface online, showing Von spending private time with none other than Jania, the mother of Youngboy's fourth child. And later, speculation would begin to swirl off the back of tweets made by Von and his sister Kayla that Von and Jania might have even created a sex tape during their time together. And these rumors would later be strengthened by leaked DMs from an alleged inside source who claimed that Von and Jania had indeed slept together, not recorded music. Rumors that Von would later seemingly confirm in the song Rose Gold with PNB Rock, where he seems to suggest that somebody's baby mother was bad in bed. However, Jania would deny the rumors, saying that they had in fact just made music together so that she can make money for her son. We walked to the table to play the little game after my studio session and I went home. That's it. Y'all trying to make stories out of nothing else. That um, like I said, I don't quit no I've been working. We have a song coming out. Y'all wasn't supposed to know, but it is what it is now. We have a song coming out. So when the song come out, y'all quit it. Just know it's hard as you feel me. I'm just trying to get my money to take care of my son. <laughs> Period. Her claims would also be supported by leaked DMs, this time from Von, who alleged that he was just trying to make Asian Doll mad and jealous. However, Asian Doll would then challenge Jania's claims, claiming that she had actually seen romantic DMs between Von and Jania. Now I've seen it in the DMs, I've been seeing none of this not a surprise. So all that song Whatever the truth may be, this certainly wasn't the first time that Junior had been rumored to have had relations with Youngboy's enemies, as she had previously been connected to both Fredo Bang and Jay the Young. Furthermore, leaked DMs from Youngboy's future wife Jazlyn would seem to suggest that Youngboy was still hooking up with Junior while she was running around with Von. Nevertheless, despite Youngboy's relationship with Junior officially being over at this point, he took this rumored hookup between Von and Junior as a very personal attack from Von. And the following day, Youngboy would respond, posting a picture of him and his son holding stacks of cash, along with a caption saying that since Von likes to troll so much, he's going to make sure that when his son grows up, he smashes Von's daughter. Now, around the same time, for reasons that are still largely unknown, Von's childhood friend and fellow Chirac savage Lil Reese decided to join the beef by tweeting his intentions to beat up Youngboy's artist Quando Rondo, to which Quando would reply, saying that Reese won't do anything. Man, I ain't gonna do nothing to me. <laughs> you no academics. Man, you don't deserve to live no more, bit, bro. I hope you on God. <laughs> At this point, seemingly out of nowhere, suddenly Youngboy and Quando were beefing with Lil Durk, King Von, and Lil Reese, three of the most famous and respected rappers ever to come out of Chicago. War had now been declared, and things were about to escalate. That same day, Youngboy would also go live while playing an unreleased song. This song would later turn out to be the murder anthem, Dead Trolls, with Youngboy addressing Von, saying that he wants to see him, and saying that he shouldn't come fishing around his lake, which kind of suggests that Von used the pictures with Jania to bait Youngboy into beefing him. In the next lyric, Youngboy makes the wild claim to have seven bodies in his hometown, just like Von was rumored to have seven bodies in Chicago, before then going on to threaten to shoot somebody from out of town as soon as they land and seemingly disengineer for messing with his ops for money. Youngboy would also rap that his ops are mad that they can't get a feature from him, perhaps a hint to a potentially uncleared collaboration between the two artists being held back by Youngboy as one of Von's earlier tweets seemed to suggest. And in the song's outro, Youngboy makes an interesting reference to the Chicago basketball legend D. Rose, who had a phenomenal start to his career in his hometown team Chicago Bulls, but later went through difficult times in other cities and teams due to injuries. A possible reference to the fact that Lil Durk and Von had moved out of Chicago to Atlanta at this point in their careers, as well as the fact that they famously were friends with another gang member from Chicago who went by the nickname D. Rose. Now, fans' reaction to this song was mixed, with some arguing that it was dedicated to the numerous other enemies that Youngboy had made in the rap game and the streets over the years, while others would argue that the entire song was all about King Von. Some would even later claim that the song had actually predicted King Von's death, as Youngboy raps about planning on killing someone in Atlanta, while also claiming that he will do it after their show where their next one is at. And while that certainly seems far-fetched and more like a creepy coincidence, what isn't a coincidence is the fact that Youngboy decided to drop this snippet right after Von had been seen photographed with the mother of his child. A day later, Von tweets claiming not to have a girlfriend and to be focusing on his career, but it seems that Von had paid attention to Youngboy, because just a few days after the snippet of Dead Trolls hit the internet, Von would drop a snippet of his own, a track titled Too Real, a song where he raps that he will expose someone and that he's going to kill someone because of a rap beef. About a month later in September, Von would address the beef with Youngboy during an IG Live, saying that he doesn't want beef over insignificant things and with people from other states, but if he gets the feeling that someone doesn't like him, he really doesn't even need a reason to escalate things. Now, look, look, everybody, I ain't a tour with nobody, him. Tour the people I've been having in the streets, you know what I'm saying? But I, I won't be a tour with nobody from all in another town. No reason, like you gotta be a tour with somebody for a reason. Just know we a tour, we a tour gang, okay? Nah, 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 you see what I'm saying? I'm the type, I don't gotta know why we a tour or nothing. I ain't, you only gotta tell me why you don't like me. Don't even tell me why you don't like me. I don't even care. Just let me know you don't like me. You see what I'm saying? Let me know. Right, you don't like me? That's what it is. Let me know. I'm like, right, you know what I'm saying? Let me know. But I'm so gangster that I don't need a reason. I don't, it don't gotta be no reason. We can be into it. Like, I don't care. It don't gotta be a reason, for real. 
I, I'm gonna tell people, I don't gotta be no I don't know why. I don't care why. But it can be that, you see what I'm saying? But I, I like to know why we into it. I like to, I, I need to, cause I don't, ain't no goofy. I ain't go. And then I play hard, I play. I ain't trying to lose, I ain't, yeah, I can't lose. to so nobody on, oh, lose to who? Who? Who know it? Who I'ma lose to? Tell him, you've been knowing me, Louis. So don't I go hard anything I do? Tell him, you you the chain. How you get a chain in your neck, Louis? Later in September, after having recently reiterated that he wasn't looking for relationships, but was open for something more casual, Von and his sister Kayla were spotted at a club with Jania again, and with Kayla even posting their night on social media, calling Jania her sis. This would prompt Asian Doll to respond to the situation between her and Von during an IG Live in October, where she would deny that Von had embarrassed her by messing with Jania, and saying that if Von is single, his actions have nothing to do with her. Nobody embarrassed me, gang. Y'all need to get off my shit like Nobody embarrassed me. Nobody. It's nothing nobody did to embarrass me. I was not embarrassed. Mad about a tweet like y'all like dude don't even know you and clown so y'all always get left for me. Smack I want you bitch for me. You crazy bitch. I don't get no I'm a real bitch at the end of the day. Like I said, you would never see me sweat. You would never see me go outside behind nobody. I'm gonna pull you best friend with anybody. Mind your business when I'm single, like they don't have nothing to do with me. I'm not stressing that I'm not tweeting up nothing. They don't have to do with me, gang. Nothing. When somebody's single, so what? What they do? I don't get no fuck. That's what y'all problem. However, not much long after, Von would go live with Asian, and the two appeared to be on friendly terms. This was a confusing situation, but perhaps in the words of the great Juicy J, these hoes were for everybody. And in October, King Von would release a song speaking on the situation in the same sentiment. Von would begin to promote his new song called Mine Too, where Von essentially raps, I ain't finna beef about girls with someone, because their girl is mine too. Clearly he's talking about Jania here, and he appeared to throw direct shots at Youngboy on the song too, rapping about having beef in NOLA, or Louisiana, where Youngboy is from, and saying that somebody acts gangster on the mic, but now Von wants to see if he is really gangster in real life. Ironically though, a day after this song came out, Von would also tweet that once someone has slept with his girl, he doesn't want her anymore. Because as it turned out, Youngboy may have given Von a taste of his own medicine by hooking up with Asian Doll around this time. In October 2020, after the rumored breakup with Von, Asian Doll tweets saying that she only dates killers with three bodies or more. Now, considering the fact that Youngboy just released his King Von diss song, Dead Trolls, where he rapped that he was responsible for seven murders in his hometown, Youngboy would seemingly meet the three murder requirement <laughs> to date Asian Doll. And leaked DMs from Youngboy's camp would later seemingly suggest that Asian and Youngboy had indeed hooked up and Asian Doll would even seem to admit the affair in her song No Expose. Youngboy's producer would further feed the rumor mill by posting screenshots of messages that Youngboy had allegedly sent him from Asian Doll's Instagram account. Things were getting petty, and now Youngboy was proving that the sentiment behind King Von's song Mine Too was true both ways. But things would only get more and more personal as the days went on. On November the 4th, 2020, only days before King Von would end up losing his life, Youngboy posted a snippet of a new song that he apparently made with Asian Doll, a song with the ominous working title Meet the Reaper. Von would quickly respond by tweeting that the song is trash, and he would continue with an all-day tweet store, during which he would once again allude and joke about a sex tape existing between him and Jania, and claiming that he is actually happy for Asian Doll, but that the song is still trash, before rehashing a lyric from his song Mine Too, once again indicating that Asian is still his girl too. This all went down on November the 4th, 2020, about a day before he would lose his life. Von was incredibly active on Twitter this day, and he would continue throwing shots at Youngboy, tweeting that rappers are and that he's not one of them, and he would warn people to approach him with caution, and saying that his ops are acting gangster, but that's not what they're really like, whilst also trying to convince his audience, and perhaps himself, that his feelings weren't hurt, and he was simply providing entertainment. <laughs> right. Eventually saying in another deleted tweet that he's going to lead by example because he's older than Youngboy, and saying that he's quitting the beef because many wars have started over a woman, and that he's not beefing Youngboy. He said that they're sharing the same women, and these women don't even matter, and aren't all that. And then, in the very last recorded interview before his death, King Von told DJ Academics that there was no real beef between him and Youngboy, saying that they just had the same girl, and claiming that things were just being exaggerated by people on the internet. People told me what? you and Youngboy was beefing or something like that. You said about, that what happened, bud? What's going on with you, man? They be saying that a lot. It's like we got the same interests. And then, you know how the internet will try to make it. Don't tell me y'all got that. problems over girls. No, it's the internet, gang. It's the, it's the you know, they try to make it like that because it's the internet, you see what I'm saying? Mm. And, then, and then, you know how females is. Females will try to make it like that because they female. And they try to make it like one more hard and try to, it be just all type. But it ain't nothing too serious, nothing you should worry about. Unfortunately for Von, things would be very serious indeed. And the very night after that interview, Von himself would escalate things out of his own control and ultimately wound up getting more than he bargained for. Just after midnight on the 5th of November 2020, Von tweets his location for the evening, a show at Atlanta Club Opium. Von would go live on Instagram on the way to the club in good spirits, rapping along to his own music. He would go live pre-show with the name of the club pinned, and he would be seen on Instagram posted up smoking hookah with his entourage of Oblock natives. He went on to play that concert at Opium, where he would be seen jamming out on stage at the club. Just after 1am, Von retweeted a Young and Ace lyric with a caption 
saying his crew are going to catch someone, and he sees them as food. While Von is performing at Opium, Quando Rondo and his entourage are fresh off recording a new music video for a song called The Drop, being seen after that shoot on social media, showing off an array of high-powered weapons that they're holding. After finishing his show, Von would be seen leaving Opium in an SUV, and interestingly, the truck can be heard playing the young boy's song My Window as it drove away. We a lot of cars by our house. Stop playing! For some reason, Von would confuse his team by choosing not to go back to his Airbnb as his security crew originally thought, instead taking a last minute and unexplained detour to the Monaco Hookah Lounge, where Quando Rondo was hanging out with his crew, with Von's manager 100k track telling DJ Vlad that his team were blindsided by the change in plan. He went over there to the after party and then his driver and his homeboy let us know that we was redirected. We're thinking we're going to go to the Airbnb or the hotel. At around 3 a.m. that night, Von would find himself outside the Monaco Hookah Lounge, where according to 100k track, the team would wait for almost 40 minutes in their cars, confused as to why they were there. Von himself you know, seems to have spent that time yeah, on Twitter and he would post his last tweet, too. ominously mentioning how he murders any beat he gets on. Then, only minutes after this tweet, Von would exit his car and walk across the parking lot, where he would run into Quando Rondo and immediately begun attacking him with heavy punches and no warning, sparking chaos in the large crowd around them. Unfortunately, what Von didn't know was that Quando Rondo's good friend Lil Tim was seemingly ready for the action, and he would quickly approach the two with his gun ready, letting off shots and hitting Von a total of five times. From there, things would quickly escalate. Von's friends from Oblock, Slutty, BJ, and Louie, immediately got their guns out and began to return fire to Lil Tim, leaving Tim wounded but alive on the ground, as Slutty's gun appears to jam right when he's standing over Lil Tim about to execute him. While chaos is ensuing all around them, Von is seemingly wrestling with Quando on the ground, perhaps instinctively grabbing onto him whilst holding onto his life, until King Von's friend Muwop approaches the two and separating them by striking Quando once with a large punch. Meanwhile, Von's other friends Slutty, BJ, and Louie attempt to flee the scene after taking part in the shootout and almost killing Lil Tim, without realizing that they were running directly towards police officers who opened fire, believing that their lives are in danger too. This killed Slutty and left Louis in critical condition with a headshot wound, and BJ was shot in the leg. BJ would actually later comment on the events of that night on social media, questioning if others would have had the courage to shoot someone with police all around them, and saying that the police should have shot him in the head as well. But while the cops are having a shootout with other Oblock members, Muwop and other Oblock associates would drag King Von's limp body to a waiting car, rushing him to hospital. But what's even more crazy is that Quando would also take a wounded Lil Tim to the very same hospital that King Von and his team were at, with Quando going live, showing him trying to help Tim into the hospital and get assistance from the staff. Come on, come on, come on, he's shot! Come on, come on, hit, bro, you got I still don't understand why he went live. Just keep breathing, but bro. If he didn't, just keep we wouldn't have this footage, so. Come on, you come can't on, move on. on that thing. You got it, bro. my fault, my fault. Yeah? Ma'am, he's shot, what you mean, wrong side? Come on, come on. Come on, man, please, come on, all right. Okay. Get him, get him a wheelchair. Man, what you mean I gotta stay right here? Man, we need to get him. Man, we need to get him back. They ace out. I'm howling. Ma'am, how? He done been shot before. Okay, sir. Man, we need a wheelchair. Man, I just howl. I can't do all what I can do. How we get there, man? We need help. Hold on, man, man. Get him a wheelchair, man. What we doing? What y'all doing, cuz? Man, what you mean? Man, we can't take him out. That man gonna die. Close friend of Von and Dirk, THF Bezu, later posted saying that they saw Quando at the hospital and that they would have killed him there had he not started recording. Unfortunately, after arriving at the hospital, King Von was already in critical condition. And despite medical staff doing everything they could to try and save him, Von would ultimately be pronounced dead at 4.44 in the morning, with the media all around the world waking up to the news and reporting on his death. According to GBI, rapper King Von and his group were at Opium Nightclub before making their way here to Monaco Hookah Lounge, then to the parking lot where chaos ensued. Believe it or not, this all playing out right in front of two Atlanta police officers. One of them was actually inside his patrol car or next to his patrol car with his blue lights on. APD responding, attempting to stop the shooting, but it was too late. It hit like the one officer that did respond. He tried to protect himself and stop what was going on. The investigation on this shootout will continue. No officers were injured during this incident. According to GBI, this is the 82nd officer involved shooting that they've been requested to investigate in 2020. Lil Durk would seemingly find out about the shooting whilst being on IG Live and listening to his own revenge anthem back in blood, with the live ending abruptly when he realized that all of the comments were full of people asking about Von's shooting. After the news of Von's passing would be properly confirmed, Dirk would post a tribute image of Von to his own Instagram, saying that he had lost his twin. Meanwhile, Asian Doll, who despite perhaps not being on the best of terms with Von at the time of his death, reacted to the news on Twitter, claiming that she wishes that she was dead. However, over in Baton Rouge, Youngboy's brother Big B appeared to be in good spirits, as he would mock Von in an IG story, saying that it was funny that Von was the one who started the beef, dissing NBA Youngboy, now he's the one dead. The jokes on you, you diss, now you're getting wrapped down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Meanwhile, one of Youngboy's biggest ops, Lit Yoshi, who was still on probation in Florida at this point, would pay tributes to Von in a vlog. Long live King Von, man.
no black boys. Right. Yeah, right. Von's friends and associates would naturally have a strong response to his death, seemingly taking it as a full declaration of war between them and the NBA camp. 600 Breezy claimed to be headed from Chicago to Young Boy's hood at 150 miles an hour with the steppers. BJ, who was still probably being treated for his leg shot wound, would also respond, saying that their ops are now cursed and that they don't stand a chance against Oblock. Meanwhile, Young Boy affiliate Michi downplayed these declarations of war, saying that real gangsters only slide in silence. Right the whole thing going on hell, scary. Doing all that cap and get on that. I don't let my real speak. Hey, if you go do something, ain't do something, you don't come to the city. And now that you want to see them, you were supposed to slab out there. In a bittersweet turn of events, just a few days after Von's passing, his album Welcome to Oblock would become his highest charting project ever, debuting posthumously at the unlucky number 13 on Billboard, ironically, one position above Youngboy's top album, which at that point had already spent eight weeks on the charts after going number one on debut. What should have been a major career victory for Von was now unfortunately the final chapter in his short but impactful career as a gangster rapper. However, sadly for Youngboy, this wouldn't be the end of the beef. In fact, it was only the beginning. Because despite Von being the one who provoked both Youngboy first by taking intimate pictures with the mother of his child and Kwondo by punching him for no reason outside the Monaco club, the unintended result was Von being shot dead in front of his entire crew. And unfortunately for Youngboy, Von wasn't just any rapper. Von was, in his own words, the most dangerous killer to ever emerge from Oblock. And Von was backed up by an army of friends, gang members, and killers who seemingly wanted nothing more than to slide for Von and get revenge. And they would be targeting Kwondo Rondo and Youngboy, as well as all of their friends. But the biggest threat would come in the form of Von's closest friend and mentor, Lil Durk, who just so happened to be the biggest rapper coming out of Chicago in a decade, with seemingly the power of the music industry, millions of dollars, and all of Chicago's Black Disciple gang members behind him. When King Von and Youngboy had gone back and forth in the summer of 2020, it was hard to imagine that their rap beef would become something deadly. But the unfortunate truth of street life is that if you're constantly armed and around other groups who are armed, it's very easy for a small disagreement to escalate into a Wild West style shootout. It's hard to believe that Kwondo Rondo could have possibly wanted King Von dead when he was seemingly blindsided by Von punching him in the first place. Ultimately, Kwondo's friend Lil Tim was simply protecting his people's best interests when he fired on King Von. Perhaps it was an overreaction, but in the capacity of Kwondo's muscle, he's supposed to take action and protect Kwondo from danger. The unfortunate circumstances of that night created a situation that nobody wanted to be in, but it is what it is. When Lil Tim pulled that trigger, this escalated things from an industry rap beef to an interstate gang war where blood had been shed. King Von was a beloved figure in Chicago drill, not just because of his hit songs about Chicago street life, but also for his reputation as a gangster in the streets being associated with at least seven murders, which he seemingly confesses to in numerous lyrics. Von was the baddest gangster in Chicago history, and he had just lost his life for something completely unrelated to his ops in the Chicago gang war. After the dust settled, all eyes were on Kwondo Rondo, as rap fans all over the world awaited his take on exactly what had happened. Two weeks after Von's death, on the 20th of November 2020, Kwondo Rondo would cause a stir when he released the song End of Story. The title seemingly a reference to Von's crazy story series of storytelling songs, with End of Story being a disrespectful title essentially flipping the name of the song Crazy Story, saying that they ended King Von's story. And the cover art was even a picture of Kwondo and Lil Tim taken on the set of the music video shoot that took place just before Von was killed. And in the song, Kwondo explains his side of the incident, expressing frustration about Tim being judged for opening fire, saying that other people's friends would have left him behind and not defended him like Tim did, rapping that if the shoe was on the other foot and it was Kwondo who got killed by one of Von's shooters, the fans would have probably been celebrating. With Kwondo rapping out right that his man Lil Tim did nothing wrong, and if your friends wouldn't do the same, you probably shouldn't have them around you. But Kwondo would go even further than just giving his side, dropping lyrics that seem to be a direct sign of disrespect to Von and his entourage from Oblock, essentially dissing Von and his friends, saying, blood on your brother on the ground, go pick your mans up, and rapping that he and Tim are claiming self-defense and that Von should have never put his hands on Kwondo. Kwondo would claim that this situation has now led a million dollar bounty being put on his head, with Kwondo taunting his ops from Chicago, saying that all you got, why not make it eight million? More than just a bounty on his head, reportedly Lil Durk was taking steps behind the scenes to harm the careers of both Kwondo Rondo and the young boy following this incident. Rumors would circulate that Dirk had been buying all the tickets to Kwondo shows amid a spate of concert cancellations. Dirk would even rap in his song Hellcats and Trackhawks, which was circulating in late November, that they're looking for somebody at their shows, as well as a line towards Kwondo or young boy saying that they're not feeling your favorite rapper. Clearly, Dirk was devastated by the loss of Von and placed the blame squarely on Kwondo Rondo and young boy. Moving forward, Dirk would make grand gestures towards Von, using his career to memorialize his fallen friend. A few months after Von's passing, Dirk would release his new album, The Voice, which he would dedicate to his fallen Quinn Von with a picture of them together on the cover. But next, Dirk would do something that was aimed directly at Youngboy. In his January the 2nd, 2021 music video for the hit song Back in Blood with Shicey, he would call in a cameo from none other than Youngboy's biggest surviving enemy from the Baton Rouge Gang Wars, TBG rapper Fredo Bang. And then, two weeks later, on January the 15th, 2021, Fredo Bang would release a new song and music video of his own. This was a remix of a song called Top. This was an interesting title for Youngboy's biggest surviving op to make, considering Youngboy's nickname is Top. The official remix of the track Top would feature Youngboy's newest op, Lil Durk. 
with lyrics where Dirk rapped about how he felt when his cousin Nooski died. But not only that, but the music video for the top remix was damn near a summit for Youngboy and Quando's Ox. Enelie Chopper made a cameo in the music video, and if you didn't know, Enelie Chopper is a bitter enemy of Quando Rondo ever since they had a clash backstage, with Quando smashing a bottle over one of Enelie Chopper's friend's heads. The music video also featured a close-up shot showing one of Dirk's OTF chains and a YNW chain belonging to Florida rapper YNW Melly. This was actually a reference to yet another ongoing feud between Melly's YNW crew and Youngboy and Quando dating all the way back to summer 2018, with a member of Melly's crew, YNW Sack Chaser, hopping on IG Live to tell the story of an altercation between the YNW crew, Youngboy, and Quando Rondo, where apparently these two crews would get into right, a peace call at the Atlantic Records offices. Um, we put up at Atlantic. Youngboy already outside looking like this. Like, Melly like, oh, Youngboy, I said, oh, yeah, we might not have fade in it. So I asked, straight, me and Drew, we were like, straight? And he was like, yo, straight. You know, screw. Young boy, like, he talked to them Eli dude. He like, bro, all that man, I'm finna just pop off. So then he popped off. He hit Melly. Boom. But it's some weak. Like, you think strong, but the body, like, dead. He hit him. Boom. So, like, Melly, when he hit him, Melly hit him two times. Boom, boom. And that's when I popped off on him. Popped off on Young boy. And then he came after me. And they started boom, 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 boom. Melly hit on the ground. He fell on the ground because they had, like, bulldozed. So then they had ran, like, the dude broke it up. They ran out the room. And they came back in that. Quando Rondo came in that time. Yeah, started jumping. Boom, 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 boom. Caught corner on the ass in the forehead. Boom. He caught my head back in the forehead. Jumped up in the sky. Jumped on my chest. Ran out. So I always running, dude. Everybody always running from my head. It ran out. Mm. So then young boy tried to jump. Come hit my ass too. It made a car to his ass. Boom. Hit his ass in the Made it left. It would seem that following this fight, both Melly and Von would become close friends, perhaps for a shared dislike of Youngboy. Ultimately, they became close before Von passed, sharing the stage and studio sessions together, as well as collaborating on songs like Rollin'. Melly was seemingly a common connection between Youngboy's enemies, as Melly had collaborated with Fredo Bantu, with them appearing together in studio sessions teasing collaborations in late 2018, and they would end up releasing numerous songs together, like the song Ingredients on Melly's We All Shine project and Fredo's single Brazy. In fact, when YNW Melly ended up getting charged with the double murder of two of his friends, prosecutors had apparently suggested that Fredo Bang might have been the person who who Melly called to come and get him after the murders took place. So, Youngboy and Quando's enemies in both the music industry and in the streets of Baton Rouge and Chicago were all linking up and uniting against them. It would truly be Youngboy and Quando against the world at this point, but they wouldn't take all of the heat without sending a few shots back. On February the 12th, 2021, Quando Rondo releases the music video for his song Soul Reaper, and in this video, Quando uses an actor with dyed blonde dreads like Von's friend Lil Durk, seemingly depicting this Lil Durk lookalike getting kidnapped and shot. And the song itself had lyrics seemingly referencing Von, with Quando rapping that someone ran up on me, then we sprayed him, I'm talking like out. Quando referenced the fight taking place before the killing of Von, saying that it doesn't matter who got beaten up, it's about who got killed. Eventually, Quando Rondo would open up more seriously about his involvement in the situation that claimed Von's life, when he appeared in an extended interview with Angela Yee on April the 12th, 2021, where he opened up all about the incident, saying that he had no idea why Von punched him, and that he didn't even know that it was Von until the next day. Like, I'm thinking it's a regular individual. Next thing you know, it hit me. So I looked at it like, all right, babe, I ain't mad at nothing about it, but I guess this is how I go. I'm like, I looked at it, I'm like, this the big bro. In my mind, I'm like, in my mind, I'm just thinking regular in reality. Quando would also say that he didn't even know there was a beef between Young Boy's camp and Von's crew. Because I know dude just dropped the tape. Like, was they trying to do something to me? Like, just boost him up or like, what? I don't know. You man, just don't know where. You just don't man, know where. I don't have it. You have Ooh. no idea. Despite Quando's attempts at calming things down with this interview, seemingly there was no stopping the consequences. In the coming months, Quando and his team would be a frequent target of what appeared to be revenge attacks. He would be targeted in a shooting after a show at a gas station convenience store in Georgia mm -hmm. on the 2nd of May 2021, luckily escaping without injury. So far, there, but discouraged then by this attempt on they his lost life somebody either, in the next one. Career forward. On May the 7th, 2021, Quando released his sixth mixtape, Still Taking Risks, his first full length release since the killing of King Von, a project laced with disrespectful references to the the incident where Von died, and Lil Tim, Quando's homie who shot Von, would end up releasing a disrespectful diss song and music video of his own titled Off The List, where Lil Tim would rap boastfully about having just checked someone off the list and upped the score by gunning someone down. And Youngboy's crew were throwing their full support behind Quando and Tim too, with NBA Ben 10 calling for Tim's freedom at the end of 2021, with a social media post showing that Ben has Tim saved in his phone as Von Killer. However, the pressure was piling up for Dirk to do something in retaliation for Von's death. Since Von lost his life, the internet was awash with people commenting, slide for Von. A common comment by internet trolls looking to goad Dirk into getting revenge on Quando and Youngboy for what happened to Von. Unsurprisingly, all of this talk of sliding for Von was clearly getting for the very man that everybody was asking to slide little Dirk. So it would seem that Dirk, unable to keep his beef in the streets, felt compelled to rap about the situation on songs. On October the 8th, 2021, Lil Durk raps on the Who Wants Smoke remix, saying that people keep trolling him saying slide for Von, but he's already got back 
people just don't know it, as well as rapping that people die pumping gas, a possible reference to the shooting of Quando at a gas station earlier in the year. It seemed that Dirk was trying to quash the slide for Von Trent by hinting to the world that he had in fact already slid and tried to have Quando killed. That track was followed a week later by Dirk's new song, Pissed Me Off, where he raps that since he lost Von, he can't be happy until they even the score. And rapping, perhaps self-referentially, that if you're not a shooter, you should put up money for the guns, stolen cars, and the bail. On the one year anniversary of King Von's death, Quando Rondo tweets that I never forgave you for what you did, and that hurt me to this day. Perhaps he's still talking about Von sucker punching him. Or perhaps he's talking about Lil Dirk and the campaign behind the scenes to avenge Von, even though Von was the aggressor. After all, King Von's real beef was with Quando's label mate Youngboy, and Youngboy himself wouldn't have kind words for Von either. After this tweet, Youngboy would reference Von's death publicly on audio-based social media app Clubhouse, telling DJ Academics that this is what happens when someone comes in the industry trying to be the tough guy, and that Von acted on his feelings, and now he can't feel anymore. Man, we see how this turn out with, we, we see how this turn out with certain come inside the rap game and feel like, oh, I'm the one who they gotta get in tear with for the, for the make, for the, for the, for the reach this thing, point away. Man, boy, you can stack like your ass a gangster, boy. He gonna show you something, boy. You, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't seen this, we didn't seen this. I'm gonna be a, I'm gonna be a gangster too bad, I'm be a killer too bad, man. You, man, you better calm your stupid ass down for you can't have no type of emotion no more, boy. Yeah. Man, you know, man, you, hey, you know how this Later in December, the beef between Lil Durk's OTF Collective and Quando Rondo and NBA Youngboy's camp would continue to play out on Clubhouse. At the end of the month, OTF affiliate Mimo 600 ends up in Clubhouse with Lil Tim and NBA Youngboy, where Youngboy says that he's going to keep it friendly with Mimo, and then he plays Lil Tim's song all about killing Von and asks why he's not being friendly anymore. Well, we ain't doing no jokes or none of that. Yeah. We're cool with him. Yeah, it's a lot of. Believe that, yeah, man. They keep that uh, Millie, Millie was on here. Then my homeboy turned up. Yeah, that's my little home, but we gonna keep that thing gangsta and cars while we on Almost there. So I said, dude, I'll be late. You don't want that smoke, you know what happened in Atlanta. <laughs> you know what happened last time I saw you. I said, little Mimo. What y'all on, bro? Mimo. Just <laughs> check a new got out the list. Out the list. Man, man, bro, I guess don't want me. Damn, bro, I thought, I thought we was cool. Man, man I thought damn. we was cool. For me. I thought we were keeping this thing in cars and I just don't want to run it, man. Make, make, it, make it bro happy, man. He don't want to talk to us. Clearly Youngboy wasn't over his beef with Von, and things were about to go to a whole new level of public disrespect. And moving into 2022, on January the 12th, Youngboy drops a song referencing the killing of Von, rapping on the track Bring the Hook that he's smoking that O-Block pack, and that Von got folded up in Atlanta after saying he was going to kill Youngboy, with Youngboy even comparing Von's death to something from the show Squid Game. Which if you think about it, is kind of a deep bar, because in many ways, the drill music game is as dangerous and deadly as the Squid Games for Von and Youngboy. Youngboy also dropped a line about a body being stitched back up, seemingly a reference to leaked images from King Von's autopsy, mm -hmm. and also another disrespectful line where he says that Von must have seen a gremlin the way his body shook and comparing hunting ops to fishing and ending the track saying you know I pull off plenty killings. Dirk would respond to the song with a social media post the same day saying don't claim it if you didn't do it and calling young boy a bitch while sitting next to a picture of Von. King Von's sister Kayla B would then chime in repeating that statement on her Twitter and the following day mocking young boy for acting like he's a demon whilst he's on house arrest telling him to get in these streets. A day later a number of people would be seen in O-Block filming a music video and burning green bandanas a sign of disrespect to young boy's 4k tray crew who were known to wear green bandanas. Also getting involved was fellow Chicago Black Disciple Lil Reese, who had previously threatened to beat up Quando Rondo the very same day that Von was seen hanging out with Janir. With Reese responding to a post by DJ Academics saying that Youngboy was on Demon Time in his new song, Reese clapped back saying that Youngboy was not on Demon Time and that he's just rapping like the rest of these rappers rap. This was something that NLE Chopper also chimed in to agree with, with NLE Chopper involving himself firmly in this beef pretty much out of nowhere, probably due to his existing hatred of Quando Rondo after their backstage brawl and due to his close personal friendship with King Von. NLE Chopper actually did an interview a couple days later, where he said outright, he agrees with Reese, and he felt that Youngboy had nothing to do with Von's death, so it was wrong to rap about it. Even going as far as to say that Von was trying to put the gun down and fight, and that Lil Tim shooting him was a snake move. Um, pretty much I was just agreeing with what Reese said, because um, at the end of the day, like I said, certain things that nobody's right or nobody's wrong, in my opinion. But, you know what I'm saying, I know what's right with me, and I don't know like who I stand with and who I support. Like, and when you speak on certain situations that you really don't have nothing to do with, or you didn't, you wasn't in that position, and somebody lost their life because, you know what I'm saying, somebody was trying to put a gun down and have a square, you know what I'm saying, a simple fight. And you, you glorify certain things that was a snake move at the end of the day, wasn't wrong or right because you're protecting your brand at the end of the day. But still, is there certain things you don't glorify if you wasn't there, if you wasn't in the space, and if you ain't do something, you know? So it's just certain things you respect at the end of the day. Um, maybe I'm always a fantastic artist. One, once in a period of time, he was my favorite artist. You know what I'm saying? Two days after that, the Youngboy fan claimed to have beaten up NLE Chopper at the airport on behalf of 4K Trey. Hey, yo. Yeah, I just knocked out NLE Chopper. He's a f Oh, 4K Trey, we in this 
Hey, 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 about nine, eight, big NBA, big 4K trail video, y'all feel me? Y'all just knocked out the raffle. Hold on, y'all, about to post video. It's scary. It's yeah, are you in LE? I asked you mad times. What, stop playing with me. Yeah, yeah. What's up? Yeah, 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 what's up? Amid all of this controversy, NLE Chopper would continue to discuss his friendship with King Von publicly, even claiming in a Breakfast Club interview that Von would supply him with firearms when he visited Atlanta and that he's siding with Von in the beef due to their friendship. I, I made certain comments because because my brother Vaughn, that's that's what I made a comment on, um, defending his name because he's not able to defend his name. When Vaughn was on house arrest, I was going to his house. When I used to come down, he'll make sure I had scraps on me. He'll make sure I was protected. Like with the hip hop scene buzzing with chatter about the latest diss in this deadly feud, the next day on the 18th of January 2022, Youngboy comes out with another song referencing the beef. His song No Like I Know. The track references Vaughn's sister saying that she was Big 4L on Twitter the day Youngboy dropped the song Bring the Hook. She was actually referring to a 21 Savage lyric from the song Glock in My Lap, directing that to Youngboy to call him a and claim that she was a member of the same gang as Vaughn. A complicated reference as Youngboy seemingly in the past had a good relationship with 21 Savage. 21 Savage appeared on one of his first industry remixes on the track Murder all the way back in 2016, but after Vaughn died, 21 would seemingly choose Dirk's side in this beef, with a young boy later rapping that 21 Savage is the person that jumped him into the blood gang, and that's the reason why he got a 4L tattoo on his neck. But after the beef with Vaughn, young boy says that he called 21 for support, and that 21 turned down the call and denied knowing who he was. But back to the song No Like I Know. Other than the line about 21 Savage and Kayla B at the start, the majority of the opening bars on the track were actually aimed at NLE Chopper, with young boy saying that he will kill him for picking sides with Lil Reese on Twitter, telling him he's a real demon, saying directly that he saw Chopper's interview in bed and thought to himself, he doesn't even know no Chopper, but Chopper wants to see him dead. As well as lines that could be aimed at Enerly Chopper or Dirk, rapping that you can get killed like your friend and that they're not ready to see brains lying around the club. With me leaning towards thinking that this lyric is actually aimed at Lil Dirk due to Youngboy rapping that he plays for keeps, a reference to the famous Chicago drill song Play for Keeps by friends of Lil Dirk, LA Capone, and Rondo Number no. 9. A day later, on January the 19th, 2022, Youngboy posts a picture on Instagram saying that his ops are going to die, along with another picture telling them to stay safe. Seemingly, this was a reference to earlier alleged leaked DMs between Dirk and Quando, where Quando had seemingly tried to squash the beef with Dirk telling him, stay safe. This might be an indication that despite Quando denying the authenticity of these DMs, they very well may have been real. Lil Dirk would seemingly respond to Youngboy's picture with a picture of his own using money to spell out, hurry y'all bitch ass up. Seemingly, not discouraged by Dirk returning fire on social media, Youngboy would continue dropping disrespectful murder anthems, inflaming the beef with Dirk's OTF crew and Von's friends from Oglog even further. On January the 21st, 2022, Youngboy drops the song No Switch, with the title being a reference to Lil Dirk's frequent mentions of switches in his songs. On the song itself, Youngboy references Von's death, saying, Paul Bearers bring your body to the grave because his shooters don't miss. Following that lineup, saying that it's On Dave, a possible joke on King Von who used to always say On King David. That's a common line used by Black Disciple gang members, where they're essentially swearing on the life of the founder of the Black Disciples gang, David, King David Barksdale, as well as the fact that of course Youngboy lost his close friend Lil Dave when he was a child. Youngboy goes on to rap, you don't want to see Lil Tim jump out that truck, another reference to the sequence of events that saw King Von losing his life at the hands of Lil Tim's gun. And Youngboy ends the song with an outro where he claims outright that his team are rapper slayers. A bold statement when you consider the fact that in addition to King Von, Quando Rondo's gang were rumored to have had something to do with the murder of a rival Savannah rapper called Huncho Reese. And on top of that, NBA Youngboy's crew have been famously connected to the murder of up and coming Baton Rouge rap rivals, G Money and Boulevard quick. So when he says they're rapper slayers, they really mean it. The day Youngboy released No Switch was the same day Lil Tim seemingly returned to Twitter with a new account and a kiss blowing emoji. Clearly, the beef was heating up and Lil Dirk would be quick to respond. He would feature as a verse on the January 25th, 2022 Gucci Mane song, Rumors, where Dirk would rap that he's paying for specific people to be shot and that he's following people when they're in Atlanta. And seemingly referencing Lil Tim being shot, saying they shot someone's homie for trolling him and that they were surprised Talk about to survive. Dirk goes on to rap bro, that he's not even checking his old pages to see if anyone died after sending these hits, as well as rapping that he is planning to use women to get his ops set up and killed. Ending his verse saying that he won't tell people who shot their friend and pondering why his ops don't call him and choose instead to post on Instagram. As well as seemingly dissing NBA Youngboy for his earlier back and forths where he spelled words out with money saying that he's lucky that he doesn't do this stuff for Instagram. Then the following month fans would hear yet another response from Lil Durk. On February the 22nd Lil Durk drops his new song Aha. Durk would rap saying that people tell him not to respond to people disrespecting Von but he claps back saying that he wants his people to pick up their guns and shoot when people diss Von. He would rap that he's giving people locations and getting it done. Seemingly a reference to the shootings targeting Quando Rondo as retaliation for Von's death. Dirk is literally saying in his songs that he is actively sliding for Von and attracting the attention of the cops. Dirk would even go on to rap a line that seemed to suggest that Von was sleeping with Youngboy's women, Jania, and that Quando and his crew are Youngboy's subordinates. Dirk then says that his shooters have been sliding through their blocks and that the ops don't know it, and saying that someone got shot, but they didn't claim it, but he can prove it. 
perhaps a reference once again to that gas station shooting targeting Kwondo. Dirk would say that Kwondo and Youngboy have only been acting tough since Von died, and inferring that Youngboy snitched to get out of his legal problems. And Dirk would also rap that despite people thinking he's soft because he sings, he's the one who gets people shot. Seemingly, another reference to that May shooting of Kwondo's team. Dirk would also confirm that he was indeed talking about his ops on the earlier diss song, Pissed Me Off, inviting them to slide and get revenge if they don't like it, before saying that he's been killing people to feel better rather than going to therapy. Dirk ends the track with one final lyric suggesting that he had had somebody's friend set them up and give them the location of one of the people he's been targeting. This was a bold and frankly incriminating song when you know the truth behind it, but Youngboy didn't waste any time, responding the very same day with a diss track of his own targeting Lil Dirk, the track I Hate Youngboy. And on this song, Youngboy had lyrics about Dirk's cousin being killed and nothing being done about it. He would also rap that there's a clean up on aisle O, essentially mocking King Von from Oblox's death, and rapping straight after this that his brother let the stick blow so it's his smoke, essentially claiming responsibility for the killing of Von by association. Youngboy also claimed that he was listening to Wooski, one of King Von's biggest enemies from Chicago, as well as going on to say that he no longer likes Gucci Mane since he collaborated with Dirk on the song Rumors. He would drop bars suggesting that Lil Dirk is only dissing him so hard because he's on house arrest and he can't retaliate in the streets. Following that up, rapping outright, I'll kill you. Youngboy would also go on to mention the mother of his child, Jania, who Von had apparently slept with, saying that she's richer than anyone in Dirk's team. He would even claim to be trying to kill and set up literally anyone who ever did a song with Dirk, even dissing Lil Baby, who had recently done a collaborative album with Lil Dirk, Voice of the Heroes. Youngboy would call Dirk a pussy and claim that Dirk was only dissing him because he's mad about Von getting killed. He would even diss Lil Dirk's father, referencing Big Dirk, who spent time in federal prison, saying he's a bitch and telling him to comfort Dirk's grieving auntie, a reference to the death of Dirk's cousin, Nooski. Youngboy would also diss King Von's sister, Kayla B, once again for claiming she was 4L, and Youngboy would even call out fans and YouTubers for hating on Tim and Quando Rondo and acting like they were wrong for killing Von, with a bar telling YouTube streamers not to react to him no more, seemingly pointing the finger at the king of Twitch streaming, Kai Sinat, who had actually been seen with Lil Dirk that very same day. There were also lyrics mentioning Apple Music, where Youngboy says F them because they promote Lil Dirk, but blackball him and Quando. According to academics, after Von got killed, Apple Music decided not to push Youngboy anymore out of respect to Lil Dirk. The whole um, Quando Rondo and whatever, whatever, they stopped playlisting anything that was NBA associated. And the reasoning that was given was literally this. This is why he dissed Apple Music on I Hate Young Boy. The reason was given was we don't want to upset the other side. That's factual. The fact that these two major artists had gone back and forth on each other so savagely, all in the same day, was huge news in the rap world, and the beef didn't even stop at songs. After releasing Aha, Dirk posted to Instagram that he got 2 million views in 15 hours, taunting his rivals and saying these were real numbers. But when Youngboy unexpectedly clapped back with a response the same day, his I Hate Youngboy track went crazy on the numbers, surpassing Dirk's debut, and Quando Rondo would take to IG to gloat towards Lil Dirk's earlier post, referencing the success of Youngboy's new song over Dirk's release, posting Youngboy's video with 2.2 million views in 5 hours and saying nah those are some real numbers. The song I Hate Youngboy led to a huge fallout, and it wasn't just Lil Dirk who was mad. After catching a stray in the diss song, Atlanta rapper Gucci Mane would also throw his hat into the ring, dropping his own diss track aimed towards Youngboy on March the 4th, 2022, a track titled Publicity Stunt, which essentially accused Youngboy of dissing him as a publicity stunt, and even threatening to kill Youngboy for dissing him, with Gucci Mane actually ending the song, disavowing Youngboy's earlier lyrics that shouted him out in his hit song Make No Sense, with Gucci rapping, I thought you felt like me in 2006. The beef with Lil Dirk was now spreading throughout the industry, and an entire united front of artists who were friends with Dirk and Von were getting together to blacklist Youngboy from the music industry. But it wasn't all their fault, as despite having a successful 2020, dropping back-to-back -back number one albums, Youngboy was still getting himself in trouble in the streets, and his record label, as well as the music industry at large, were beginning to get tired of his antics. And unfortunately for Youngboy, in the midst of this enormous interstate beef with King Von and Lil Dirk, he would wind up getting himself in a whole lot of trouble for another reason, catching numerous, serious criminal charges related to firearms, ultimately winding up losing his freedom when he needed it most, and truly testing the patience of his industry backers to their limits. On September the 28th, 2020, Youngboy was part of a large group of people filming a music video, apparently for his song Chopper City. Youngboy was seen in social media clips around this time, appearing to tote a Draco whilst driving an old school cutlass. <laughs> And another shot where we would see his car is filled with green bandana waving 4K tray goons. And this day, Youngboy was live on his videographer Rich Porter's Instagram, recording himself an NBA Michi baby, toting firearms, and rapping the song Chopper City. Watch this. Ah. Boy, stop playing, man. Wait, stop wait, playing, man. What's up? There were also other shots circulating on social media, showing Youngboy and his crew dancing around and toting guns in the middle of the street. Youngboy would even pose with child fans whilst holding a rifle. They were back on Chippewa Street, Youngboy's native hood. But unfortunately, 
not everybody from Youngboy's home block was a fan of him or his gang-affiliated homies. At some point, somebody called 911 to report a large group of youngsters filming a music video and toting Uzis and AK-47s right in the middle of their street. The police would arrive at the scene, reportedly even taunting Youngboy and his friends and family by quoting lyrics from his song No Smoke, and footage would later circulate showing Youngboy being put in handcuffs alongside around 15 of his friends. That's what it be though. Already. With the news later reporting on the arrest and the huge haul of guns and cash taken from the incident. And Youngboy's post arrest mugshot would circulate soon after the arrest. But cops couldn't hold him for long, and within a day or so, Youngboy was released on $75,000 bond and would be seen taking pictures with fans outside jail in the same outfit he was arrested in. Same here. Give him a whole day. Say thanks for the supplies. And a young boy would go on to bail all 15 of his friends out of jail too, displaying the whole process on social media for the world to see. The cops would claim to have recovered 14 guns and $79,000 in cash, and Youngboy would post on social media letting the world know that the cops had also taken the Chopper City music video footage away from him. The cops would eventually attempt to use this footage against him. In fact, the state would even use stills from the social media clips of Youngboy toting a chopper in the street as evidence. Youngboy's attorney would take to the media to assure the world that his client was not guilty, and that he did not have a gun on him at the time of the arrest. A broad daylight drug bust landing 16 men behind bars tonight, including Baton Rouge rapper NBA Youngboy. This is crazy. Good. Yeah, the young boy is in jail. Tonight, his attorney calls this arrest ridiculous, saying there's nothing in the report that indicates he did anything wrong. They arrested several people, and there was no indication that he had any guns or drugs on him at the time of the arrest. The attorney vows his client will be found innocent, and all of this cleared up in court. Unfortunately for Youngboy, his cameraman would be arrested, with his gun, his camera, and the SD cards being confiscated. And Youngboy was later charged with possession of the gun discovered from the cameraman, as well as from a nearby parked car, with prosecutors claiming to have reviewed the footage on those SD cards and witnessed Youngboy toting firearms. Anywho, since bailing out, Youngboy would be a free man once again. But as time passed, these legal issues would soon catch up with him. Apparently, after bailing out in Baton Rouge, Youngboy decided to try and play it safe moving out of the dangerous city that he came up in, opting instead to spend his time in Los Angeles suburb Tarzana and focus on recording his latest album, Until I Return. But he would still release music in this time. Until I Return was Youngboy's fourth project of 2020, releasing on the 11th of November, just six days after the death of King Von. However, as it was so soon after that incident, there was no direct lyrics referencing Von's death, perhaps because everything was already recorded, finalized, and ready to release before the unfortunate events of November 6th unfolded. Perhaps the controversy around that event or the subsequent industry blacklisting played a role in this project performing worse than his previous releases. It would peak at number 10 on Billboard, effectively ending Youngboy's hot streak of three number ones and a number two charting project. But Youngboy wouldn't be discouraged. In fact, following this release, he would ramp up production, continuing to drop back-to-back -back new songs and music videos. On November the 20th, he would drop a joint mixtape with Rich the Kid called Nobody Safe, which landed at number 43 on the Billboard 200 charts. And that collaborative album would be followed by a string of solo releases hyping fans up for Youngboy's next full-length project. There was the uplifting track How I Been, the murder anthem Green Dot, the inspiring track It Ain't Over, and he would also appear on major guest spots with other rappers, like French Montana on So Real and Tragic with Kid Leroy, which charted at 76 on Billboard. Moving into 2021, it would seem that Youngboy was loading up something big, releasing the first single of his next album, fan favorite track, Toxic Punk in February, and another solo track, I Ain't Scared, in mid-March. Everything was all building towards the release of Youngboy's hotly anticipated third studio album, Sincerely Kentrell, which was slated for a May release. However, Youngboy's entire 2021 plan would come to a screeching halt suddenly at the end of March, as behind the scenes, the police forces in Baton Rouge and Los Angeles were teaming up with the FBI for a big bust on Youngboy relating to his September 2020 arrest. On March the 10th, 2022, an indictment was filed in Louisiana, charging Youngboy with being a felon in possession 
possession of the firearm. This was all the result of the Chopper City music video shoot in September 2020. However, at this point in time, cops would have no idea where Youngboy was. So nine days later, they'd get granted a search warrant to track the location of Youngboy's phone. This leads them to a property on Amigo Avenue in the Los Angeles suburb of Tarzana. This would apparently warrant the attention of an entire FBI task force who would begin to monitor Youngboy's home covertly, waiting for their chance to swoop in. And eventually, they would see Youngboy leave the home in his Maybach truck alone. At this point, officers turned on their police lights and took chase. According to documents, Youngboy would appear to park the vehicle after seeing the sirens, rolling down the window and putting both hands out before hitting the gas. Youngboy would take off, fleeing in the Maybach south on Amigo, making turn after turn. He would ultimately travel two blocks, escaping the sight of cops, before stopping the car and fleeing on foot northbound on Krebs Avenue from Red Wing Street. Footage would circulate allegedly showing the aftermath of Youngboy running away from police, followed by a manhunt in the area, with cop cars sweeping through, looking for where Youngboy was hiding with helicopters and police dogs. <laughs> Alright gang, I'm gonna pause it real quick. Youngboy would eventually surrender to police after canine units were deployed, with Youngboy apparently being found two hours after fleeing near the hedge line of a backyard of a nearby house. But, making matters worse, cops would find a loaded FNX 45 caliber pistol and ammunition in the Maybach behind the passenger seat, and they would also find cash and an assortment of never broke again jewelry. As a convicted felon, Youngboy is prohibited from possessing firearms, and this would be yet another gun charge to add on to the existing warrant. Youngboy was then taken into custody for the September 2020 Baton Rouge arrest and given a fresh new charge for the gun found in his car during the LA arrest, with Youngboy's ex Yaya Mayweather telling the world that her day was ruined when she found out the news of the arrest. As a result of this incident, Youngboy ends up in a Louisiana jail for most of 2021, leaving his team to pick up the pieces with regards to his music. But thankfully, his prolific recording schedule left them with a lot of material to work with. So while Youngboy is in jail, big releases continue taking place. In May, they released the second single of the album, White Teeth, and in July, the third single, Nevada. All of his singles charted on Billboard and provided the perfect conditions for his album to release. So on September the 24th, 2021, Youngboy's third studio album, Sincerely Hentrell, drops. The album's opening track, Bad Morning, is a standout Youngboy Boy song, and the inspirational anthem would captivate the wider rap audience, leading the song to chart on the Billboard Hot 100 Songs chart at 28. This was a tie with Youngboy's previous chart record on the song Lil Top that also hit 28 on the Hot 100, with those two songs at 28 being Youngboy's highest charting solo positions to date. Elsewhere on the project, Youngboy was continuing his usual brand of melodic murder music. One particularly eyebrow-raising song is the track Forgiato. In it, Youngboy seemingly admits to having used contract killers over seven times, warning his ops that they will be killed before the end of the year, and claiming to be known in his town as the Murder Man. He would seemingly dis Lil Durk and King Von, rapping that rappers want him gone, but he's going to take their soul. He would also respond to Lit Yoshi's earlier comments, where he claimed that all the members of the NBA gang all claim responsibility for the same one murder. Somebody died, the whole city rip on one body. That's crazy. Uh, if someone, somebody died, the whole city will get on Instagram and rip on it, and ain't got nothing to do with it. With Youngboy rebuffing those comments on Forgiato with an outrageous chorus, saying that in spite of Yoshi's claims, he's had over seven people killed, and rapping that once he's completed 10 killings, he will have to start counting his bodies on his toes. This was a bold lyric that sparked intense speculation about whether or not Youngboy's claims of having had over seven people killed was true or not. Some would argue that he likely has paid for seven murders and perhaps even carried out some himself, while others would assume that it's all lies, suggesting that perhaps Youngboy was just talking about kills on the game Call of Duty. Ultimately, at this point in his career, <laughs> Youngboy's name had certainly been associated with the deaths of over seven people. If you simply consider his lyrics and the number of people whose deaths have been associated with him over the years, there's nine suspected lives lost at this point. But that doesn't mean Youngboy is physically or legally responsible for any of these deaths. Perhaps he's just trying to hype up the mystique around his music, or perhaps he truly does see himself responsible for close to 10 deaths at this point in his career. It would be an irresistible riddle for rap fans to try and unwrap. Pitchfork would summarize Youngboy's album Sincerely Cantrell accurately, saying that it painted a portrait of Youngboy as a tragic figure who blurred the line between fact and fiction. And ultimately, saying the mystique around Youngboy, combined with the project itself, was a brilliant creative body of work. And all of the mystique around Youngboy and his past, combined with his talent, contributed to huge record sales, with the project being Youngboy's biggest album debut of his career, selling an enormous 137,000 copies first week. This saw Sincerely Kentrell going number one on Billboard all while Youngboy was still in jail. This made him the third rapper in history to have a number one album whilst in jail, coming after Tupac and Lil Wayne. But Youngboy would go on to have back-to-back -back victories. As the month after Sincerely Kentrell topped the charts, in October 2021, Youngboy was granted release on a $500,000 bond, allowing him house arrest whilst he awaited trial on his gun charge. The conditions were that he had to stay on a strict lockdown in Salt Lake City, where he had recently bought a home, and he would be set to live with a whole security team whose job it is to protect Youngboy and enforce the terms of his house arrest. This includes a limit of three pre-approved visitors at all times. His release would reportedly take place on October the 26th, 2021. However, unlike previous releases, he would keep a low profile and not go live immediately after coming out of jail. He would reportedly be whisked away to Utah, where he would be held on house arrest as he awaited two trials. One for the gun case from the Chopper City music video shoot in Baton Rouge, 
and the other from when he fled the FBI when they came to arrest him in LA. While Youngboy would be stuck at home, making the most of his house arrest and recording an ungodly amount of music, behind the scenes, his lawyers would be going back and forth with prosecutors, laying the foundations for an enormous legal battle. For some reason, Youngboy would first face trial in LA for the gun found in his car, rather than for the original gun charge in Baton Rouge. His lawyers argued that he was panicking when the FBI swooped in, calling it a heavy-handed arrest, and claiming that he didn't even know there was a warrant for his arrest or a gun in his car. Investigators were apparently unable to find his fingerprints on the gun, which helped his position massively. Prosecutors even tried to use lyrics from Youngboy's songs that mentioned firearms as evidence. For example, in the song Gunsmoke, Youngboy raps lyrics naming numerous models of guns, like FNs, Glocks, and MAC-10s, which the prosecutors wanted to use to show that Youngboy had familiarity and knowledge of the brand FN, the make of gun that was found in his car. They were also trying to use Youngboy's NBA Bro, jewelry that was found in the car to tie him to the gun that was found alongside it. And they would also attempt to tie Youngboy to a Philadelphia-based jeweler bro. Shine who had made his custom NBA pieces, even bringing in lyrics from his song Life Support where he rapped that he shops at Shine. But Youngboy's lawyers argued that these songs were simply entertainment and not an admission of bad acts. In fact, Youngboy's lawyers in this trial were extremely shrewd and creative in their methods of combating the accuser's attempts to use his lyrics against him. Youngboy's lawyers even made the judges aware of a study carried out by Adam Dunham from the University of California, Irvine, where two groups of people were asked to react to lyrics from a country song, A Boy Named Sue by Johnny Cash, which came out in 1969. Lyrics of the song included, Well, I hit him hard right between the eyes and he went down, but to my surprise, he came up with a knife and cut off a piece of my ear, as well as the line, But I busted a chair right across his teeth and we crashed through the wall and into the street, kicking and a gouging in the mud and the blood and the beer. Now, they're not quite Bronx drill lyrics, but they're certainly violent lyrics. And in the study, the first group were told that the song was a hip hop track, but the second group of people were told that it was a country ballad. The results of the study showed that the first group of people viewed the song in a negative light, whereas the second group of people seemed to have a favorable impression of the lyrics, thus proving a general negative bias towards rap, perhaps stemming from some kind of underlying racism or biased judgment of rap music as a genre. Now, using that study, Youngboy's lawyers managed to successfully convince the judge that using lyrics from Youngboy's songs against him was unfair and futile, so all the lyrics were thrown out. It was also revealed in the lead up to trial that the operation to arrest Yo, Young Thug need them lawyers, never bro. free again. An insanely biased name that seemed to paint a picture of federal agents doing anything they possibly could to take Youngboy off the streets. Youngboy would eventually face a trial for this gun charge in an LA court in July 2022. And during the trial, Mo Gang Yeah, gang, I heard about this. Never free again? That's crazy that the FBI named their case against him. Never free again. That's like mad petty, mad crazy. And yeah, it does seem to elude that they will do anything to catch this guy and lock him up highest name that seemed to paint a picture of federal agents doing anything they possibly could to take Youngboy off the streets. Youngboy would eventually face a trial for this gun charge in an LA court in July 2022. And during the trial, Mo Ganga, aka Lawyer for Workers, truly had his time to shine, as the budding social media lawyer would attend the courthouse and do full-blown court reporting on this case, revealing to the world fascinating details related to proceedings in the courtroom. For example, Mo reported that a juror was dismissed for being a huge Youngboy fan and telling the judge that she was planning to let him off no matter what. Mo would take to Instagrams regularly throughout proceedings to give fans detailed updates. Youngboy jury has been picked. There were 12 individuals picked. There's one alternate. There was a total of about 50 people who were potential jurors. This one guy said, I love young boy. I follow him all the time. I'm definitely going to rule his favor. He was excused. There were people who talked about being Why victims would of you gang say violence that? that sent them to the emergency room and that they would have trouble uh, ruling fairly in a gun case. During the trial, young boy would even be seen taking pictures with fans outside the courthouse where he told reporters that he was feeling confident. Oh, that's your entertainment lawyer. Okay. Hey, man, you got a great legal team over out here. You got top in the game. How are you feeling? You feel confident, right? I mean, look at your fans. Your fans are all out here. And he would regularly be mobbed by fans on the way into the building for trial. He did us wave, yo. That's crazy, yo. Hey. for young boy. 
Clearly, wanting to show love for the fans that have come out to show support, Youngboy would be seen leaving the courthouse and hugging his fans before breaking loose and running from the crowd. Towards the end of the trial, Youngboy would be seen walking into court with his team, all the while fans would hype him up for a not guilty verdict. Papa, this can't trail. This YB is you, man. Do that. Don't forget. You gotta be free. As soon as they say not guilty, I'm gonna call my girl and tell her it's him. And so, on July the 15th, 2022, news of the verdict would break, with Mo Gangat going viral, being the very first person to break the news to rabid young boy fans that had assembled outside the courthouse. Yo, shut up. Yes, Youngboy was found not guilty on all charges related to his Los Angeles arrest, and he would be seen outside the court after this big win with his arm around his lawyer, and later posing for a victory picture with his legal team, captioned Dream Team. Mo Gangat would even manage to interview Youngboy personally outside the court, with Youngboy announcing that he's got a big tour coming up. Before this trial started, what did you think about your chances of getting the jury to return a not guilty verdict? I had oh, some strong... I had, I had a confident feeling about some things in my side of my heart, but... You just beat the feds. What would you want to say to your fans about what's next for a young boy never broke again? Tour. What tour is next? So, with that big legal win checked off the list, all that would remain for Youngboy is to beat the original gun case that he caught at the Chopper City music video shoot in Baton Rouge. Now, Youngboy has yet to face trial for this, and he still remains on house arrest in Utah as he awaits his day in court. At but perhaps time. when the time comes, he will beat this case too, as his success rate in the courtroom is nothing to be trifled with. Or perhaps, this might be the one charge that Youngboy can't escape. For now, it's unknown. However, what is known is that even while on house arrest, problems would still mount up for Youngboy. And despite his ability to diss his enemies and ops from Baton Rouge or Chicago without consequences, others wouldn't be so lucky. And soon, the rap beef that claimed the life of King Von would turn deadly once again, mm -hmm. this time leading to the tragic death of one of Quando Rondo's closest friends. Yeah, this. After going number one from jail with Sincerely Kentrell and being released on house arrest in Utah, Youngboy would get back to doing what he does best, recording and releasing music prolifically. In fact, he would drop project after project like somebody trying to speed run their record deal. While on house arrest, he would drop a joint mixtape with his blood-affiliated industry mentor Birdman titled From the Bio, which charted at number 19. That was followed by the January 2022 mixtape Colors, releasing amid his public back and forth with Lil Durk. That project had the songs No Switch and Bring the Hook, which we discussed earlier, where Youngboy extensively disses King Von and Lil Durk. On the project, Youngboy would go a step further, teaming up with Quando Rondo on the song Gangster, with Youngboy kicking things off by declaring that the industry doesn't like him because he's thugging and dangerous. Dangerous, an acknowledgement of the blacklisting that he feels he suffered since King Von's death. When Quando got on the mic, he would use the opportunity to send some more shots of Von and Dirk, rapping that his ops have spent $300,000 trying to kill him, but they failed, and mocking King Von, rapping that Lil Tim is the biggest op and that he stepped on Von because he doesn't fight. The project commanded the attention of the whole rap community, who were following the beef with Dirk. But despite strong sales, the project colors would narrowly miss out on the top spot, going number two on Billboard, losing out to Disney's Encanto soundtrack, but beating Gunner and The Weeknd. Apparently, Youngboy was disappointed that colors didn't go number one, and the following month, he accused his record label of not supporting him and warning others not to sign to Atlantic. Clearly, there was some tension brewing between Youngboy and the label he signed to all the way back in 2017 after he beat his double attempted murder case. His ongoing beef with Lil Durk was attracting the wrong kind of attention, and it would seem that going forward into 2022, Youngboy would quickly release a wave of projects, seemingly in a strategy to quickly free himself of the obligations of his original record deal. In March, he would drop another collaborative mixtape, this time with fellow body-beating rapper DaBaby, a mixtape with the tongue-in-cheek title Better Than You. This was a nod towards the internet trend for Youngboy fans to comment Youngboy better on any content posted by other artists. As the months went on, the tension between Youngboy and Atlantic Records seemed to get more and more intense. Reportedly, Atlantic were trying to re-sign Youngboy in a huge $25 million deal, which he duly turned down. According to DJ Academics, Youngboy wanted to own his masters, and the label weren't having any of it. There was a possibility he would have stayed at one point, but they weren't talking because labels don't really believe in giving you ownership. They believe in only paying you to own you. Again, Youngboy wanted to partner with Atlantic. He wanted to, hey, listen, we partner, but I own my work. Atlantic said, we'll give you more money, you'll never own your work. 
that over here. And all of this <laughs> label politicking was clearly having a negative effect on Youngboy's mental state. In May 2022, a DM leaks where Youngboy seemingly says that he feels he's headed to jail or the grave soon. But in spite of his depression and collapsing relationship with his label, he would continue to drop music. In June 2022, the NBA crew released their group album, Green Flag Activity, which predictably was back to back with lyrics from Youngboy's crew, boasting about how they're armed and ready to kill for him. In August, Youngboy would announce his fourth studio album, The Last Slimito, along with an Instagram post that seemed to suggest that this would be his last project with Atlantic, as well as describing himself as a $60 million man, sparking intense speculation that he may have reached a deal to re-sign with Atlantic for an enormous sum. Youngboy would also put out a cryptic statement suggesting that he never finished school, but he's finally finished his deal with Atlantic and calling this his last album. It was widely reported that this was indeed his last album with Atlantic, and that 30-track project would release on August the 5th, 2022. The Last Slimito came with the aggressive track, F the Industry, where Youngboy appeared to call out Lil Durk for conspiring to turn the music industry against him, rapping that he's still going to die even with the industry on his side, even rapping that somebody is going to get killed if they don't kill him first. Youngboy was clearly frustrated at the turmoil and how his rap beef with Von and Dirk had affected his performance in the music industry, and no doubt Youngboy would be upset by this album's performance. The Lost Limito landed on the charts at number two, narrowly missing the top spot to Bad Bunny. Still, an amazing debut, but it's likely that Youngboy saw his ongoing failure to land another number one record as part of the music industry's conspiracy against him. However, unfortunately, the choosing of sides in the music industry would be the least of Youngboy's worries, because after releasing The Last Slimito, later in August, tragedy would strike. After King Von was shot dead during the fight with Youngboy's artist Quando Rondo, it would appear that a bounty was placed on Quando's head by King Von's surviving friends and affiliates in the Chicago street gang The Black Disciples. The main person who wanted to see Quando harmed was Lil Durk. Quando had already survived one assassination attempt at a gas station in Waycross, Georgia, with Lil Durk seemingly hinting towards being responsible, and Durk would seemingly continue to allude to his plans to have Quando killed in his music. On June the 3rd, 2022, Lil Durk says that he's trying to nail him, i.e. kill Quando, on Keep Dissing 2 with Boston Ritchie, going on to liken himself to King Von, rapping, bro got bodies, he's a demon child, I'm brothers to a devil. Sadly, the next attempt on Quando's life would be fatal. On August the 19th, 2022, just before 5.30pm, while sitting in their SUV, Quando Rondo and his cousin Lil Pab would be the targets of an assassination attempt, as three masked gunmen would approach Quando Rondo's car whilst it was parked at a gas station near popular LA tourist destination the Beverly Center, where they opened fire. The police chief would later describe the shooters as having gotten out of a white car in dark clothing, opening fire and fleeing in what seemed to be a professional hit job. Uh, they gassed up their vehicle, and as they were getting into their vehicle, a uh, white car approached from the alley. Uh, three men got out of that car. They were in all dark clothing. Uh, they approached, uh, fired numerous shots, and then left in that white car going eastbound in the alley north of Beverly. It does appear that uh, we don't see any kind of argument or anything go on beforehand. So clearly these men came here with a, with a mission in mind. KCAL News would give viewers a good look at the alley where these shots were fired from, and Fox 11 News Los Angeles broke down the entire series of events, explaining that the shooting took place at the gas station. This was followed by an attempt to flee by Quando's entourage, where they drove a short distance before pulling over to seek medical attention for Lil Pab, who was hit. So once that SUV is hit by the gunfire, they take off, they hit the gas, and they drive it a few blocks away into West Hollywood. They wind up stopping over at Santa Monica and San Vicente, right in the very heart of West Hollywood. You know, over there by the Sheriff's Station, also by the West Hollywood Park. They pull over there because the wounds of the man who was hit inside the Escalade too severe. He's bleeding. They pull over. 911 is called. Paramedics rush in. They take the injured man who's hit by gunfire to the ER. He does not make it, does not survive. This essentially created two separate crime scenes, the scene of the shooting and the scene where Quando's car stopped, with a KTLA-5 helicopter putting surveillance on both of those scenes soon after the incident. According to KCAL, a pedestrian flanked down sheriff's deputies who began to help Quando and the wounded Lil Pab in a tragic scene that was captured on camera. And that's where sheriff deputies were then flagged down by a pedestrian during rush hour on a Friday, right around 5.30. They found the victim with a gunshot wound and inside of a black Cadillac escalate paramedics rushed him to the hospital that is where we are told he died his identity currently being withheld until family is notified quando rondo would be filmed by passers-by breaking down at the scene and screaming in disbelief as his wounded friend Lil Pab is pulled from the car and given cpr with this heartbreaking scene quickly going viral and being broadcast on most major news outlets <laughs> Isn't this crazy, yo? I know 
Unfortunately, Lil Pam would pass away in hospital as a result of his injuries, leaving Quando devastated, not just at the scene, but in later social media posts memorialising his close friend and cousin. Reporters would immediately attend the scene, reporting details and filming the scene whilst crime scene investigators continued to work. The news would later report that the police were looking for three shooters. Right now, the search is on for three people who police say shot at a Savannah rapper, killing a member of his entourage. It all started at this mobile gas station at 5.30 Friday evening. LAPD says witnesses heard multiple gunshots, then watched a couple cars zoom off. Three people in one car shot at this black Cadillac Escalade. It's unclear if those inside shot back. They're getting gas when all of a sudden the windows are blown out by gunfire. They're under attack by bullets flying all over the place. See all those white evidence markers on the ground? Each one of those is by a shell casing. Give you an idea how many rounds are fired. Police say in that alleyway, the white vehicle pulls up. Three men get out and they start firing at will, blasting away, targeting that black SUV, the rapper and his second person inside. It ended at Santa Monica Boulevard. Deputies found it peppered with bullet holes and a shattered window. One man inside, a member of Ronto's entourage, had been shot. The 23-year-old was taken to the hospital where he died. A scene left with remnants of the fight, shoes left in the street, doors flung open. The suspects still on the run. We still don't know what spurred it all, but LAPD says it started at a gas pump. It would be friends and associates of King Von who were celebrating the hardest following the killing of Lil Pan. Friends of Von would post pictures of him on Instagram following the shooting, with some going as far as saying, ain't no time frame on that get back, and posting pictures of Kwondo saying it should have been him. Lil Durk himself would go on to release numerous songs where he appeared to mock Kwondo for screaming no after his friend was murdered, with these lyrics painting a picture of Dirk seemingly accepting personal responsibility for organizing this murder. Like on the track Wonderful Wayne and Jackie Boy, where Dirk rapped that his shooters told him they have someone's location and that he gives them the green light and tells them to go and later looks at the news to see someone screaming no. As well as in the track War About It with former young boy ally 21 Savage, where Dirk once again did an impression of Kwondo screaming no after Pab died, rapping that since Von died, he wants Kwondo and Youngboy to come outside and go to war about it. And he would rap that when he saw Kwondo screaming no on the news, he thought it was a woman who set him up, ultimately ending the hook, dissing Kwondo, asking, where did Pab go? And responding that the mall has him. Even OTF affiliate Lil Vani, who had gone back and forth on Clubhouse with Kwondo and Pab, would take to social media to mock Kwondo for losing two friends and saying when it rains, it pours, and that Kwondo should keep his chin up. Von and Dirk's DJ DJ Bands would also mock Kwondo, taking to Instagram, saying that he was signing artists to Belt to Ass Records. Belt Records, you know what I'm saying? We signed, man. Anybody could get signed, man. That's all you gotta do is play crazy out here. Get your signed, man. The O Block member and friend of Von's D Bands would later be on live in O Block along with other gang members claiming to be smoking Pat. Tell him who smoking. Who's smoking? What's dude name? Look, Pat, the big King Von's friends would also take responsibility and use this as an opportunity to diss Youngboy. And in the days that followed, O Block members would be filmed on their block, dissing Youngboy and his deceased friends, Dump and Lil Dave. <laughs> Despite the disrespect, Youngboy would clearly be hurt by the situation, and he would post to Instagram twice in the aftermath of Pab's death, seemingly indicating that Get Back was on the way, saying that what he truly wants is coming to him, but it might take time, and describing the situation as sad and wicked. Just over a week after the murder, on August the 30th, 2022, Quando Rondo and Youngboy would release a collaboration track where they opened up about losing their friends, with Quando dedicating the song to Lil Pab and Youngboy paying respects to his fallen manager Dump. Quando would rap that people were testing him and now a rapper got killed, and saying that it broke his heart seeing Lil Tim get shot and then see him charged with murder just for protecting him. Elsewhere on the song, Youngboy raps about King Von sleeping with his ex, saying that he just couldn't cope with it, and saying that he and Quando have been blackballed in the music industry because of what Lil Tim did to Von. This would give fans an insight into the pain that Quando and Youngboy had gone through, living with the consequences of King Von's death as a result of their beef. But this would only be the first part of a much larger collaboration between Youngboy and Quando in defiance of their enemies. Way back in February 26th, Quando announced a joint project between him and Youngboy, a tape called Who They Hate. This never materialized, but later in the year, that joint project instead transformed into the joint album 3860, named after Youngboy's native 38th Street in Baton Rouge and Quando Rondo's past in the Rolling 60s Crips in Savannah, Georgia. Quando would tell Rolling Stone in an interview about the project that the album was all about him and Youngboy paying tribute to their dead friends. On November the 16th, 2022, the cover art and track list for 3860 debuts on Lil Tim's Instagram page, with that track list containing the bombshell announcement that Lil Tim is the only other rapper to be featured on the project. The 3860 mixtape released on the 25th of November 2022, and the whole album is essentially a big middle finger to Lil Durk and King Von's friends. Lil Tim featured on the opening track, I Swear, which in my opinion is an incredible song and shockingly underrated. The official audio of that has less than 1 million views at the time of writing, which is unbelievable to me, considering the fact that in many ways this song is the moment where Kwondo, Youngboy, and Lil Tim 
all stand together and address what's been happening in defiance of their enemies. The song features a great and heartfelt performance from all three artists. Quando singing on the hook is on point, and when Lil Tim touches the mic, he surprisingly delivers a solid verse where he addresses everything about what he's gone through, opening with bold lyrics saying he has all these bodies on his conscience. Rapping, crazy, catch him walking out a party, hop out, walk him down, seemingly referencing Von's crazy story whilst describing killing him outside of that nightclub. Lil Tim acknowledges that there is a bounty on his head and ending his verse saying that he has plenty of bodies, but that he's beat plenty of cases and is undefeated in the streets. I'll be honest, Lil Tim actually rapped with a really good flow on this track. His earlier songs didn't show nearly as much potential, but this song actually showed that he has it in him to be a genuinely compelling rapper. And then to take the track to the next level, Youngboy jumps in for a hard verse, singing to God that people are always plotting to kill him, but that he's always shooting back. Youngboy would rap that he has a lot of money and is known for killing people. He seemingly references King Von's death after fighting Kwondo in a disrespectful manner, saying they smoked on him and he wasn't even strong, as well as bars that seem to snipe at <laughs> little Dirk, saying they know we pop in, tell them all make pain songs. And ending the verse, saying that for years people have tried to kill him, but ended up getting killed themselves. This was a very bold opening song for this album. And from here, for the rest of the tape, Kwondo and Youngboy would rap back to back, track after track, speaking openly and bravely about what their lives have been like since Von died. There's the track, It's On, which references sliding for Von, saying, do it for who? I bet you don't, with do it for Von being a line that Lil Durk and OTF members would often post or reference in songs. Then on the track, Casket Talk, Kwondo raps that he is continuing to diss the dead and say F the ops, despite people trying to kill him like Tupac. He would rap that he's heard rumors that they're coming to kill him, but saying that he isn't scared because he's a gangster with his own money and killers who could get you whacked first. In the verse, he thanks him for saving him from Von, and rapping that people don't like him because they don't fight, they shoot. On Youngboy's verse, he raps about people wanting to beef about their dead friends, and saying that people now describe him as a rapper slayer who has anyone that disses him killed. Then there's the song Want Me Dead, where Kwondo disses King Von and his sister, saying his favorite op dead and his sister talks too much. This was a reference to King Von's sister Kayla B, tweeting about the situation when Kwondo and Youngboy were going back and forth with Enerly Chopper. Kwondo also raps that Lil Timmy rolled her brother up and stepped on him. He would diss Lil Durk, referencing his song Aha, rapping, Aha, I don't think it's funny, we stepped on your brother, and mocking Lil Durk for failing to kill him and Lil Tim for an entire year. He would reference the shooting in Waycross, Georgia, saying they shot a hundred times and missed, and he would diss Von again, saying that they're smoking weed from Oblock and that Von was a stepper, but he got stepped on, even ending the verse by dissing famous Chicago Set 300 and pledging allegiance to Youngboy's 4K Trey Crew. While in Youngboy's verse, he would rap in reference to Von, F that rap boy, and saying that his hit squad are now trying to kill another. There's the song No Mercy, where Quando raps that he hangs with the killer who killed Von, and that the people looking for him aren't killers, as well as rapping that his Lil One murdered one in the New Atlanta, and that's why he has $100,000 on his head. Quando disses Von again on the song Loaded, saying he's steady dissing his dead ass, and rapping, get your hat back before you say you gon' do me. A reference to Lil Durk and his crew wearing V-Roy fitted caps out of respect for Von. Then there's the great song Million Dollar Kid, an amazing piece of pain music where Kwondo sings about the struggles of being blessed with million dollar checks from the rap game, contrasting that with the million dollar bounty that's been put on his head by Chicago gang members. This is something he mentions again on Trophies, where Kwondo acknowledges the million dollars on his head, saying that if they catch him, they're collecting a million. And rapping all these bodies on his conscience got him feeling like Timmy, as well as saying he stained a rapper. Elsewhere on the project, there's the track At The Top, where Kwondo raps about bullets coming through the car door when Pablo was killed and being traumatized from the incident. Then finally, on the song Heat Tucked, Kwondo makes a bold statement, rapping, I bought the body from Lil Tim, it's both of ours, rest in peace. 3860 was a bold and brazen statement, flipping the middle finger to King Von, Lil Durk, and whoever killed Lil Pat. Kwondo and Youngboy wanted the whole world to know they were outside and not scared. The album was described by one critic as hard as nails with ruthless lyrics, but it would turn out that when it came to releasing this project, things behind the scenes were a little more complicated. Perhaps these lyrics were too ruthless, as Youngboy would later claim that him and Kwondo mutually agreed the content on the album was too demonic and they wouldn't release it. According to a statement by Youngboy, they begged the label not to release the tape, even going as far as to say that he spoke to religious missionaries who said that they will judge him for releasing this violent tape and saying that the label is blocking his Stop the Violence message because they only care about making money. Youngboy would go on to say that people are terrified of him and that he doesn't play. However, despite the lack of promotion and attempts not to release it, the project did come out and ended up landing at 62 on Billboard. Strangely, despite the earlier announcement that The Last Lie Mito was his final album with Atlantic, 3860 was released under Atlantic Records. It's unclear exactly why, but following The Last Lie Mito, Youngboy dropped numerous projects which were technically classified as mixtapes and seemingly owned by Atlantic Records. There was the September tape Reeler 2, which charted at number 6 on Billboard, and just one month after dropping Reeler 2, Youngboy releases yet another mixtape, 3800 Degrees, on October the 7th, 2022, which charted at number 12. And before that month ends, on October the 21st, 2022, he drops another project titled Ma I Got a Family, which charted at number 7. Then you get to November, that's when 3860 came out, and that went 62, even with the industry blacklisting. And then, to cap off Youngboy's insane run, the final project with an Atlantic Record sticker finally arrives on December the 23rd, 2022. The Lost Files album, which is a release consisting mainly of a compilation of already leaked tracks, which still charted at number 45. Once the dust finally settled on Youngboy's 
Cowboys Atlantic deal, he was a free agent and finally in a position to move on to his next move, later announcing a huge deal with Motown Records. Now the details of this deal have not been made public, but DJ Academics would hint at having spoken to industry insiders who confirmed an eight-figure deal that was bigger than anything anyone in this generation of rappers could attract. The deal um, has him getting paid handsomely up front. It's obviously an eight-figure deal. It's one of the biggest deals that anyone in his generation of rappers would be getting. So he's getting paid handsomely. So Youngboy had truly beaten the odds, getting out of his long-standing deal with Atlantic by dropping an ungodly amount of music in 2022. But it hadn't been easy. He was still seemingly having his career suppressed as a result of the negativity surrounding him after King Von was killed. And yet while the industry was still on Lil Durk's side because he'd lost a friend to violence, Quando Rondo would still suffer back-to-back -back assassination attempts, losing Lil Pab and seemingly risking his life every time he went outside. And Youngboy would ultimately be powerless to do anything about it, muzzled by the industry who felt he was too raw and too dangerous to be promoted like he used to be, and caged by the authorities who kept him cooped up on house arrest simply for being around firearms, even though numerous gangs wanted to see him dead. Youngboy would ultimately right, find himself like, in an impossible he position. Do to stay Perhaps alive. as a last resort, he would try a different approach, trying to shake free of his public image as the grave-digging murder man who seems to cause death and destruction in every city he goes to, instead trying to reposition himself as a gentle and traumatized casualty of the street warfare, and pledging to stop the violence and change his ways going forward. On the 6th of September 2022, Youngboy drops his latest project, Realer 2. The project included typical Youngboy murder talk, for example, on the track Boot Up, where he appeared to sneak diss Lil Durk, mocking him for beefing him earlier on Instagram and Twitter, and suggesting that when he gets off house arrest, he's going to shoot his crew. Elsewhere, on the song Survive, Youngboy acknowledges the Chicago gangsters who were after him, referencing the killing of King Von, saying, that boy died playing with Quando. But the real showstopper on this project was of course the song Fresh Prince of Utah. This is Youngboy's reinterpretation of the theme song from Will Smith's sitcom Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, with Youngboy switching up his lyrics, painting himself as the Fresh Prince of Utah, where he was sent to live after getting in trouble in LA and Baton Rouge. The song was a booming, high-energy anthem laced with hard lyrics and quotables. Youngboy would claim in thugged-out lyrics to be ready to put people in the trunk for dissing his deceit matter big dumb. But it was the song's viral central catchphrase, it's a parade in Sadma City, yeah, that had the song going crazy. This particular song became a favorite of Ja Moran, a player on the Memphis Grizzlies basketball team playing in the NBA. That's the National Basketball Association, not Never Broke Again. But hell, you would struggle to tell the difference, as Ja Morant would seemingly adopt this lyric as his personal catchphrase in countless media appearances. It's a parade inside my city, yeah! 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 It's a parade inside my city, yeah. Good to hear you. Okay. It's a parade inside my city, yeah. It's a parade inside my city, yeah. <laughs> I told you, it's a parade inside my city, yeah. So he jumps in the middle of it and he quotes a rap lyric. It's a parade inside my city, yeah. It's a parade inside my city, yeah. It's a parade inside my city, yeah. <laughs> Youngboy would even himself eventually be seen on social media, encouraging Ja and his team to win games using his catchphrase. In fact, throughout 2022, Ja Morant would be seen rapping Youngboy songs word for word, and rumors would circulate that the Memphis Grizzlies would practice to nothing but Youngboy songs. Coming here made me realize why he number one. This is because all they do is listen to Youngboy all day. From morning to night, from shoot around to the game, it's NBA Youngboy. It's been claimed that the Grizzlies would spend 90 minutes listening to as many as 50 Youngboy songs to get hyped up during pre-game warm-ups, with all the players seemingly banging 4K tray both on and off the court with Ja Morant and Kenny Lofton named as the biggest young boy fans on the team. He said they listen to it all day from morning to night to shoot around to the game. It's NBA young boy. Yeah. But I've heard that you're like Mr. Young Boy. Like you can like you have all the lyrics to every song. Me? Yeah. It's uh, not true. I mean, it's a couple that I can like you know know all the lyrics for, but who's the better for them? Probably you know, I mean it was, I think it was Dennis and Job we listen to Young Boy a lot, but Kenny Lofton, that's really Mr. Young Boy. Yeah. Dar would claim in interviews that Youngboy is the reason that they have won so many games. And as crazy as that sounds, when the Grizzlies had a great regular season, leaving them ranked number two in the Western Conference with 56 wins, people were saying that Youngboy was actually the man responsible, with deeper analysis suggesting that all of these players had actually connected and built chemistry through their shared love of Youngboy's music, and that this shared interest actually made them a more cohesive and effective team. However, if Youngboy gets responsibility as for the positive would. side, he would also end up catching heat for the negative influence too. As, as in March 2023, John Morant would hit Colorado strip club Shotgun Willies, yet another venue that seemed to be blasting nothing but young boy anthems. And it seemed that Jar got a little too carried away and forgot which NBA he was a part of, <laughs> deciding to let everyone know that he had that iron on his belt, flashing a pistol to his followers whilst in the club and broadcasting his fun to the world on Instagram Live. From there, 4K Jar would go on to rap a number of the young boy's more bloodthirsty lyrics about having his ops killed, all while throwing gun fingers and gang signs. According to dancers who were there that night, the presence of the gun in the club terrified some of the girls there. 
and from here we would see things go from bad to worse, as the media would begin reporting on Jar's antics, painting the parade inside his city as a $50,000 strip club bender, with leaked images of him getting a lap dance, piercing his family-friendly ball player image. Now, since Jar Moran is in the National Basketball Association, a corporate organization that generates literally tens of billions of dollars, this sort of behavior would be taken very seriously indeed. Look, the NBA just can't have their star talent running around, toting guns, throwing gang signs, and saying that they're going to have people knocked off. I mean, this is the NBA, not Atlantic Records, but anyway. The situation would begin to look much worse for Jar once the timeline of events emerged. Apparently, after beating the Rockets in Houston, the Memphis Grizzlies flew on a team plane to Denver, apparently landing in the city after midnight and heading straight to the strip club. This sparked speculation that Jar might have even used the team plane to traffic a firearm across state lines. Oh. Now, in Jar's defense, the clip of him holding the gun in the club was recorded on a return visit two days later after playing a game against the Denver Nuggets. But this would lead to an investigation by local police, as well as an internal investigation by the NBA, with the Grizzlies announcing hours after the news broke that Jar would be missing two games, with four more suspended games later being added. And an NBA investigation was launched to determine whether or not Jar had brought the firearm onto team premises or the team plane. But the trouble was far from over for Jar. In the midst of all of this, further reports would emerge, seeming to allege that Jar had been involved in two violent incidents the last summer, with a 17-year-old accusing Jar and a friend of beating him and getting a gun out during a pickup game where Jar claimed that the kid actually threw a ball at his head. Jar was also accused of threatening security at a Memphis mall, and on the court, Jar was facing allegations by the Indiana Pacers that Jar and his crew aggressively confronted members of the team's traveling party after an on-court altercation, with it later being claimed that Jar and his friend had hopped in an SUV and spun the Pacers' team bus allegedly even aiming a red laser beam at them from their SUV, which the team believed could have been the red beam from a gun, with this incident actually resulting in Jar's best friend being banned from the Grizzlies stadium. I mean, that was, that's crazy. After the incident, Jar would get into damage control, releasing an apologetic statement vowing to get help and to find better ways of dealing with stress, later appearing in an interview claiming that the gun wasn't his, but also taking responsibility for making a mistake and painting himself in a negative light. You at the spot, shotgun willies, I've been there. You were holding a gun and we both know how dangerous that can be. Whose gun were you holding? No, the gun wasn't mine. No, it's not who I am. I don't condone him, you know, any type of violence, um, but I take you know, full responsibility you know, for my actions. I um, made a you know, bad mistake. Um, and I can see uh, the image you know, that I, I painted you know, over myself you know, with my recent mistakes, but you know, in the future, uh, I'm gonna show everybody who I really is, you know, what I'm about, and um, you know, change this narrative. In the end, the Colorado police would decline charging Jar, and he would make an explosive post-suspension return, telling the world he is completely sorry, and supporting his team from the bench initially, and then returning in style, scoring 17 points and 5 assists, after hopping off the bench and playing for 24 minutes, while wearing a bizarre mask with rainbow-dipped dreads. However, in the end, Jar Morant's recovery would take a tragic turn, as in May 2023, after Youngboy released a new album, seemingly overcome by the realness of the latest murder anthem from the great Digger Lil Top himself, Jar would be seen on Instagram bumping Youngboy, when suddenly, as if in some kind of full K-Trade trance, he reaches for another gun and flashes it to the camera. This repeat incident would be followed by a cookie-cutter apology statement, and Jar's immediate suspension from all team activities, followed by endless ridicule from social media pundits calling Jar NBA dumb boy, as well as pondering how Jar Morant could possibly be so stupid to throw his career away so recklessly. However, at a certain point, some people began pointing the finger at Youngboy, suggesting that in fact his music had been a bad influence on Jar. The coverage of Youngboy's music highlighted a real concern about the impact and influence of violent well, gangster rap, and it made you wonder if his music though. was leading a millionaire NBA player astray, then what impact could Youngboy's music be having on impressionable teenagers with very little? We're talking about the vulnerable kids who might still be growing up in the circumstances that Youngboy was in when he was a teenager raising hell. Over time, it seemed that Youngboy himself actually began to consider these things, and eventually he would make a major life decision, and begin a journey to try and change his ways, and vowing to put a stop to the violence. On December the 3rd, 2022, Youngboy released the track, This Not A Song, This For My Supporters. The song came with a cover art depicting Youngboy standing next to graffiti that said, Stop The Violence. And it came with lyrics where Youngboy expressed regret at the violent content of his music, rapping that he had been telling his young shooters not to kill, in spite of the fact that people in Atlanta want him dead after the killing of King Von. But Youngboy would go on to urge those who want to see him dead not to continue the cycle, saying that he is now telling people to stop the violence and that he wants to see his enemies eat rather than beefing with him. In these lyrics, he says 12 bodies and one child dead, as well as another saying that he has counted 12 and that his ops aren't better than him. Perhaps it was another reference to the idea that he was competing in bodies with King Von, but Youngboy would go on to seemingly suggest that his team of killers were actually disappointed because he wasn't planning to put more money on people's heads. And he would question why would his people let their broke ops pull them into a beef that could end with them dying, ultimately saying they're on their own. Youngboy would rap on the song that he's seen plenty of killings and almost lost his soul to drugs. And at the end of the track, Youngboy dropped some deep street knowledge, telling people not to listen to other people's definitions of a real gangster and questioning if it's really gangster to flunk out and lose your life. He would 
would claim that his ops don't know what it means to fight until the other person has no fight in them, and ending the song with the thought-provoking statement, you are the person you're fighting. This is a line that I think is particularly deep, because I've said before, it's crazy just how much Youngboy and his enemies, like King Von or Lil Durk, had in common. And it's tragic to see these young black men from difficult upbringings who became so-called gangsters and eventually music stars having so much in common, yet hating each other enough to want to see each other dead. Mm -hmm. And the statement, you are the person you're fighting, cuts surprisingly deep. Youngboy actually goes on to accuse his critics of never having had to shoot a gun themselves. And despite the stop the violence message, Youngboy vowed to kill all the demons who come to do him harm. In this extended confession of a song, we got an extended look at Youngboy's remorseful side, as he painted a portrait of himself as a hurt young man who was tired of the endless war. But rapping to stop the violence in songs is one thing, but what Youngboy did next would have been unthinkable just a few short years before. Despite the great deal of bloodshed on both sides of the Baton Rouge gang wars, in a 2021 interview with DJ Vlad, his biggest rival from Baton Rouge, Fredo Bang, would actually claim that he didn't want to see Youngboy in jail and that he has no problems with him. Even going as far as to saying, if Youngboy called him, he would pick up the phone. We really ain't never had no problems. Like, if there is tension anywhere, I don't know where it came from. Uh, I mean, if he want to reach out right now, you know what I'm saying, I, I, I'll pick up the phone. You feel me? Cause, really? Yeah, I, I, I will. I'll pick up the phone. The following year, Fredo Bang would reiterate his feelings to academics, claiming that he doesn't even have a problem with Youngboy. They just don't mess with each other and that he's done dissing him. I, I personally don't have a problem with it's more of, I don't have a problem with them, we just each other. Okay. We well, don't be dissing each other. Nah. Clearly, the two artists were maturing and moving forward from their past tension. And to further show his commitment to stopping the violence, Youngboy's NBA camp would shock the rap world on the 22nd of December 2022, when it was announced that Youngboy and Fredo had actually had a private phone call and agreed to put their differences aside, going on to announce a joint toy drive Christmas giveaway for the struggling families in their hometown of Baton Rouge taking place on Christmas Eve, with Fredo Bang confirming in a Vlad TV interview that they had indeed spoke on the phone. On this call, they apparently decided they would move on from their conflict and try and do something positive in the community. Okay, so you guys had the conversation, and the conversation went well. Yeah. It was more so of us, how can like how can we show that it's never been a problem from the start? So like, let's do a talk, let's do something for the kids. Given the bloody history between these two and their crews, the idea that they would both be in the same place at the same time was near unthinkable. But the fact that they were willing to let the past be and try to do something positive to squash the beef showed an impressive level of maturity and level-headedness. That's something I rarely see in this kind of story. The toy drive itself would be organized, and Fredo Bang put up an IG story where he spoke on the proposed event, calling on other Baton Rouge rappers and labels to pull up and show love as well, urging them, don't be too gangster for the kids. Hey, I know it's hard times out here, so you know, we trying to help y'all out, make sure y'all kids have something for Christmas. We also missing a lot of rappers in the city and rap labels. Uh, Trill ENT, Mouse on the Track, Webby, uh, Boosie, Level. We need all y'all rappers pull up and pass one toy out, you hear me? Don't be too gangster for the kids, you feel me? Pull up, pass the toy, give a smile, go about your day. I just feel like I should say this one more time, you feel me? Tag these rappers, especially BR, in my guys here. Tell them pull up, um, come pass out a toy. Do not be too gangster and too prideful that you can't come pass out one toy for a child, you heard? Pull up. Hatch, pull up. Although Youngboy was unable to attend the actual event due to being on house arrest, the toy run was a success, and the internet was soon flooded with footage and photos from the event, showing people you would have never dreamed of seeing together a couple of months beforehand. One of these was NBA pioneer OG33 and Fredo Bang being pictured in the same photo. And here, OG3 is seen talking to Fredo Bang and TBG member Hotboy Dew, alongside another NBA veteran, Herm de Black Sheep, who can be seen in the background. Even Youngboy's mother, Sharonda, was seen at the event moving safely amongst the crowd. The fact that this event went down successfully was seemingly a huge victory for the Baton Rouge rap scene and community, and it seemed that Youngboy was planning to move forward with a much more positive approach to life. He was actually given a new life in some ways. He had beaten the first of two gun charges that were looming over his head, and he'd escaped his long-running record deal with Atlantic and signed a new deal on much more favorable terms with Motown. On the 6th of January 2023, Youngboy releases his first studio album on Motown Records, I Rest My Case. That landed at number 9 on Billboard, and the day after his album dropped, Youngboy would announce that he had married his girlfriend Jaslyn and was trying to build a more stable family life. The following month, on February the 1st, 2023, Youngboy covered Billboard's Power 100 issue. Billboard also released a moving interview with Youngboy where he opened up about the feelings behind his music. He expressed regret at promoting violence in his music and he pondered how much violence his music may well have caused, vowing to clean up his act going forward. In this interview, Youngboy would also explain that he is simply terrified of people and the problems that people have brought into his life. Youngboy would be visibly shaken in this interview and the reporter would also write about how Youngboy began shaking uncontrollably when discussing the beatings he received in group home. He would also discuss discuss inviting Mormon missionaries into his home to discuss the personal struggles that he had been going through, and expressing his intention to be baptized into the Church of Latter-day Saints, after finding so much comfort in speaking to the missionaries who visited him. It seemed like Youngboy had truly gone on a journey of transformation, realizing the size of the influence that his music had on other people. 
and vowing to conduct himself in a more responsible manner going forward. He had seemingly squashed the longest running beef of his career, holding a call with Fredo Bang and overseeing the community toy drive that brought peace to these two warring factions. And I wish I could say that that's where this story ended, but unfortunately, Youngboy would still be subjected to endless prods from his new enemies from Chicago. And despite all of his talk of stopping the violence, when Youngboy found himself being provoked and antagonized by Lil Durk in front of the entire rap industry, he simply couldn't help himself, reigniting his war of words with Chicago's biggest rapper, which ultimately led to one of the biggest sales battles in modern rap history. Despite pouring his heart out in an interview with Billboard and vowing to stop the violence, it seemed that as time went on, Youngboy would suffer a change of heart. On February the 17th, 2023, Youngboy would appear in a sit-down interview with the Rap Radar podcast, where he claimed that he didn't want to speak on stopping the violence, and suggesting that people had been doing things that made him change his mind. You're also starting to stop the violence campaign, man. I like this. I like this direction that you're going in, Youngboy. Can you talk about that initiative? Yeah, I don't want to get into it. Yeah. Man, I got to hide this. Going on today, bro. This shit... <laughs> yeah, just hey, stop the violence, man. Right. Uh, if you do something, just make sure you got a very good meaning, like mm. the right reason. But mm. do something with intention. Yeah. yeah. Now, it's unclear exactly what the weird stuff behind the scenes were that made Youngboy want to stop stopping the violence, but perhaps it had something to do with the fact that a few days before this interview released, Lil Durk's fiance, India, was seen suspiciously wishing Youngboy's son a happy birthday under Junior's post. Despite seemingly putting a stop to the violence in Baton Rouge by calling a truce with his former enemy Fredo Bang, this didn't mean that things had stopped when it came to his beef with Lil Durk and the Chicago Black Disciples who were hellbent on avenging King Von. In March 2023, members of King Von's crew from his native block O Block in Chicago were seen on social media, allegedly on the street that Youngboy grew up on. North 38th Street and Chippewa. Clearly, the Chicago sets were looking to antagonize Youngboy, but their next effort to prod top came from an unexpected source, Lil Durk's fiance, India Royale. Now, Durk had actually been rumored to have split up with India, though high IQ fans had their suspicions that this breakup was perhaps a fake marketing ploy. They had gone back and forth on Valentine's Day 2023, with Durk making a heartfelt post towards India. That was apparently not well received, with India rebuffing the show of affection and telling him to respect her boundaries and let it go. Now, a few months before, supposed DMs had leaked from NBA Ben 10, telling the newly single India that she should get with Youngboy. The following month, Dirk would be seen on his IG story saying that he will break people's jaws if he catches them in India's comments. On the 12th of March, Dirk took to social media, vowing to save his relationship with India. However, it would seem that at least for the cameras, India was planning to stay single and live her best life. And in the following days, footage would circulate of her seemingly living it up as a single woman, taking a vacation to Bali, getting turned up with the girls, shaking her butt at the strip club. Posts would even circulate alleging to show India on vacation with another man. Dirk would soon be seen on social media, dragging his ex and saying, these hoes are for everybody. Get in your feelings about your hoe. You got your feelings about all these hoes, these hoes, these hoes. Damn, you can't save them all, Risky. You can't save them all. You got yours saved, but trust me. I know. Spotting a good opportunity to throw shade on his biggest rival, Youngboy would take to Twitter to comment on the situation, saying that he knows how it is when your ex-girlfriend turns into a demon. Now, this tweet seems kind of deep when you look at it carefully, because let's not forget, this whole beef was started by Youngboy's disgruntled ex Jania hooking up with King Von, who even called himself a demon. But anyway, it would appear that Youngboy had taken the bait. The following day, seemingly out of nowhere, Lil Durk's missus, India, hops on Twitter and unleashes a ferocious series of tweets dissing Youngboy directly. She says that he was just a dirty little bad kid and that he wasn't like he says he is in his music. She would then confirm, yes, it's Youngboy she's talking about by saying, I'm talking about Denthead. She would apparently go on to say, people think because they were dirty and in the hood, they were automatically gang. You wasn't toting no guns, you was food deprived. Now look, I don't have any proof for what I'm about to say, so you can call this cap, but to me, it's pretty obvious that this is probably Lil Dirk tweeting from the account, because there's absolutely no reason why Dirk's fiance, who had no involvement in this beef, or any history of calling out other rappers' street credentials online, would suddenly decide to involve herself in an already deadly rap slash gang conflict. Right, Plus, that makes the breakup sense. with Dirk seemed 100% fake to me, and as we're about to learn, Lil Dirk seems hellbent on baiting Youngboy into beefing him for promotion in creating ways. I also think it's no coincidence that India's tweets saying Youngboy was never like that seem to mirror King Von's earlier statements about Youngboy not being like that. Mm -hmm. like talking about on this song, bro. You talking crazy on this man. Oh yeah? He ain't even like that. These bizarre and suspect tweets would provoke a light-hearted reply from Youngboy, who told India she's not going to play with him, along with a laughing face and a link to his own song titled Denthead. He's basically saying she can't make fun of him calling him Denthead when he's already been using this nickname for himself on songs. Now, despite the warnings not to play with him, India would clap back, saying she was playing. A little while after this, Youngboy would be seen on a clip on social media, rapping lyrics from his upcoming song Big Truck, where he asks a girl to let him feel them. Whether or not Dirk and India's breakup was real, or just an elaborate ruse to generate clicks and trick Youngboy into a beef, we might never know. But now, the stage was set, and the Stop the Violence movement was firmly over when it came to Dirk and Youngboy, and it would soon emerge that the two artists were about to go to war over an album release slot. At the end of February, Kwondo would tease his new mixtape, in a post saying that it's one month until he drops his new project, which he's dedicating to his fallen friend Lil Pat. However, a few days after this, Lil Dirk would take to Instagram with a post of his own, 
saying he can drop a single and put all the attention on him, suggesting that Kwondo's release date isn't safe. With that, provoking response from Kwondo Rondo, telling Dirk to drop a song there. Kwondo would go ahead and release his new project, Recovery, on March the 24th, 2023. In my opinion, it's probably the best work of his career, an inspiring, heartfelt, and moving album. On this project, Kwondo let the world know that he wasn't going to let this beef or his recent losses stop him from doing what he does best, making incredible music. And Kwondo wouldn't be the only one. As on April the 21st, 2023, Youngboy drops his latest album, the 33-track Don't Try This At Home. The album's concept promised a hard-hitting and gritty affair filled with violence and murder anthems which the listener definitely should not try and emulate themselves at home. This album saw a defiant Youngboy dissing his rivals from Chicago from the very first lyrics on the very first track Big Truck, with Youngboy saying that they're just rapping while he makes things happen, and saying that he will destroy and kill anyone who disses him. On Cold Killers, he claims to have sent his killers to take the lives of four people. As well as rapping, he doesn't understand why he's at war with people who are just hating on him. And rapping, that they caught someone trying to leave their show and that his ops want to kill him, but they haven't managed to. As well as saying that they caught two bodies and go straight from doing an actual shooting to music video shoots. And saying they gunned down a rapper. Youngboy also seemed to mention Von's death with sneak shots at O-Block on the song Chopper Doctor, mentioning O's in two bars before saying people from your projects are dying and that his hitters catch him, hop out, and walk him down. On the song Run the Hood, Youngboy centers a lyric, but we can kind of get a vibe of what he's saying. As he raps, I'm on the phone with Tim, oh that's Von's killer, bitch dig your brother up. With this perhaps being a reference to the fact that NBA Ben 10 showed fans that he has Tim saved in his phone as Von Killer too. Youngboy goes on to say that he knows that Dirk is dissing him in all of his songs and that they're going to kill him. As well as dissing Von again, saying that everybody wants to kill him, but they have failed and that somebody died because of him and that he knows all of his enemies hate him. Then in the second verse, he says that all of Von's friends saying they're sliding for him have a death wish and that they're next in line to lose their lives. As well as saying that if he didn't have a child with Jania, he would have shot her for messing with Von. He also had the aggressive track Gravedigger, where he says he makes murder music and kills both rappers and regular dudes from the hood. On the song Off The Lean, he threatened podcasters for even speaking on him, and dropped more shade on King Von, saying in Atlanta he won't fight, he's bringing out guns, and saying they boycotted Youngboy after Von's death and got Lil Dirk lit. On Slimeito, Youngboy would claim that a rapper started dissing him and that he got killed in response. Then, on his song I Is That, he proudly proclaims to be everything people say about him, saying he came up robbing houses and alluding to the Von situation, saying once again, he doesn't fight, he shoots, and saying he doesn't like his ops like D-Von. A smart double entendre, comparing himself to WWE wrestler D-Von Dudley, as well as a reference to King Von, whose first name was Davon, as well as saying that he has plans to kill all the rappers dissing him. And then finally, on the last track, Like Madden, Youngboy mentions people getting shot in fights again, saying, in a fight with that fire, you're gonna lose. Despite this being a standout album, Youngboy's sales would ultimately disappoint in comparison to his previous output. It would debut at number five on the Billboard 200 albums chart, getting trounced to the top spot by a frequent collaborator of his arch nemesis Lil Durk, Morgan Wallen. However, some fans were quick to point out that Youngboy, someone who releases numerous albums a year, can't really be compared to other artists like Dirk, suggesting that cumulatively, he's already outselling the competition. NBA Youngboy flopped with his Don't Try This At Home album, or did he? Now, it only sold 60,000 copies in its first week, but Youngboy drops eight projects a year that average 40K in first week sales. That's 320K in a year, which is no different than when an artist drops one project in one year and most times doesn't even come close to those kind of numbers. YB really is better. A week and a few days later, Dirk would troll Youngboy, putting up a post saying that he's been blackballed by the industry, before flipping the script and saying, psych, you can't blackball a goat. Clearly, this was a dig at Youngboy, but it flew over many people's heads. It seemed that Dirk was fishing for a beef with Youngboy to promote his own upcoming album. But initially, Youngboy wouldn't take the bait. Regardless, the beef would be reignited once again, ironically, by rap commentator DJ Academics, who would bizarrely come out on a stream to publicly declare that the supposed beef between Dirk and Youngboy had been squashed. Today, look how far they are. Not beef and squash. You ain't here? <laughs> Yo, Hack, you serious. crazy. Dirk, yeah, you don't got beef no more. I'm serious. Imagine. Dirk and. Oh, I, 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 I might have forgot to tell the public. Dirk and Youngboy don't got beef no more. Now, I don't know where he got this from or why he decided to say it, but to anybody closely following the situation, yeah. it was clear this was absolutely false. Not only was the beef between Youngboy and Dirk active, but after the murder of Kwondo's cousin Lil Pav in Los Angeles, with Dirk and his affiliates from Chicago seemingly claiming responsibility, frankly, this beef was as deadly and as active as it could possibly be. And it would appear that academics had just reignited it publicly for the whole world to see. Soon after, the clip of academics saying the Dirk Youngboy beef was squashed would be liked publicly by Lil Dirk's official Twitter profile, with many people believing that this was Dirk and academics confirming to the world that the beef was indeed over. Unsurprisingly, this missing information had a young boy furious, so he would take to Twitter from his burner account, unleashing a scathing diss towards academics and the music industry at large, saying that Ak is a bitch and so are his industry friends. But a couple of days later, the beef would intensify, but many casual fans would actually miss it, as Lil Dirk would be spotted by paparazzi while shopping, where he was asked about the beef with the young boy. Dirk would initially claim that there was no beef, but then dropped a subtle sneak diss, shouting out Morgan Wallen, who as we know, had just obliterated young boy in the previous Billboard rankings. I mean, you know, DJ Academics is saying you and MJ Youngboy beef is done. Is that true? What beef? Oh, so there's no beef. Beef who? NBA Youngboy. Shut up, Morgan Wallen. 
After this, academics would go live with an extensive reply to Youngboy, saying that he was hurt by his tweets, but apologizing for saying that the beef was squashed when it clearly wasn't, and going on to brutally diss Youngboy for being too sensitive and vowing not to support his music going forward, telling him he's not really blacklisted in the industry and promising that he will personally blacklist him by not posting him on his platform for three months. Damn, that boy act look hurt. There is a little bit of hurt. The most, in the music industry, the most self-centered person is a rapper. The rapper thinks the entire industry work revolves and works like them. They forget the other pieces that help things happen. Did they officially squash beef? That is not true. So if I'll apologize, and, I, and, I, and I'll apologize, apologize publicly, if my words or my nonchalantness or whatever this clip made anyone feel like the, like it's actually squashed, like they agreed to squash it, that's not true. He tweeted out an hour ago, at you a Along with his industry friends, I love this it turned out the same way they boycotted and got that boy lit remember i ain't trying to hear who got something to do with what not nah, pick it now i'm gonna address all these tweets let me now be very strict nba young boy you are not blackballed let me just put this out straight i'll get i work at spotify i get called cherry on the phone they all admit you're the front page of of apple music trust me i used to say you were blackballed my nigga you're not no more i think he thinks i'm working with them that's not true. If you think I've picked a side, you need to realize that you're turning the industry into the streets and you're in the wrong f business. If young boy don't want me to post him, I will definitely, if, if he wants to make that request, I'll oblige. I'll tell you the ones I'll agree to. If young boy don't want me to post him, I'll make a statement. I won't post young boy. For the next three months, mark today, I will post zero young boy on my page. Just because if you don't respect the fact that I was to, why the f am I over here giving you zero young boy? Watch. Now, Dirk would also seemingly disavow Academics' earlier claims that the beef had been squashed, posting to his IG story that he's not friends with anyone. And after his long stream addressing it, Academics would then come out to say that there ain't no friends in the industry, essentially ending his relationship with Youngboy. During all of this madness, Dirk would announce that he would be releasing his latest album, Almost Healed, on May the 12th. In response, Youngboy would attempt to give Lil Dirk a taste of his own medicine, after Dirk's previous posts saying that he could drop and ruin Quando's release date, with Youngboy announcing a brand new mixtape titled Richest Op, which he would be releasing on May the 12th too. Youngboy revealed the album's title and release date in a scale Aiding tweet tagging Lil Durk and calling him a bitch, and calling his fiance India, who dissed him recently, a nasty ass hoe, and calling Academics a pure fat hoe, and saying that Academics is now invalid as a credible news reporter from now on. Youngboy would follow that up with another tweet aimed at Dirk, saying that he only gets a buzz when one of his friends die, and even one aimed at Dirk's girl India, saying, tell him he better not drop, and following up his initial album announcement with a tweet atting Academics, saying that Ak is always talking about sales, but Youngboy says that Academics can't manipulate him and that he has now embarrassed himself. He also says that he's dropping because all of his ops are hoes and they can't mess with Youngboy because he's better. Academics would reply with a brutal tweet, where he claimed that Youngboy was dissing him because his record sales were low. Youngboy would also go on live teasing new songs from his upcoming project, extensively dissing Academics and saying that he doesn't care about numbers and that all that Ak does is get drunk and talk. This damn Dennis, hey, I like I give a about numbers. I just dropped two weeks ago. This finna drop. Stop it. No, I ain't finna. I ain't worried about no numbers. They play lip bang, take lip bang. Your stupid drunk face says. This is all you like to do is get drunk and talk. <laughs> that don't get you. Off the flap. In this live session, Youngboy would tease Richest Ops' lead single and opening track, Bitch Let's Do It, where Youngboy aggressively dissed Lil Durk and King Von, among other people, rapping, That Rap Boy Ain't Safe, Aha, a reference to Lil Durk's previous single, Aha, dissing him and Quando Rondo. Youngboy would also go on to diss King Von, saying that they couldn't even stitch up the hole in his body after Lil Tim shot him, another reference to the leaked photos of King Von's autopsy that showed a large hole in his shoulder. Youngboy goes on to diss Von again, saying, Get his last rollout on a tee, a reference to the fact that King Von had just released his Welcome to O Block album in the days leading up to his death, a release which we now know charted just above Youngboy on the Billboard charts at debut. The song also had lyrics seeming to mention the pillow left at the scene of G-Money's murder, which attracted a warning from Fredo Bang, telling Youngboy to watch his mouth, perhaps an indication that this lyric had reignited his old beats in Baton Rouge too. Now, we would actually then see a response from Dirk, who was simply focused on the fact that he was now trending. Dirk ultimately seemed unbothered by all of these announcements and threats from Youngboy, taking to Twitter, saying he hasn't seen anything. Dirk also seemed to acknowledge all of the support that he All right, gang, I'm a wrap up drawing. I'm gonna just focus to the end of this. It looks like it got like, you know, a little eight more minutes he gets from Apple Music and shading Youngboy for being popular on just YouTube, as well as suggesting mm -hmm. that the dis is motivate Youngboy because he's unhappy inside, referencing his own album title, saying that he hopes Youngboy is almost healed, as well as telling people to post the positive things that they're doing, likely a reference to Dirk's recent meeting with the new mayor of Chicago. When May the 12th rolled around, Lil Dirk's promised album was nowhere to be seen. He would still release his inspiring lead single All My Life with J. Cole, a brilliant and positive song which ended up landing at number two on the Billboard songs chart, but fans would be left wondering where was the Dirk album that they were promised. Meanwhile, Youngboy delivered on his promise of a brand new project 
project, releasing Riches Off, which made a big splash, and Youngboy would take to social media to brag about successfully pulling the reversal card on Dirk. Youngboy had made Dirk move his release date after Dirk had bragged that he could do it to Quando, and in the end, Youngboy would ultimately celebrate successfully pulling off what I guess he saw as a big W in the beef. You push back, you better not ever try it again. Don't play with me. The mixtape Riches Off itself was extremely disrespectful and defiant, with numerous lyrics disrespecting Vaughn and Dirk, and painting a picture of Youngboy as a ruthless killer who can do what he wants. On the song I Heard, Youngboy seemingly mentions Vaughn's death, rapping that he heard someone got hit with a blick and they couldn't do anything and they weren't with it, as well as lyrics referencing a rapper who doesn't like him wanting to fight, which could possibly be alluding to leaked DMs from Lil Dirk that came out around this time where he seemed to be trying to set up a fight with 6 9 to promote his album. Youngboy seemed to acknowledge Dirk's frequent dissing in lyrics on the track Father, and expressing his frustration that people now want to kill him when he was just minding his business. Then of course there was the controversial track F The Industry Part 2, where Youngboy went in expressing his frustrations at being blacklisted in the music industry and calling out other rappers for uniting against him. Youngboy would appear to threaten to use his money to arrange hits and have his enemies in the rap industry killed, just like he claims to do to his street rivals. He would also diss Drake, claiming that Drake told him personally that he can't work with him due to his existing friendship with Lil Durk. He would then go on to diss J. Cole, who was the guest feature on Lil Durk's single dropping the same day as this album, suggesting that J. Cole had told Youngboy that he would do a song with him, but he never came through. In the hook, Youngboy would essentially warn the rap industry that if they want to beef with him, they have to be about murder like he is. And Youngboy would end the song taking aim at Houston rap legends, the Prince family, dissing J. Prince Jr. and Sr. with death threats, and claiming that because of his relationship with Birdman, he can use assassins from New Orleans to kill people, which appeared to hint that he had actually already used a hitter from New Orleans to leave someone dead in an apartment building. Youngboy would also bring in one of his most prominent members of his crew for the only feature of the mixtape, with the track Chopstick featuring his loyal hitter, NBA Ben 10, who rapped declaring openly from his very first bar that he is the one arranging hits for Youngboy and that he will leave people dead for him same day. However, on top of the murder music, there was still some space for self-reflection on this project. On the song Slimes Go Where I Go, Youngboy appeared to have made peace with the prospect of being killed himself, painting a picture of what actually happens after his rivals find success in taking his life, rapping that his oldest son will be in charge of his empire and that he expects his shooters to avenge him as he's laid to rest covered in diamonds. In another lyric, he recounts lying to his grandfather and claiming that he didn't do any of the violent acts that he was rumoured to have been involved in. Elsewhere, on the track Channel 9, Youngboy would once again muddy the waters between facts and lies, admitting that he's the murder man, but then going on to claim that he will never admit it. On the last track, I Want His Soul, Youngboy raps that his cousin Scully shoots people in the head and that he wants to do the same, as well as dropping a lyric referencing his earlier line in the song Forgiato, where he claims that if he kills another person, he has to start counting bodies on his toes, seemingly confirming that he is now indeed counting murders on his feet. And he would appear to follow this with another bold lyric, where he seemed to say outright that 12 12 people have died messing with him, and that when he catches his next body, it will be 13. Now that was an interesting way to end that album, and I think it's an interesting place to end this video. Youngboy's entire career has been built on the allure of violence. Arguably, this is a symptom of a very sick music industry, which in 2023 seems much quicker to celebrate an artist's skills behind the gun than behind the microphone. You can hardly blame Youngboy for spending all of these years bragging about murders and violence in his music, because that's ultimately what sells in this true crime-obsessed era of internet gangster rap. It's the same energy that made King Von an accused multiple murderer, a bona fide rap star, getting billboard hits and gold plaques all off the back of bragging about and insulting the people that he seemingly killed. Youngboy's career origins followed a similar path to Vaughn's, but over the years, despite the content of his music remaining violent, it's difficult to say whether or not Youngboy is truly the violent young man that he portrays in his music. Despite having claimed to have had 7 to 12 people killed, the reality, based on my research, is that either these stories are embellished and exaggerated, or Youngboy is simply better at getting away with murders than King Von. Because despite the fact that so many people lost their lives during this beef with Youngboy, G-Money, Anisha Barnes, Austin on the Track, Boulevard Quick, Mohamed Girardi, TBG Dutch, King Von, or Seven Hardaway, the police and internet detectives, myself included, haven't been able to produce any solid evidence that Youngboy himself was directly responsible for these murders. Whether or not you believe that Youngboy is capable of taking a life or pulling the trigger isn't up for debate, as his double attempted murder charge in 2016 should be enough proof that there have been times when he truly was prepared to shoot and kill. But if he was truly responsible for 12 murders in his hometown, there would surely be something here to go on. But you can't call Youngboy's music fraudulent or phony, because his music is inspired by the real pain and trauma of losing so many people on his own side during his life. From the death of Lil Dave, his cousin Boozilla, his manager Dump, or Quando Rondo's cousin Lil Pav, it's clear that Youngboy's life has been characterized by death, losses, and heartbreak. And that rings true in his music, and is part of what makes it so moving and real. So, the final question remains. Is Youngboy truly the gravedigger responsible for a dozen bodies laying in the ground, or is he simply a fake gangster, embellishing his street credentials to make compelling music that appeals to the modern day gangster rap audience? Well, right now, it appears that the true answer must be somewhere in between. Because if Youngboy is truly the murder man responsible for all these crimes, it would only be a matter of time before the federal authorities could work it out and put him behind bars for good. But thus far, Youngboy has managed to avoid serious consequences in every case and major charge put against him. Maybe that luck won't last, and eventually Youngboy will catch a case. But it's hard to believe that this man could truly be responsible for 12 murders and get away with it for this long. If he is, then the feds will surely catch up with him. As in this internet age of uncontained information, nothing can remain a secret forever. But hopefully, 
that doesn't happen. Because even if it's just all lies and Youngboy is not killer, what we know he is, is one of the most prolific, successful, and inspiring artists of a generation. He absolutely did come from one of the most challenging and dangerous situations that one could be born into. And despite numerous close calls in the streets, he managed to escape with his life intact, becoming an artist respected all around the world for his perspective. And despite the fact that he recently appeared to depart from his Stop the Violence message, I truly hope that going forward, he can return to that sentiment and keep trying to influence the youth to be more like him, the real Youngboy who is a multi-millionaire recording artist that looks after his enormous family and focuses on positivity and love in his life. Because at the end of the day, if we want things to get better in the communities where gang violence is so rampant, we need more people like Youngboy, the artist, and less people like Youngboy, the gun-toting gang member. I hope you enjoyed that very long and detailed breakdown. I enjoyed learning about it and making it for you. No disrespect was intended. Thank you so much for watching. And once again, rest in peace to everybody in this story who lost their lives too soon. Hey yo gang, rest in peace to everybody. Like he said, like I said already a couple times, like and subscribe to the guy Trap Law Ross. Like and subscribe to myself. This the drawing so far, yo. Yeah, that's like you know, the first six hours of it. I'm definitely gonna continue it, but I like the fact that I was able to push myself to go through this drawing. You know what I mean? It's been a long time since I've been able to just sit down seven, eight hours straight drawing and like don't do nothing else, you know? The responsibilities of life, you know, having a job, school, just the modern day distractions, honestly, not the responsibilities of life, the modern day distractions in life. Because we're not supposed to be doing none of that. We don't, we, we, I mean, the sharing of education and knowledge i understand but the way how schools are set up today nah the workforce nah we really life is not about that and it's been a long time since i've been able to just enjoy life and create and that's why i'm really asking y'all for the support yo to like and subscribe so that i could get monetized and i could you know just spend the rest of my life making art and traveling the world you feel me so thanks for watching my reaction to this i mean i didn't react much <laughs> but this drawing is my reaction facts i'm gonna see y'all in the next one have a great day yo